Before we start, if you're planning on falling asleep to this video, please introduce yourself in the comments or just say hello. Every comment really helps. Also, please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. It's amazing to see how many people from all over the world are watching. Your support on these videos has been incredible and I'm so glad that these videos are helping people sleep. If you want to support the channel even further, there's a little thanks button under the video which allows you to donate. Any amount is appreciated. You can also become a member of the channel with exclusive rewards. Thank you again, please get comfortable, turn off the lights, and make sure you've locked your door. Remember to say hello in the comments. It's time to close your eyes. I have an unforgettable memory of when our school went into lockdown. I remember it perfectly. It was the end of seventh grade. It was a crisp Tuesday morning, we were in math class. This classroom had one entrance in the corner of the room and all the windows were on the opposite wall from that door. There were no windows facing the hallway. Our teacher, Mr. Anderson, was in the middle of explaining algebraic equations when the loudspeaker crackled to life. Principal Johnson's voice echoed through the classroom, ordering an immediate lockdown. The classroom plunged into darkness as Mr. Anderson snapped off the lights. Panic rippled through my classmates. We shuffled towards the corner, trying to remain quiet while some of us were getting emotional. We'd only practiced this once before, so we were quite disorganized and our teacher had to keep quietly reminding us to hide in the corner behind our desks. My desk neighbor Sarah started crying and asking me what was happening. I shrugged and told her I wasn't sure, I remember my heart pounding against my ribcage. Minutes felt like hours. We huddled together, anxiously waiting for any information. The classroom windows were veiled with heavy curtains, so we couldn't see outside. Mr. Anderson maintained his composure, but I could sense his fear. It had been a while since we'd heard anything, and nobody had a phone back then, so we were completely in the dark. As our teacher approached the door to listen, a loud crash echoed through the corridor, causing everyone to freeze on the spot. The sudden deafening noise was followed by a series of sharp bangs, as if something were violently striking the classroom doors. Fear swept through us like wildfire, and my heart pounded in my chest. Our teacher's face went pale, even in the dark I could see his face from the little bit of light that peeked through the side of the door. The banging on the doors continued, growing louder and more relentless with each passing moment. It was so intense that I could feel the walls vibrating each time. The intercom was painfully silent. Our imaginations ran wild, conjuring up all sorts of scenarios. Was there an intruder in the school? A dangerous criminal? A student going on a rampage? Out of nowhere there were screams from down the hallway. The screaming intensified as we could hear repeated banging on the doors and the sounds of windows being smashed. The sound was full of panic and we couldn't fathom what was happening outside. Time stretched on, the banging or screaming showing no sign of stopping. The sound of heavy footsteps echoed through the corridor. I held my breath and my eyes darted towards the classroom door. All I heard was a barrage of shouting men. Some giving direct orders, others seemingly just shouting as loud as possible. It was like a battle cry. Just a bunch of men roaring like animals. The noise was only amplified by the echoing hallway. The banging and screaming stopped, and a few minutes later we noticed a shadow at the door. The doorknob slowly turned, and it creaked open. My pulse quickened as I braced for the worst. Shadows danced at the entrance, and we all stared wide-eyed at the intruder. But what stepped into our classroom wasn't a menacing figure, it was Mr. Thompson, the school's custodian. Relief washed over us as we realized we were safe. Mr. Thompson calmed us all down before explaining that a bear had wandered onto the school grounds. The culprit behind our traumatizing experience was a large frightened bear. It had let itself in through one of the doors to the yard and then panicked when it closed behind it. The staff were trying to open the door again and coach it out from the outside, but their attempts just pushed it deeper into the school and it started to panic. 
That's why it was attacking the doors and ended up causing so much chaos. As we exited the lockdown, our adrenaline was still pumping. But now it was mixed with an overwhelming feeling of relief. That visit from a bear was something we'd remember for the rest of our lives. My middle school was once on lockdown, and I was actually somewhat a part of it. When our bus pulled up to the school, the doors opened and our principal and a few police got on the bus. There were police cars around the parking lot, and my principal pointed at four of us and told us to get off the bus and go with them. We headed to the school and then into the principal's office. We sat down in there and then he asked us, Why do you guys think you are here today? One of the kids in there, I wouldn't really call him my friend, just someone I talked to with at school, replied. Mr. Principal, I heard someone was bringing a gun into school today. The principal looks directly into my eyes with a seriously fear-inducing stare. He says, yes. And I heard this person was bringing the gun in for you. When he said, this person, it was clear he was hinting at me. And considering I had nothing to do with this, I thought this was hilarious, but also terrifying. Damn, you could have heard a pen drop in the room with that silence. They'd already taken our bags off us for a search, and we had cops stood behind us, staring at us the whole time. The first guy, the one who had said he heard someone was bringing a gun in, finally decided to come clean. He just said, you've got the wrong Michael. They'd already checked our bags, and at this point they started to pat us down. They saw that I clearly didn't have a gun, so the principal told me and my other friend to sit out in the lobby. While we were waiting in the hallway, we saw the officers following one of the teachers down towards the classrooms. Then our principal announced over the intercom that we were in lockdown. The kid they went looking for, his name was Michael, which is also my name. He brought a gun into school that day for the other guy in the office. The school said the gun was unloaded, but I don't know if I believe that. From what I heard, the gun was going to be given to the other kid because there was supposed to be a fight after school that day and he wanted a way to protect himself if things got out of hand. The reason I was taken into the office with them is since the kid who brought the gun in was named Michael, they assumed that it was me. It kind of bothered me that I was searched by the police and treated like a criminal because they hadn't bothered to check which Michael might be more likely to bring a gun in. I was a super quiet teenager, never got into any trouble, and the other Michael was always in detention, would get into fights constantly, literally already had an incident with a gun in the past, and yet they heard the name Michael and assumed it would be me. I didn't even get an apology. Just sent back to my class once lockdown was over. My school was a place where not much ever really happened. But one sunny afternoon, things got real weird. School was the same old routine, teachers doing their teaching, and us students just trying to keep our eyes open. I was in Mrs. Patterson's class when we started hearing whispers. The rumors going around were that there had been some strange sightings outside. One girl said that she was followed as she came in late, another guy said he saw someone trying to climb the side of the school. Outside, it was a typical blue sky day, but with what we'd all been hearing, the bright summer's day managed to have an element of creepiness to it. The hallways were typically silent during class, but that day I heard at least a few times some hurried footsteps and teachers shouting out of their class, occasionally reminding the noisemakers that they should be silent. Recess came, but it felt different. No laughter, no shouting, just a strange quiet. We all stared at the trees around the schoolyard, wondering what the heck was up. Something wasn't right, but none of us wanted to come right out and say it. As the day wore on, the rumors got wilder. Some kids claimed they'd seen a guy lurking behind the trees, looking all scruffy and stumbling around. Others swore they heard mumbling coming from inside the school. Mrs. Patterson tried to reassure us, saying it was probably just our imaginations or maybe some lost hiker. But as the afternoon rolled along, we were all getting jumpy. Those odd sounds outside were getting louder, and people in the class were starting to lose it. 
Finally, Principal Mr. O'Connor made an announcement that we had to go into lockdown. Fear ran through the school as teachers rushed us back to our classrooms. We sat there in silence, waiting and wondering what the heck was happening. Minutes ticked by, each one filled with those strange sounds outside. Then, we heard police sirens. We all listened closely, hearts pounding in our chests. A loud bang echoed through the hallway, making all of us jump in our seats. Someone was pounding on the classroom door next to us, their fists hitting it with a force that made the walls creak. The screams of terror down the hallway grew louder. Mr. O'Connor showed up at our classroom door, beads of sweat on his forehead. He looked like he'd just dodged a bullet. Stay here, he said, his voice shaking. The police are here, and they'll sort everything out. There was a bunch of commotion outside the classroom, further down the hallway. Police were shouting at a guy to get down and show his hands. We could hear the guy shouting back at them, slurring his speech and saying something about not leaving until he gets her. Eventually we saw him being dragged out in handcuffs. The teachers found it impossible to calm us down at that point. Parents were coming into school to collect their children and teachers had given up trying to teach anything. It turns out he was the father of a girl in another class. He had a big fallout with her mother and gotten drunk or high and came to pick up his girl after the mother threatened to never let him see her again. In the end the whole thing was just sad rather than scary, but at the time it was the scariest thing that had ever happened to most of us. On a bitterly cold winter night, I found myself in the kind of situation that would chill any parent to the bone. My two young kids sat shivering in the back seat of our car as I tried to keep my composure. We were stranded on a snow-covered road in the middle of nowhere, far from the nearest town. The car's engine had sputtered and coughed its last breath a while ago, and my phone had no signal. Desperation clung to the cold air as I tried to reassure my children that help was on the way. I had called a tow truck, but it seemed like hours had passed since then, and the icy darkness was unrelenting. Just as I was losing all hope of being rescued, a set of headlights appeared in the distance, slowly growing brighter. Relief washed over me as a man pulled up in a pickup truck, his frosty breath covered his face in the cold night air. Looks like you folks could use some help, he called out, his voice was friendly, but something about the situation had my guard up. I was hesitant, but the thought of my children suffering in the cold pushed me to accept his offer. Yes, thank you, I replied, trying to hide my unease. We've already called a tow truck, but it's taking a while. The man didn't waste any time. He opened the hood of my car and started tinkering with the engine. His hands moved deftly, almost too quickly, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As the minutes turned into what felt like an eternity, the man turned his attention to my children. You know, it's pretty darn cold out here, he said, looking towards them with a warm smile. Why don't you let them sit in my truck? It's nice and toasty in there. I hesitated, glancing at my children. They were practically blue from the cold, their teeth chattering uncontrollably. No thank you, we're okay, I stammered, trying to muster some courage. But the man was persistent, insisting that it was the best thing for them. It won't be long, just until I get this fixed up, he said, his smile never faltering. I've got hot chocolate in the truck, they'll love it. The children began to whine, their tiny voices filled with misery. I felt a lump form in my throat. All right, just for a little while, I relented, my heart pounding in my chest. As my son and daughter climbed into the stranger's truck, I watched anxiously from a distance. Minutes turned into what felt like hours as the man continued to work on my car. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong and my mind raced with dark scenarios. The kids wrapped in the stranger's blankets seemed oblivious to the unsettling atmosphere that had settled around us. They giggled and chatted about how cozy and warm the truck was. My daughter even mentioned how nice it would be to spend the night in a comfy bed instead of the cold car. The stranger, 
who had been fiddling with my car engine, suddenly looked up and said, You know, the nearest town is only about a half hour's drive from here. I'd be more than happy to take your kids there, give them a warm meal and a place to sleep for the night. It's not safe for them to stay out here. My heart raced as my children's faces lit up with excitement. They began pleading with me to let them go, their voices filled with innocence and trust. Mom, please, it'll be fun, my son exclaimed. Despite the freezing cold that still gripped me, a chill of a different kind ran down my spine. I absolutely hated everything about this situation. I needed to protect my children, but letting them drive away with a stranger obviously wasn't an option. But neither was freezing to death. They weren't helping the situation at all. I hated how naive they were, and I hated how they would ignore my attempts to give them a serious stare while I was trying to communicate to them that we were in a bad situation. The stranger's insistence, coupled with my children's growing enthusiasm, created an agonizing dilemma. I mustered all the politeness I could, and replied, Thank you so much for your offer, but the tow truck should be here soon, and we'll be on our way. We wouldn't want to trouble you any further. The man's expression changed. His eyes narrowed as he glanced at me with a hint of frustration. Ma'am, I'm just trying to help. It's not safe for your kids out here in the cold. I promise, I'm a good guy. The standoff continued, my heart pounding in my chest as the tension thickened. The stranger's insistence clashed with my maternal instincts and I felt a growing urgency to protect my children from whatever threat might be lurking behind his seemingly kind offer. As the minutes passed, the kids continued to shiver despite the warmth of the stranger's truck. I couldn't ignore their discomfort any longer. Trying to sound as composed as possible, I said to them, it's time to get back into our car. The tow truck should be here soon. The children reluctantly agreed, and we climbed out of the stranger's truck, thanking him for his help. As we made our way back to our car, the man's eyes followed us. He seemed disappointed but didn't insist any further. I hurriedly bundled the kids back into the car, and we locked the doors. Just as we settled in, the distant sound of a tow truck's engine reached our ears. The tow truck arrived, its lights cutting through the darkness like a beacon of hope. The driver, a burly man with a kind face, jumped out and got to work on my car. As he worked, he glanced at me and the stranger. You're lucky I got here as fast as I did, he said, his tone was serious. You know, this road isn't safe at night. It's best to stay in your car. The stranger's demeanor changed instantly. His friendly smile vanished, replaced by a look of cold determination. Without a word, he climbed into his truck and sped away into the snowy night, leaving me with a chilling sense of dread. With my kids safely beside me and our car on the road to recovery, the sense of dread that had hung over me earlier began to fade. The late night drive home, though still chilly, felt considerably less ominous than the creepy encounter we had just experienced. And as we finally drove away from that desolate stretch of road, I couldn't help but wonder what might have happened if we had accepted the stranger's offer to take the kids away in his truck. The thought made me feel sick, and I knew we had narrowly escaped a potentially perilous situation. The worst part about all of it was my children's lack of situational awareness. They were so eager to be taken away by a stranger. I made a very conscious effort to teach them more about dangerous situations and that when mommy looks at them with a big serious expression and tells them something, that they need to listen and do as they're told. I had been chatting with this girl online for weeks, and she seemed like the perfect match for me. So when she suggested we meet at hers, which happened to be in the middle of nowhere, I couldn't resist the adventure. My GPS had guided me through the labyrinth of back roads, with the promise that I was nearing her location. But as I rounded yet another bend, I found myself in the middle of a seemingly abandoned junkyard. Rusty old cars and worn down buildings loomed in the darkness. The place was only lit by my car and the moonlight. Confusion turned to fear as I realized this was the wrong place. Panic set in when the harsh glare of headlights suddenly appeared behind me. 
A group of burly men, their faces obscured by the shadows, blocked my way and surrounded my truck. One of them, clearly the leader, approached my window. His eyes were filled with suspicion. What the hell are you doing here, boy? This is private property. My words tumbled out in a rush as I explained my predicament that I was supposed to meet someone nearby, but my GPS had led me astray. They exchanged glances, their suspicion turning into a sinister grin. Sure, sure, the leader said, but you see, we've been having some trouble with trespassers lately. Can't be too careful, you know? His companions chuckled ominously. Without another word, I threw my car into reverse and backed out of there as fast as I could. My heart was pounding. I turned the car around quicker than I thought was possible, and I fumbled with the GPS, trying to tell it to return home. The men continued to shout at me as I sped away, but my troubles were far from over. My GPS, unable to keep up with my rapid escape, soon led me onto an even narrower road. Darkness surrounded me as I ventured further into the woods. My anxiety was making my legs shake aggressively, and my hands could barely follow simple instructions. With no self-service and no signs of civilization, I was well and truly lost. Suddenly, as if mocking my desperation, a deer bounded out from the shadows and onto the road. Panic surged through me as I slammed on the brakes, screeching almost to a complete stop. The deer barely reacted and just continued to slowly prance down the road. Suddenly, I noticed the rednecks from the junkyard had caught up, their truck now dangerously close behind me. They were leaning on the horn, yelling obscenities, and I really started to feel like I wasn't getting out of this alive. Desperation pushed me to follow the deer. I drove at a crawl, praying the animal would move aside. But it just dominated the road in front of me for a painful amount of time. It continued to run ahead of me, the longer it was there, the more it started to look like some type of demon. It looked like something you'd see in Norse mythology. Its horns looked like human arms reaching into the sky. My heart raced as I watched the creature's every move. The rednecks were relentless, inching closer, their voices growing louder, getting even angrier. The suspense was unbearable. I was trapped behind the deer, with nowhere to go, and a group of hostile men closing in behind me. The narrow road seemed to stretch on forever, and with every passing second I couldn't help imagine all of the different ways that I was going to be killed. The men in the truck behind me were starting to push into the back of my car, and I could hear the revving of their engine eager to push me off the road. I really started to panic and started honking at the deer. I even contemplated abandoning my car and fleeing into the darkness, but I knew that would be futile, they would catch me within moments. As we continued our awful drive on that terrible road, the deer suddenly leaped to the side, disappearing into the dense underbrush. I seized the opportunity and accelerated. When I looked back in my mirror, I saw the deer jump out again right in front of their truck. They slammed on the brakes and were frantically shouting at it to get out of the way. I'm sure they had no issue with killing a deer, but ramming it with their truck at that slow speed would likely just make it angry and it wouldn't be worth the damage. I didn't hesitate for a second as I went full speed down the rest of the road, hitting every bump with no regard for the condition of my car. I drove for what felt like hours, my heart still pounding, until I finally stumbled upon a small town. There, I found my bearings and eventually made it to the nearest motel. It was only when I locked the door behind me that I felt safe enough to breathe. As I lay in bed, trying to process what had happened, I couldn't help wondering about that deer. Was it merely a coincidence, a strange twist of fate? Or did it know what it was doing, sensing my fear, deciding to lead me away from danger and preventing them from chasing me? I'd almost completely forgotten about my date and when I checked the app to tell her what had happened, she unmatched. I have mixed thoughts about the whole thing. Was she a catfish the whole time, luring me into danger? Did she think that I had ghosted her, so she unmatched out of embarrassment? I kind of believe that she set me up, either as a prank or as part of the junkyard group. What their plan was, I'm not sure. But I've given up with dating apps. A 
few years back, I'd just gotten my first bike. As a young female rider, I often attracted unwanted attention. People couldn't help but notice me as I cruised through the streets. It was exhilarating, and I loved the feeling of the wind and the freedom of the open road. Most bikers I came across were so kind and welcoming and there's a really strong community. But there were times when the attention crossed a line. One evening, I was riding home after a long day. The sun was setting, casting a warm glow across the sky. The road was quiet, just the way I liked it. My bike growled beneath me, and for a moment, everything felt perfect. But then, as I pulled into a gas station to top up my tank, I noticed him, a young guy on another bike, maybe in his twenties. He parked beside me, and our eyes met. I offered a polite nod, thinking he'd move on. Instead, he removed his helmet and started chatting. He had a friendly smile and an easygoing demeanor, and although his confidence was admirable, something about his persistence set me on edge. We talked for a few minutes about our bikes and the thrill of riding. He seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he was being a bit too forward. I nodded and kept my responses short, hoping he'd eventually get bored and ride off into the sunset. However, that wasn't his plan. After filling up our tanks, he hopped back on his bike and revved his engine, indicating that he was going to follow me. Anxiety began to creep in as I realized this stranger wanted to ride with me. This wasn't completely unheard of, I'd gone side by side a few times with some other bikers until we both go our own ways. But I was heading home, and I didn't want to be followed. As the miles rolled by, he continued to ride beside me, occasionally trying to impress me with a wheelie or a burst of speed. It wasn't overly creepy, just persistent. I decided it was time to lose him. I knew my bike and its capabilities well, so I hit the throttle, speeding away from him. The wind rushed past me as I pushed my bike to its limits. He caught up again and I realized that I wasn't going to lose him. I decided to pull over and he pulled up next to me. He was so proud of himself. He took off his helmet and had a massive grin on his face as if we'd been playing a fun game. I told him I was heading home now and that I'd see him around. He continued smiling at me and told me he'd make sure I get back safe. I really wasn't in the mood, I kind of snapped and told him directly that I was good and didn't need an escort. Just as I started to leave, I gave him a wave. One last attempt to make it clear that I was saying goodbye, leave me alone. He'd rested his helmet down so it took him some time to get ready. I managed to get some serious distance this time. Glancing back, I saw him in the distance, desperately trying to catch up. The adrenaline was pumping through my veins as I weaved through the winding roads. But the persistent rider wasn't giving up. He was closing in fast. I could hear the roar of his engine growing louder, and I knew I had to make a decision. Ahead, the road took a sharp turn. I had to slow down to navigate it safely. That's when he saw his chance to overtake me. He revved his engine, racing forwards. But he misjudged the turn, and before I knew it, he slammed into the wall with a deafening crash. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched in shock. He flew over the barrier, disappearing into the darkness. Without hesitation, I screeched to a halt and rushed to the edge. I pulled out my flashlight and shined it into the water, desperately trying to spot him. It was almost pitch black and I'd barely even seen how far he went. All I know is that I saw him fly straight ahead. He clearly landed in the river, but it was really wide, and visibility was minimal. I shouted for him, whilst pulling out my phone to call for help. The river was moving fast, he could have easily been miles downstream by the time help arrived. I stayed there for hours that night, searching for this stranger, desperately hoping that we'd find him. I had this awful feeling of guilt, one moment I was racing away from him, the next, I wanted nothing more than to see him alive and well. I still wrestle with the idea that it was my fault. I didn't even give him a chance to explain why he was going the same way as me. They never did find his body. That river has claimed many lives over the years, and I feel like I contributed to it.
I was just 14 years old, and it seemed like an ordinary night. It was roughly around 9 p.m., I was at my younger cousin's house and I was babysitting for the night. Both of our parents had gone out for drinks and weren't going to be back until late. We were just lounging around, sitting in the living room, watching random shows on television. So we're sitting there and I was feeling really unsettled. Something was wrong but I couldn't put my finger on it. I tried to ignore it and kept watching TV with my cousin who was happily enjoying my company. The feeling wasn't going away. So I got up and walked to the back door to lock it. When I came back through the kitchen, I realized what was causing my weird feeling. In the window, there was a very decrepit and homeless looking man. Just staring into the window, looking at my young cousin. Protective mode turned on. I pretended like I didn't see the guy and I told my little cousin that we needed to go upstairs because our parents would be home soon and they wouldn't want him to be staying up late. I went upstairs and put him to bed, knowing damn well that there was a man outside that wanted to get in. At the time, I was about 125 pounds and 5 foot 8 and I played football for my school. If I remember correctly I went downstairs and straight into the kitchen and grabbed one of those meat tenderizing hammers. I turned back to the window where I saw him before. He wasn't there. So I ran back to the front door and checked that it was locked. Both the deadbolt and the knob were locked. I ran back upstairs with my meat tenderizer and went into my cousin's room and sat down in front of the door. He asked me what I was doing and I said that he didn't need to worry about it and that he should keep his head low. I called the cops and then my dad and uncle. Cops said they would take half an hour and my dad and uncle were 45 minutes away. All of a sudden I hear a window shatter and the sound of heavy boots walking around on the tiles. I told my cousin to stay calm and hide under the covers. I whispered to him that he needed to stay silent. I could hear the guy walking around downstairs, it was horrifying. I gripped that damn meat tenderizer and waited. About five minutes pass and then I hear the boots walking upstairs, at this point I was having a freaking heart attack. My cousin's door is no more than ten feet from the stairs. I heard him opening the doors to my uncle's room. Then the bathroom. My cousin's door was next along the hallway. I was shaking with adrenaline at this point. Suddenly, he decided to walk back downstairs and I heard him open the door to the basement. Fifteen minutes later the police showed up and burst into the house. They came up to our room and I told them that I heard him go into the basement. They rushed down there and caught the guy without much fuss. It turned out the guy was loose from a mental hospital from the city about 20 miles away. He had the mental age of a child and had broken into a few other houses in the area. I had nightmares for months afterwards. About 10 years ago, I lived on my own and didn't have much company. I was quite depressed at the time after losing my girlfriend to a drunk driver. I was enjoying a beer and watching the sunset on the back porch when I saw a large, scruffy man emerging from the tree line. My heart skipped a beat as he stumbled towards my house in a menacing way. Living alone, I often used my backyard for target practice. And at that moment, I was immensely grateful for it. Instinctively, I rushed to bolt all the doors while frantically dialing the police. What I didn't know was that this intruder had broken in the day before through a basement window and had spent the night squatting there. He had left the basement door unlocked and at this point he made his way inside the house and was making his way up the stairs towards me. I gripped my rifle, aiming at the approaching man as he descended the hallway. I shouted at him, ordering him to stop and get on the ground, but he just kept walking towards me. I fired the first round, loaded with rock salt, but he showed no reaction, undeterred. I quickly followed with a rubber bullet to the chest. Yet the drugged up guy who was clearly out of his mind, continued advancing. This guy was huge, at least twice my size, and I realized that whatever drugs he had in his body were going to push him through any pain that a rubber bullet would inflict. He was backing me into a corner. I desperately begged him to stop, 
and warned him what would happen, but he just moaned at me like a zombie and lunged towards me. I took my third shot. I can't recall whether it was buckshot or a slug, but it left a gaping hole in his chest. It barely even slowed him down. He kept coming, and in a frenzied struggle, he wrestled me to the ground. He was moaning and coughing up blood. Suddenly, he grabbed my face with both of his massive hands and started squeezing my head. It was utterly terrifying. I could feel him trying to burst my skull open like a balloon. I don't know how long it actually lasted, but it felt like forever. Eventually, the injury finally caught up with him, and he died on top of me. I was laying with him crushing me for a few minutes. My energy was completely drained and I could barely breathe with his weight on top of me. His body was pushing my rifle into my chest and it was causing me serious pain when I tilted his body to the side. I was completely drenched in his blood and I can still remember the overwhelming smell. I'd completely forgotten that I was still on the phone with the operator who had heard our entire exchange which more or less amounted to me pleading, stop, or I'll shoot, and the man menacingly taunting. The police arrived soon after, and the incident made it to the local papers. There was a criminal investigation, but eventually, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. It turned out that the intruder was wanted for murder of an elderly couple in Baltimore and had somehow made his way 50 miles up the road into our rural area. I was 18 and chilling in my friend's apartment alone. We lived in a duplex. He was on the top floor and I was on the bottom. Ironically, I was watching a horror movie when I hear something huge come through the front door and into the kitchen. I got up to see who was there. We threw huge parties all the time, so it wasn't really that odd for some random to just show up. But then I saw this dude. He was a huge country boy wearing overalls and holding a huge butcher's knife, just looking at me while standing in the kitchen. I might have said something, I don't remember. But I promptly rushed out of a side door, ran into my apartment and locked all the doors. I don't remember who I called or exactly what happened, but I know I waited until I couldn't hear anyone moving around upstairs anymore and crept back in. Big guy was passed out on the couch. Turns out he was on parole for domestic abuse charges, had gotten super sauce downtown, and made it to the apartment where he used to live. He was arrested and we never heard from him again, so I assume his parole didn't go too well. I also have another story from that apartment, possibly related. Again, I was home alone and waiting for my friend to get back so we could play some Xbox. It's like 1am and suddenly there's aggressive banging on the door. As I mentioned, it wasn't unusual to have unexpected guests, but banging like this? Not normal. I get closer to the door and this guy is screaming about money and he kept referring to someone called Big Man. Open the door, Big Man. Big Man apparently owed him $10,000 and he was here to collect. He had something metal, I assumed it was a gun or a metal baseball bat. I could hear the clang noise when he'd smack the door. I was pretty high at the time and didn't know what to do, so I just stood on the other side of the door for about 20 minutes whilst he shouted abuse and tried to kick the door down. Pretty dumb, but I was young and stupid. He did eventually leave and I don't know if he came back one night during a party or what, but I never heard about him again. One final thing that happened in that apartment. It was the day after a party, my flatmate was once again out and it was just me at home. There was a knock at the door and I looked through and could see a delivery guy. I opened the door and he says he's got a delivery for me, already paid for. He's just carrying a delivery bag that seems suspiciously light. He asks where's Jason and I ask who that is. He tells me Jason ordered it and says he can only deliver it to Jason because he paid for it. I didn't know anyone with that name and the guy didn't look like your typical delivery guy. I told him he must have the wrong address and this guy shoves his hand in the door and pushes it open whilst I'm trying to close it. We have this intense standoff where I'm trying to tell him that Jason doesn't live here and he insists that I let him in to check. He gives me this serious stare and tells me it's just Jason he needs to see. 
he decided to drop the delivery man act and it was clear that he and Jason had business. I was about to let him in to prove that Jason didn't live here when my flatmate came home and celebrated the fact that I'd ordered pizza. The guy dropped his bag and left. It took me a while to put all of the strange encounters together. The guy on parole who'd broken in originally was probably the guy that owed people money and had people showing up to get him to pay. We both moved out a few weeks later. That place was too much trouble. I remember that summer vividly, I was about 15, and my family decided to spend a few weeks camping near the lake. It was the perfect escape from the sweltering heat of the city. We set up our campsite, complete with a cozy tent and a small bonfire pit. Days were filled with swimming, hiking, and enjoying the company of my parents and younger brother. One evening, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a warm orange glow over the tranquil waters. The crackling of the campfire filled the air, and we all huddled close, sharing stories and roasting marshmallows. My little brother was captivated by the stars that dotted the night sky, and my parents laughed and reminisced about their own childhood camping trips. As the fire dwindled and everyone retreated to their tents, I lay in my sleeping bag, feeling the cool breeze against my skin. I could hear the distant hum of insects and the soft lapping of water against the shore. It was peaceful, serene, until a rustling noise interrupted the quiet. I lay still, my heart quickening as I strained my ears to listen. The rustling grew louder, closer. A chill ran down my spine as I realized that the sound was coming from just outside my tent. It was too rhythmic to be the wind, it sounded deliberate. Fear clenched my chest, and I held my breath, hoping that whatever was out there would just move along. But then, I heard it. A low, guttural growl. My pulse raced, and I felt a surge of adrenaline. I knew I needed to see what was causing the noise, even though every fiber of my being was screaming for me to stay hidden. With shaky hands, I unzipped the tent just enough to peer out. Moonlight filtered through the trees, casting eerie shadows that danced on the ground. And there, just a few feet away, I saw it. It was a large, hulking figure, partially obscured by the darkness. My breath caught in my throat as my eyes locked onto it, two glowing orbs that seemed to pierce through the night. The growl grew louder, more menacing, and the figure took a step closer. Fear paralyzed me, my mind racing to make sense of what I was seeing. My instincts told me to stay hidden, to stay quiet, but curiosity and dread pushed me to inch the tent flap open just a bit more. That's when I saw its shape, a massive, shadowy creature with elongated limbs and sharp glistening teeth. Its eyes never left mine as it stood there, almost as if it were studying me, assessing my fear. As the seconds dragged on, I felt a sense of dread. I couldn't tear my gaze away from those eyes, and I couldn't shake the feeling that this was a predator, a force much more powerful than me. My heart pounded in my chest, drowning out the sounds of the night, as I realized that whatever this creature was, it was not something to be trifled with. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned and melted into the shadows, disappearing into the night. The woods fell silent. I zipped the tent shut, my mind racing with questions and possibilities. Morning came, and I emerged from my tent, shaken but determined to find some rational explanation for the night's terror. I scoured the area around the campsite, half hoping to find evidence of a prank or a wandering animal, but there was nothing, no signs that the creature had ever been there. I tried to shake off the unease, chalking it up to an overactive imagination and the dark of the night playing tricks on my mind. Reluctantly, I shared my experience with my parents over breakfast, expecting them to dismiss it as the product of my teenage imagination. My dad chuckled, attributing the sounds to a nocturnal animal, probably just a bear rummaging around the campsite. Mom nodded in agreement, 
mentioning that bears were known to roam these parts from time to time. As much as I wanted to accept their explanation, a gnawing feeling remained deep within me. I knew what I'd seen and heard, it was no bear. It was something bigger, something much scarier. Even now, years later, whenever I'm surrounded by the tranquility of the gray outdoors, I can't help but think about that night. I've heard the usual explanations, the logical reasoning, but deep down, I'm certain that what I encountered was something different, something you hear about in urban legends. I always think about going back to that place with some friends and searching for that monster. But that's probably not a good idea, is it? I love to go camping. Been doing it my whole life. Never had a scary experience until this past summer. My boyfriend and I decided to go out to the gorge for some quality time camping. We had always gone with several other people, but this was the first time it was just the two of us. When we got out of the car to prepare our gear for the hike back to the camping spot, two sketchy looking dudes came out of the trailhead, looked us up and down, and got into their old school VW camper van. I had a weird feeling but shrugged it off and proceeded back to our camping spot. I had previously camped in the same area a handful of times and knew it pretty well. Once we got back there, I knew of a handful of different camping spots and proceeded to check them all out for the one that would be ideal. I noticed what looked like someone camping further up the hill so I picked a spot a little further down where we'd be mostly out of sight. Not out of earshot though, as I heard yelling over on the trail. It was starting to get dark by the time we got everything set up so I figured I'd start looking for firewood. Suddenly this guy appears out of nowhere and asks us if we'd like any help and offered to sell us a bundle of firewood for $10. I laughed because we were in the woods, thus surrounded by wood which I could pick up off the ground, for free. He then said I wouldn't find much wood because they'd already cleared it out over the past few weeks. Few weeks? I asked him how long he'd been camping up there and he said almost a month. The longest anyone can camp in this area, a national forest, is two weeks. I already had the creeps about him and he claimed he was up there by himself. I asked him why I heard him yelling with someone then and why he had referred to more people when talking about the wood. He stammered and was like, oh well uh, yeah, there's some dudes I know camping over there up on the other side of the river. Then he proceeds to tell us that he's been lonely since he arrived. He was from Pennsylvania, took a bus to Lexington, Kentucky, and had been living in the woods back behind where I currently work. I knew exactly where he was talking about because I see homeless, immigrants, and drug addicts coming in and out of those woods every day. So basically he was a homeless man who somehow got a ride out to the gorge and decided he would just live there instead. He had been living on snakes, bugs, and selling firewood for food and beer. But he said we were the first people he'd seen in a few weeks. His stories were all over the place, and I knew he was lying about a lot of what he told us. He wasn't alone even though he claimed to be. He even took us to his camp where there was tons of stuff for several guys, not just one. He said he liked camping up top where he could see everything and everyone. By now it was dark and he helped us get a fire going. I was trying to politely get him on his way back up the hill so I could have a minute to process all of this. When he left I started whispering to my boyfriend that there was no way in hell I could sleep with that lying sketchy homeless creep right up the hill. We didn't have a gun, knife, or even a dog to protect ourselves if we needed to. I said let's quietly get our shit together and get the hell out of here. Which we did, only we left our new tarp set up because they would make too much noise and he'd know we were leaving. As soon as I stood up with my pack, ready to get the hell out of Dodge, he yells how's it going and we proceeded to GTFO as quickly and quietly as possible. In my mind we were either getting robbed, kidnapped, killed, or something else because he was not alone. His stories didn't add up and his background of where he came from made me believe he was running from something and was trying to hide by living off the grid. I called the rangers the next morning and told them about him. Luckily all he got from us was a set of new tarps. Weeks later, we saw on the news that multiple people had gone missing in the area and that there was a manhunt for the guy who wouldn't leave us alone. I always think about how we really dodged a bullet when I insisted that we left. 
we found a new camping spot the next year. I was about 11, my sister was 13. We slept in the living room of a little caravan we used to stay in over summer. There wasn't a lot to do, the campsite didn't have any amenities. I'd pass the time playing with my sister, taking walks or playing the Nintendo. This was 98, so Castlevania and Donkey Kong Country weren't nostalgic yet, they were just lame. I couldn't wait to get home and back to the PC so I could get my theme hospital on. But mostly I'd read. I had a collection of books about ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and such. I picked them up at library sales or in charity shops. My favorites were the unexplained true stories, like the Dover Demon or the Gulf Breeze incident. There was a quarry on the other side of the site, sometimes at night I'd pretend the two red lights were the eyes of the Mothman who'd swoop down to terrorize my family. What I'm getting at here is I was a kid, and I had an active imagination, but I never believed anything spooky would actually happen to me. If something out of the ordinary happens, it's just your mind playing tricks on you, right? I woke up one morning around 6.20. It was gray outside, the sun had just come up, but fog and cloudy skies ensure it wasn't too bright. I felt uneasy, because I'd usually sleep till 9 at least. It was silent. My sister wasn't even snoring as she normally did. And then I heard it. It sounded like a horse galloping. It was just outside the window. It was unsettling, to say the least. Had a horse escaped from a nearby field? Surely not. I'd never seen any horses around here, and what's more, it didn't sound heavy enough. Whatever it was, it was making circles around the caravan. I'd hear it fade a little as it looped around the other end where my parents slept, and then get louder, almost next to my head. It had the irregular rhythm of a gallop, but I never heard four legs. It was almost like a person was skipping very, very quickly, but no person could be heavy enough to make the kind of noise on soft ground. It was fading, off into the distance. Whatever it was seemed to have ran off. I breathed a little easier. What a crazy situation. Maybe I hadn't fully woken up yet and was having a dream hangover. And then it came back. It was getting louder and more insistent. I decided to take my chances. Rosie? Are you awake? Yeah, she said, voice quivering. You can hear that, right? Yeah. What is it? I don't know, I answered truthfully. I'm afraid to look outside though. Why? I'm afraid it might be the devil. She moaned in fear. There was a thump from the other end of the caravan, like whatever was outside had grazed it. I pulled my blanket tighter around me. After about a minute, it faded again. I told myself if it came back, I'd look outside, and the devil be damned. It didn't come back. My parents woke up around eight, made us breakfast, and the fog cleared. We asked them if they'd heard anything strange earlier. They hadn't. There were no scrapes on the caravan that would suggest something heavy bumping against it. Apart from my sister, there was no evidence that anything had ever happened. Except for one rough footprint outside the front door, in the shape of a hoof. To this day, I regret not looking outside to see what it was. But when I wake up in the middle of the night, and everything seems so strange, I understand why I didn't. About 13 years ago when I was 18 and had just gotten my first computer, I spent a lot of time exploring some pretty disturbing websites. It was different back then, there wasn't much stopping you from ending up on gore websites, it was quite common to be scrolling through forums and suddenly see a video of someone being beheaded or accidentally watching an execution. Admittedly, I sometimes went out of my way to watch this kind of stuff too. Morbid curiosity I guess. So. As I ventured down the rabbit hole of the dark web one night, I came across a website that claimed to be an interactive adventure. 
I loved interactive adventure storybooks and thought a digital version could be even better. Upon entering the site, I was immediately struck by its unusual format. Instead of traditional storytelling choices, it presented a series of hyper-realistic photos showcasing various choices. The story started outside what looked like an abandoned factory. You always had two choices. The first one was pretty simple. You had to choose which door to go into. One door had a no entry sign on it, and the other had a big stop sign. I chose the second one because I figured that it lead to the more interesting story. Each choice led to a set of photos that portrayed the consequences of your choice. For the first few clicks it was just navigating the factory. There were all sorts of tools and creepy props all over the place. It looked like a slaughterhouse with what looked like body parts of pigs or some other animal hanging on hooks. The level of realism was shocking, especially back then when the public or some cheap website wouldn't have the funding to make such realistic scenes. The next image had a picture of the woman with her hands clearly chopped off with only bleeding stumps remaining on her arms. I couldn't believe this game was free. It was so convincing. The two choices now were just save or end. I was not about to end my little journey here so I clicked save. Again, the website took a few minutes to load and I sat patiently waiting for the next part of the story. I was so numb to gore and this kind of thing after spending enough time on the internet, so I wasn't particularly shocked at the bloody details, just in love with the creativity of this game. The page refreshed and it was an image of the woman again, but this time her hands were bandaged and she's staring right at the camera, absolute terror in her eyes. I thought it was weird that I didn't get to make a choice, but I assumed when you save the game it kind of does a soft reset so that people who made other choices would all lead to that part anyway. I played similar games before so I knew that often, no matter which choices you make, the game will force you down the path it had planned anyway. Another choice appeared. Man or child. I was a sick little teenager but I didn't want to see a child getting tortured even if it was just a game so I chose the man. A few minutes passed again and then a man appeared in the chair. This time I had the choice between a rope and a baseball bat. I chose the rope wondering how creative they could get with something so simple. Once again, a short delay between the next image loading, and I maybe started to get a bit bored at this point, but I waited. The next page loaded. The man had the rope around his neck. He was stood on the chair and the rope was attached to a metal beam above. It was crazy how brutal this website was, but part of me loved the intensity. I'd hit another checkpoint asking to save or end. It was at that moment my mom knocked on my bedroom door and I panicked and quickly pressed end. The page went blank just as she walked in. This is where it got seriously creepy. I immediately felt my stomach turn and my heart drop. The picture had loaded. The man who'd been holding the camera the whole time was now looking into a mirror dressed in some butcher overalls covered in blood. Leaning against the mirror was the man with the broken neck his face had some disturbingly realistic details, like his eyes bulging and his face seriously discolored. Two female hands, standing upright on their stubs, were also sitting next to the mirror, both with their thumbs up. It was incredibly morbid, but that wasn't the worst part at all. The worst part was written on the mirror. My name. My address. My mind was racing, I was completely freaking out. I even turned my screen off as if that would do anything. Was this real? Did I just determine the fates of these people? What the hell was going on? How did they have my details? I felt sick. I turned the screen back on and saw the two choices. It said, continue. With yes or no as the options. I immediately clicked no. I was done. I was genuinely so scared. The page started loading again, this time quite a lot faster than usual. The new page was just a zoomed in image of my name and address. With the option to continue being repeated back at me. This time with save or end as the options. Is that what save meant? Save the woman? And end? Did I choose to end the man? 
I was drenched in sweat at this point and really panicking. Was this a threat? I have to continue or they'll come for me. Am I choosing to save myself or end myself? I hated everything about this moment. I clicked end and immediately turned the computer off. As you can tell from the fact that I'm telling this story, they never came for me. We did move house a few weeks later for unrelated reasons, so maybe that's why. But I lived in complete fear for at least three years after this. Did I really do those things? Was it just a creative game with some clever tricks? It would explain the long loading pages. I don't like to think about it. Well, at least I didn't choose the child. Have you ever Googled yourself? A few months ago I was feeling curious and decided to do it out of sheer boredom. With a fairly rare name, I wasn't expecting much in the search results. Yet to my surprise, I stumbled upon a website that had my full name as its domain. Upon clicking the link, I found myself on a message board. The website owner's profile appeared oddly familiar, sharing my age and similar hobbies. Although the message board lacked any posts, I saved it in my favorites due to the intrigue. A month later I returned to the site. This time it boasted more content featuring diary entries that seemed ordinary at first glance. Notes like the weather was nice today or I'm so bored at work. Yet as time passed, I began noticing an array of coincidences. The owner lived in my city, which struck me as quite a coincidence given the rarity of our shared name. As I delved deeper, I found the diary's contents eerily mirroring my life experiences. One day it mentioned attending the same baseball game I had gone to. At first I dismissed it as a simple chance occurrence given the popularity of the local team. However, the coincidences persisted and became unsettlingly precise. Their pet dog's name matched mine from childhood and even their favorite restaurant was the same one I frequented during my previous job. One particular day, the message board was filled with birthday wishes for the owner. Oddly enough, it was my birthday as well. Intrigued, I decided to leave a message for the owner, mentioning our shared name and extending a birthday greeting. However, to my surprise, there was no option to type a message. It appeared the message board was merely a static page. Puzzled, I reached out to the owner via email with a simple introduction. Hi there. Believe it or not, we share the same name, birthday, and we're in the same city. Nice to meet you. Just a friendly introduction. A few days later, I got curious again and tried showing the website to some buddies, thinking we all have a laugh about it. But guess what? The website was gone. Completely vanished. No trace. It wasn't even in my browsing history. That didn't sit well with me. Something felt off. I mean, it's like the whole thing was there one day and then poof, it just vanished into thin air. And then I got an email from my own email address. It just said, found you. Attached was a picture and, I swear my heart stopped. It was me. Sitting at my computer. In my room. And here's the worst part. The angle of the shot was taken from the corner of my room where the window is. You have to climb the side of my house to get to this window. I zoomed in, squinting at every detail. The hairs on my neck stood up as I realized the angle of the picture didn't match up with the window. It was clearly taken from the very corner of my room where I usually keep my old chair piled with clothes. Someone had been inside. My mind raced. Who could have taken this? How did they get inside? I went through every possible explanation. A prank maybe? But the more I thought about it, the more that email in that picture made me feel like I was being watched. Stalked. I can admit I was freaked out. The whole thing went from curious to seriously messed up real quick. I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Monitored. The thought of someone sneaking around in my personal space snapping a picture while I was totally unaware. It's unsettling, to say the least. I've permanently locked all of my windows now, 
and I've got this weird paranoia about my room. Like, am I going crazy or was someone actually in here? One night I was scrolling aimlessly through social media, clicking on random links about the dark web and supposedly true stories about crazy encounters. Boredom can drive anyone to the weirdest corners of the web, and that's how I stumbled upon this bizarre post that grabbed my attention. It was an image of my front door. The caption, back where I belong, was written below it. I'm not the superstitious type, so I rolled my eyes and chalked it up to a creative attempt at freaking someone out. The next day, I couldn't resist mentioning it to my buddies. Their reactions were a mix of amusement and speculative theories about hidden cameras and creepy stalkers. They laughed it off and I joined in. After all, we're living in the age of tech, where a few clicks can pull up someone's life story, including the color of their socks on a specific day. Probably just some algorithm, I said, dismissing the weirdness. They probably got it from my IP address and Google Maps. They chuckled teasing me about my lack of supernatural belief. I shrugged it off. It's not like I have anyone that would want to hurt me. But as the night progressed, the sense of being watched started gnawing at me. The shadows from the window seemed to stretch a bit too far, and every creak of the floorboard sounded like a whisper. Ridiculous, right? A couple of days passed and I thought the unease had finally left me until an email from an unknown sender popped up in my inbox. The subject line was empty and the email had a single link. No text, just an ominous hyperlink. Curiosity and a little defiance propelled my finger to click the link. It opened a web page I'd never seen before with a weird combination of numbers and letters as its title. The screen displayed a live feed from my living room where I was sitting with my laptop. I blinked and rubbed my eyes completely stunned as I saw myself from behind. Clearly there was a camera in my room, but where? Okay, now that's just messed up, I muttered, assuming it was a prank or someone playing with sophisticated tech tricks. But the camera panned around the room and my unease twisted tighter. My eyes darted around the familiar surroundings, trying to figure out where the camera was. That's why I noticed it. The angle was directly in line with the mirror that was mounted on the wall. My heart raced. I approached the mirror and tried looking at the laptop to see if my face was appearing on the live stream, but the website had turned into an error page. I spent some time trying to refresh the website and follow the link from the mail, but it was like it never existed. I checked the mirror again and there was no obvious signs of there being a camera. I was exhausted after a long day and I had quite a few drinks with my friends, so I told myself I was just being paranoid and went to bed. Days went by and I tried to forget the whole thing. Until one night, as I got up to grab some water in the middle of my sleep, I glanced at the mirror again. My reflection was normal, but something in the background wasn't. The edge of a shadowy figure peeked out from the corner of the mirror, a hint of a presence that shouldn't be there. I quickly turned around, heart racing, but there was nothing. The unease tightened its grip again. I need to chill out, I muttered to myself. It's all in my head. I blamed stress, lack of sleep and the power of suggestion. But when I found my favorite mug smashed to pieces on the floor of my kitchen the next morning, I couldn't stop thinking that someone had been in my house. I was a believer in facts and logic. So when I heard the kitchen door creak open the next night, I didn't jump to supernatural conclusions. I thought it was an intruder. I tried the light switch, but it didn't work. It was practically pitch black. I grabbed my baseball bat and my phone and used its flashlight to investigate. I made my way towards the living room and looked around, aiming the flashlight all over, and suddenly I spot something. The mirror was leaning against the wall and there were obvious wires hanging out of it. I felt a strange mixture of anger and fear. Someone really was messing with me and they were here right now? I shouted who the hell is in my house and turned towards the kitchen. But as I did, the light suddenly came on and blinded me. The world seemed to blur around me. My vision blurred and then 
I woke up. I was back in my bed. I sat up, heart pounding. My bedroom was exactly the same as normal. Had it all been a dream? A really weird, vivid dream? I reached for my phone to check the time and that's why I noticed the notification. An email had come in from an unknown sender. With trembling fingers, I opened it. It was a photograph. Almost the exact same photograph as the one that started this whole thing. It was my front door, but this time it was taken at night. The caption below the image sent shivers down my spine. Sleep well. Goodbye for now. My eyes darted around the room as if expecting someone to jump out at me. But I was alone. My logical mind tried to find a rational explanation. Maybe it was a prank, an elaborate scheme by someone with too much time on their hands. I rushed to my laptop and checked the sender's email address, but it was a jumble of letters and numbers, impossible to trace. I started to panic as I realized that this wasn't a joke. Someone was watching me, invading my privacy, and I had no idea who or why. I ran back into the living room to check the mirror. It was back on the wall in its usual place. I frantically clawed at it and ended up smashing it on the ground in an attempt to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy. I felt like I was going insane, stood barefoot on my broken mirror, shuffling through the shards with my bare hands. The camera was gone. Or it was never there. What was I doing? I locked the front door, drew the curtains and sat in the dimly lit room, my heart racing. I thought about going to the police, but what could he tell them? that I was receiving strange emails and photographs that seemed impossible to explain. The hours dragged on and as the night grew darker, I felt my paranoia settling in. I didn't want to admit it, but the rational explanations were wearing thin. Was it really possible that someone was going this far out of their way to terrorize me? As I gazed at my laptop, its webcam staring back at me, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was watching. I closed the laptop and made my way back to bed. If they wanted to hurt me, they would have done it already, and I was exhausted from this whole ordeal. I accepted my fate and closed my eyes. Good night. Good night. Sleep tight. Late nights at Walmart had their own peculiar aura. The store's emptiness, the quiet hum of the cooling units, and the distant hum of the highway combined to create an unsettling atmosphere. But I needed the job, and my shift wasn't ending until I restocked the shelves and tidied up. As I took my 15-minute break, I stood outside getting some fresh air, there was a regular stray dog that would always be lingering around the area. I'd actually gotten into the habit of throwing in whatever scraps I could muster up from inside. I started to make my way in and I noticed a man in his forties pacing near the entrance. His eyes darted around, as if searching for someone. As I passed by, he looked at me, his gaze unnerving. Hey, could you help me? He called out, his voice almost too friendly. I hesitated, my instincts urging caution. Just need a hand loading a couple of things into my truck, he continued, motioning to the exit. Despite my unease, I agreed, thinking it was a straightforward favor. As we reached the entrance, I noticed that his truck was parked in the darkest corner of the parking lot. My heart pounded, this felt wrong but it was company policy to help people carry things to their car. He gestured to a couple of boxes in the bed of the truck. Could you just hand me those? he asked. My fingers twitched with unease, my gut telling me something was off. But I tried to push the thoughts aside and focused on helping. Just as I reached out to grab a box, a shiver ran down my spine. I heard the faintest whisper behind me, the rustling of fabric. It was the sound of movement of someone stepping out from the shadows. Panic surged through me, and I glanced back. And that's when I saw them, two more men, emerging from the darkness, their faces obscured by shadows. My heart raced, my body tensing, and I dropped the box instinctively. My mind screamed at me to run, to get back inside the store, to safety. 
I turned to bolt, but the man in front of me grabbed my arm, his grip like a vice. Where do you think you're going? He sneered, his friendly demeanor now replaced with a menacing grin. Adrenaline surged through me, and I fought to break free. The men were closing in, their intentions unmistakable. I struggled, my heart pounding in my chest, my thoughts a jumbled mess. And then, out of nowhere, a barrage of barks came from the bushes. It was the stray dog that I'd always see around the parking lot. It lunged at the man who had my arm and latched right onto him. I felt so relieved and shocked that I remember I actually let out a smile and a slight giggle. It's weird, but I vividly remember the massive emotional shift from sheer terror to absolute relief when that dog came running out. The grip on my arm loosened, and I wrenched myself free, stumbling back. I started sprinting back to the store, followed only by the sound of the growling, barking, and moans of pain from the man. At this point my coworker came running out to check on me. I could see the men getting into the truck and driving towards us as I told him what happened. Get lost, my coworker growled, his voice full of authority. The men hesitated for a moment longer before retreating, disappearing into the darkness. My coworker turned to me, clearly concerned for me. You okay? he asked. I nodded, my heart still racing. My mind was still racing and I was on an adrenaline high. That's when the dog ran over, peaceful as ever, wagging his tail and pushing himself into my legs. I gave him the biggest hug and told him how much of a good boy he was. My coworker and I watched as the men disappeared into the night. We need to call the police, he said firmly, his eyes focused on where the men had vanished. We retreated back into the store and dialed 911. Within minutes, the police arrived, and I recounted the chilling encounter to them. They assured us they would patrol the area and keep an eye out for any suspicious activity. The dog stayed with me the whole time as the police took our statements. We had narrowly escaped a potentially dangerous situation, and it was a sobering reminder of the risks that came with late-night shifts. In the days that followed, news spread about a group of individuals attempting to lure unsuspecting victims into their trap. The police were investigating, and I felt a mix of relief and gratitude that my new best friend had come to my rescue. Late nights at Walmart would never be the same for me. The unsettling atmosphere was now a haunting reminder of the night I barely escaped danger. A few years back, while I was doing any work I could get, I took up this gig at the 24-7 Walmart. It was a bit more rundown than your typical Walmart. Dimly lit aisles, flickering fluorescent lights and an eeriness that only an empty Walmart at 3 in the morning can provide. I'm stocking shelves in the cereal aisle, just trying to keep myself awake with a monotonous routine. And then, out of nowhere, this guy saunters in. He's tall. I mean basketball player tall, with long strides that make him seem like he's on some sort of mission. There's hardly anyone around and this dude's pacing down the aisles like he owns the place. Kind of weird, but not out of the ordinary Walmart weird. Just a late night shopper with a peculiar vibe. I'm busy stacking cereal boxes when I catch sight of him again. He's standing at the end of the aisle staring at me with this grin that could send shivers down your spine. The lighting is wonky, casting these creepy shadows that don't help my nerves. Before I can even process what's happening, he's right there, right in front of me. Close enough that I can smell the alcohol on his breath. He shoots me this look like he's got the juiciest secret in the world, and then he says, I've done something very naughty. I try to laugh it off, brush it away with a nervous chuckle. But he's not having it. He keeps staring, that grin still plastered on his face. It's late, it's quiet, and the place is kind of creepy already. But this guy, he's turned it up to ten. He starts following me. Aisle after aisle. Every time I turn around, there he is, watching with that stupid smile. It's like he's playing a twisted game of hide and seek, and I'm not even a player. More like the unwilling target. I try to get on with my work, but I can feel his eyes on me like they're drilling holes into my back. Then, out of nowhere, he starts humming this tune. It's faint, just under his breath, 
but it's off-putting as hell. I can't put my finger on where I've heard it before, but it's that famously creepy whistling song. I decide to take a breather and head to the break room. Maybe I can shake him off and catch a few moments of normalcy. My coworker's in there and we're making small talk about assignments and exams, trying to keep things light. But the whole time, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. And guess what? I was right. I spot him at the entrance to the break room, just standing there, staring right at me. I freeze and I swear the room got colder in that moment. I point him out to my coworker and when he turns around, the guy's vanished. I glance at my coworker. I couldn't read his expression, I asked him. Did you see that? He looks at me. The confusion is obvious in his eyes. See what? Clearly, he saw nothing. I realized that he missed the entire encounter. It was only me who saw him. I run my fingers through my hair, feeling a mixture of paranoia and frustration. Never mind, I mutter, dismissing the topic. Maybe I'm just letting my imagination get the best of me. It was late and I had not slept properly in days. My coworker's not as intrigued as I am. He's focused on the task at hand, more interested in getting his work done than delving into whatever nonsense I was talking about. We head back to our posts and I'm still rattled. I can't shake the image of that guy's grin. Hours pass and I try my best to concentrate on my tasks, but the unease is a constant presence in the back of my mind. I keep glancing around, half expecting him to reappear. That creepy grin plastered on his face. And then, out of nowhere, he's back. My heart skips a beat and my hands tremble. It's like a nightmare come true. He's standing there, that same grin on his face. My breath catches in my throat. Before I can even react, he's sprinting towards me, his steps quick and purposeful. Panic surges through me and I freeze. What does he want? My mind races, but my body is paralyzed. He grabs me and easily picks me up. He starts shaking me and shouting in my face. And then, as if from a distance, I hear a shout. My coworker's voice cuts through the fear. Hey, get off her. He's running towards us, his footsteps echoing in the aisle. The guy releases his grip on me, his attention shifting to my coworker. And in that split second, I find my voice. I scream as loud as I can and start beating on him. My coworker arrives, his presence enough to make the guy hesitate. He turns and bolts, disappearing down the aisle. I'm left shaking, my heart pounding. My coworker rushes to my side. He looks seriously concerned. Are you okay? He asks me. I nod. I'm completely out of breath from the screaming. We're both shaken, both trying to make sense of the madness that just unfolded. We call the police and as we wait for them to arrive, I can't help but replay the encounter in my mind. What was that guy's deal? Why would he attack me? The police arrive and we recount the bizarre events. They search the area, but the guy is long gone. I tell him what happened and try to describe just how creepy and weird he was, and I mention that he said he'd done something naughty that night. Suddenly there's like four more cop cars pulling up, and they're taking this real seriously. My manager sent me home for the night and told me I didn't have to come in tomorrow. I checked the news the next day and saw that there had been a hit and run nearby with a suspected drunk driver killing a family of three. The description of the suspect was almost exactly the same as the guy who attacked me. What the hell was this guy's problem? As far as I know, they never found him. I check the news occasionally just to see if he comes up, but I've not seen anything since. A few years ago, when I was just a teenager, I had a rather peculiar and unsettling experience in a supermarket that still baffles me to this day. It was a typical Friday evening, and I found myself at our local grocery store tasked with picking up some items for the weekend. At the time, 
I was around 16 years old. I was a typical cheeky teenager. This supermarket was a place I had visited countless times, but this visit would be unlike any other. As I strolled through the aisles, I noticed a child's voice coming from somewhere nearby. It sounded faint, as if it were coming from behind the shelves. This was nothing extraordinary for a grocery store, a kid amusing themselves or playing hide and seek, I used to do that myself. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to play along. With a grin on my face, I knelt down next to the cans and responded to the tiny voice. Hey, what are you doing back there, trying to sound playful? To my amazement, the voice responded, I'm stuck. Please help me. At first, I found it amusing, thinking it was another shopper's child having a little fun. I chuckled and continued the conversation, exchanging lighthearted banter with the mysterious voice. It was almost like a game of pretend, and I played along, asking them how they got behind the shelves and what they were doing there. But then, the tone of the voice changed, growing more desperate. I'm really stuck. It's so dark, and I can't breathe properly. My amusement began to fade, as genuine concern started to take its place. I realized that this might not be a joke, and I needed to act quickly. I called over a store employee and explained the situation, telling them that there was a child trapped behind the canned goods. The employee rushed to get help, visibly concerned. I tried to reassure the child that help was on the way, but the response I received sent chills down my spine. Hurry, please. It's getting harder to breathe. Panicking, I shout the employee over and I quickly move the cans aside, expecting to find a child in distress. But to my absolute bewilderment, there was nothing behind the shelves, no space, no child, just a solid wall. The employee caught up to me and we both exchanged uneasy glances. I was utterly dumbfounded, and the store employee seemed quite annoyed at the mess I'd made. I awkwardly tried searching around the shelves, but the whole thing was up against an obvious wall. To this day, I remain haunted by how real the whole thing felt, that child's voice seemingly trapped behind a wall and slowly suffocating. It was a surreal and unsettling experience, the only time I've ever experienced something so convincingly real. Arriving at prison, I remember the process clearly. We got off the bus and were herded into a reception area called Block 16. Whilst there, they made us strip down, a bunch of us standing but naked, while the officers did their checks. It was no-nonsense stuff. After that, you approach the desk for fingerprinting and processing. It was there, you'd make a crucial decision. Some guys, like this one I saw, they come up to the desk, look the officer dead in the eye, and say something like, I don't think I'll make it in general population. At that point, the officer would ring a bell, and they'd be moved somewhere else, away from the regular crowd. But if you stayed quiet, like most did, you'd be led to a cell with a cage attached. In that cage, you'd sit for hours, sometimes the whole day, as they sorted you out. I remember the bell ringing often, people freaking out and rushing to the desk to ring the bell, only to end up in a smaller, darker cell out of earshot from the rest of us. It was scorching that day, probably over a hundred degrees outside, and you're just cramped inside that cell. Lunchtime came, and we got sandwiches. I'll admit, the food was better than the county's cheap stuff. I recall one meal particularly, chicken enchiladas with green sauce. It tasted real, like something that might actually fatten you up. There were some wild characters in there, no doubt about it. They knew there was a white guy among us, they'd seen him on the bus. This guy named Reggie, he didn't have any weapon. We'd just come on transport, but he was busy sharpening a pencil like a man on a mission. He took his sweet time, and when he was good and ready, he jammed that pencil right into the neck of another guy. It was the first day in reception and he just went at it, puncturing holes in the other guy's neck, and that guy went down fast. I was there, watching it all, thinking this trip was going to be one heck of a ride. In those cramped cages, 
We munch on our sandwiches, the stifling heat suffocating us. It had to be a scorching 110 degrees, at least. Finally, they come to move you from that holding cell to your assigned one. That's when it got real. You'd be alone in that cell for 10 long days. No contact with anyone. Reception was like a test. They needed to figure out who you were and where you belonged. Everyone always asks about the first day in prison and this was the reality. The real deal, right there in reception. You'd roll in, be herded into that cramped cell with a bunch of strangers until they processed you, and then you'd be placed in your solitary cell, waiting for your fate to be decided. During my two weeks in that cell, I noticed some graffiti on the wall. Someone had drawn SpongeBob SquarePants and scribbled the lines of the theme song. It made you think about the kind of people you were about to join. Two weeks of isolation were the norm. I had to be patient until they figured out my custody level, who I was, and where I was headed. Meanwhile, I thought about the simple things, like how that sandwich I had in reception was a rare taste of normalcy. Block 17 is within walking distance of reception and this block was a constant source of trouble. I end up with this standalone skinhead as my cellmate. He claims to be a skinhead but isn't officially affiliated, he just labels himself. And let me tell you, we had our fair share of issues. This guy used to be a massive dude, easily tipping the scales at 260 pounds, but he lost a ton of weight, way too fast, leaving him with all this saggy extra skin. Initially, he seemed alright, but then he ended up in debt with the wrong people and started acting out. Him being in debt was bad for me, because the trouble would come to my cell, and I didn't want that. Every time food came around, I'd wolf down as much as I wanted, even if it was his. That's where the real problems began. He got all worked up because of some peanut butter. I wanted that peanut butter all to myself, and I made it clear to him, saying, Hey, buddy, none of this is for you. It's mine. Get lost. Well, he didn't take too kindly to that. From there our tensions boiled over, and I can't even remember how it escalated, but we started throwing punches. Then, this overweight fellow managed to get me in some sort of guillotine chokehold, shoving my neck down while applying pressure to the back of my head. I was furious. I yelled, I'm going to murder you when you release me, fatty. My neighbor, Scooby, heard the commotion through the vent. He hollered over, asking if everything was alright. I replied, telling him, Mike's got his fat titties choking me out. The moment he frees me, I'm going to lay a beating on his fat ass. Mike finally started easing up on my neck, cautioning me not to do anything stupid. I snapped back, nah, the second he lets go, I'm unleashing hell on this bitch. Eventually, he released me, and, as expected, I swung at him, landing a few solid hits. He sat there afterward, sporting a bloody nose and a swollen lip, asking if everything was settled. I told him he was a punk, and yes, it was settled. Then there's this other incident. I'm just minding my own business when one of the higher-ranking skinheads strolls up. He's repping SKS or something, which is a white clique of skinheads. He eyeballs me and says, You've got a Jewish tat? I shot back, Yeah, I've got the king of Jews tatted on me. What's up you punk, got a problem? Right then and there, he punked out in front of everyone. He let me straight up call him a punk, basically folded like a cheap suit. I glanced around, thinking, this dude's toast. In prison, especially as a white guy, you cannot let anyone call you a punk. Whether it's a fellow white guy or anyone else joking around, you've got to fire back at them. There's no other option. If you don't, well, like I mentioned earlier, you're getting messed up. That's just how it rolls in the penitentiary. In the end, it was all about manipulation. Some people would manipulate the system to their advantage, even if it meant getting in trouble or putting their lives at risk. It was a dangerous game, and you couldn't trust anyone fully. The wildest part of this whole scene was my neighbor, two cells down. They start rounding up all the white guys, and it's strip search time. Now, this guy, he's got a 7-inch blade hanging out of his ass. 
As they strip us down, he's got it tucked halfway in a plastic bag, the handle barely sticking out. It's a monstrous knife, the kind you'd never believe could fit where it does. You might be thinking, that's some sickening stuff, who shows a 7-inch knife up their ass. But this is the stark reality of prison. You're dealing with people who don't think like you. This dude is ready to do whatever it takes, even if it means using that knife, whether it's on a fellow inmate or a damn cop. So, yeah, he did what he had to do. All of this was within a few weeks of being there. Sounds sick? Yeah, well then don't end up in prison. Punk. When you first get arrested, you go into a processing sequence of cells called the horseshoe, and basically, this is for new arrestees. You're in these cells for days, and you don't know what day it is. All you can feel is the heat rising and falling, and you're crammed in, like sardines with 40 or 50 people. Fights are breaking out, there's blood on the walls, and guards are rushing in, grabbing people, especially those acting up on drugs. If you really act up, the guards grab you and put you in a restraint chair. It looks like a medieval torture device. They tilt it back, strap you in, and put a hood on your head. There are people out there in chairs just howling and whining. It sounds like something out of a horror film. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Then, you get to see the judge, and I got sent over to medium security in the beginning. Which is completely gang and drug infested. So as soon as I get there, some skinhead dudes are eyeing me up. They're like, we want a word with you in that cell back there. You can't say no, because in prison, you don't have much of a choice. They're sizing you up, and you look like their type of recruit. Not because I wanted to, but because I'm white, and in prison, you get affiliated with one of the racial gangs whether you like it or not. It's like that for all races, whites, blacks, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans. I didn't know this yet, but I had to do what they said, so I went into the cell. They ask, what are your charges? And I've got the printout, but it's all in legal speak, so I don't understand it. So I tell them, I've got my charges, but I don't know what they mean. And they freak out, and start pushing me against the wall, shouting. What do you mean you don't know what it means? Are you a chomo? I don't know what a chomo is either so I'm digging my grave here. They've got me up against the wall about to smash me, and I'm making it worse because I don't know how to behave in prison. I tell them to look at my sheet and they take it and look, and they see I've got drug charges. They see my bail is nearly a million dollars, and they love that. They ask me who I killed to get a bail that high. They relaxed and started to joke with me, suddenly they accepted me and let me go. I learned later that Chomo meant you were a child predator. One of the guys who came in with me actually did have those charges. So the next day they ask me about him and I tell them I know nothing. Later I hear someone being beat in the shower area and it's the skinhead gang that questioned me and they leave this guy in there just whimpering in a pool of blood. This big guy says to them as they're leaving, how come we can still hear him? And the head of the skinhead says, we smashed him good. And the big guy says, not good enough. So he goes in and it's like he's trying to crack this guy's head open like a coconut. You can just hear the stomping echoing. Crack. Crunch. The guy looks dead and a guard doing a security walk eventually finds him. He was carried on a stretcher. He had blood and yellow stuff coming out of his head, like brain fluid or something. It was every day after that, just violence. I had to get used to the sound of heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies being thrown around, people getting carried out on stretchers. They'd wait until the guards did the security walk so that they'd have the most amount of time possible to torture these child predators. One guy, after they were done with him, came out covered in blood. He managed to get down the stairs and knock on the window to the guards, and they opened the door and he just collapsed. There was an old man who wouldn't stop rambling, so the gangs thought they'd shut him up. I walked past him and there was blood splurting out the back of his head. 
so he was dealt with as far as they were concerned. All of this within a week of being in prison. You had to toughen up fast or you were done for. I've never been to prison, but I did spend a few days in a county jail. It was a community holding area, which meant we all slept together in one room with rows of bunk beds. I'm the quiet, invisible type, so I managed to get by pretty well. I sort of befriended a few guys by teaching them chess, playing blindfolded matches, and sharing my food. I didn't eat much during the week I was there. Around day three, a new guy joined our group. He was a short, muscular guy in his twenties, and he had a Napoleon complex written all over him. I did my best to keep my distance, considering I'm a scrawny white guy who didn't know how to defend himself. I had some bad allergies at the time and couldn't stop sneezing. After every single sneeze, even during a series of them, Napoleon would say, bless you, and I'd respond with a polite, thank you. It became a repetitive back and forth of, a chew, bless you, thank you. But then, one time, I started sneezing and didn't manage to say thank you after each blessing. That's when things went haywire. Napoleon exploded with anger, charging at me from across the room, yelling obscenities and raising his fists. My friends from earlier, the ones I taught chess and shared meals with, sprang into action. They rushed over and tackled him before he could reach me. There was a brawl, fists flying, until the guards finally intervened and broke up the fight. Napoleon was promptly sent to isolation. He's lucky that I didn't press charges. High school was typically uneventful until the day Alex showed up. He was a quiet, strange guy, always seen alone in the hallways. At first, there was nothing remarkable about him, but after a few weeks, things began to change. One day, I noticed he was doodling in his notebook during class. It started innocently enough, just random scribbles. But over time, his drawings became disturbing. I started to notice oddly dark tones to his doodles. Twisted faces, distorted creatures, and strange symbols filled the pages. There was one lesson with Alex that changed everything. Tyrone was a typical bully and problem child. He would torment almost everyone equally. Today, Alex was his victim. He grabbed Alex's notebook and started looking through his drawings and loudly mocking him. I don't know what came over me, but I half-jokingly shouted Tyrone's name and said leave him alone. I awkwardly laughed as to not become Tyrone's next target. Suddenly, someone at the front of the class tripped over a box, and Tyrone's attention was completely pulled away from us. You should have seen the look on Alex's face. I don't think I've ever seen him smile until now. He was sat there with his notebook in hand, staring at me with the creepiest grin. He thanked me and muttered something to himself about not having to kill anyone today. It reminded me of Gollum from Lord of the Rings. After that day he was practically my shadow. He'd follow me everywhere. Always standing a few steps away from me. He didn't ever have much to say but he would occasionally make comments about people like Tyrone and we'd all laugh at how dark his humor was. Over time he started sharing his drawings with me. They were all pretty messed up. He even had some detailed drawings of Tyrone being tortured or stabbed. On the odd occasion when he did speak, the things he would say were unsettling, muttering about hidden threats and the consequences that were coming. Looking back, it was so obvious what he was going to do, but I kind of convinced myself he just had a dark humor and used his drawings to vent. There were a few notable moments with him over the next few months. He would aggressively defend me in the hallway whenever someone would barge into me. He'd push people out of my way and do these really weird death stares at anyone that would bother me. He was very attached to me and protective. It seemed like as the days went on, he just became more and more angry at the world, muttering more about what he wanted to do to people, 
telling me that I'm one of the good ones and that he'll never let them hurt me. Towards the end of winter, Alex had a week off school and I started to wonder if he was alright. I'd also noticed at this point that his locker started to smell really bad. I knew his code because I'd seen him put it in so many times and he didn't seem to care that I would watch. I guess curiosity got the better of me and I entered his code and opened his locker door. I can't describe just how powerful the smell was, it didn't just knock me back, it sent me into a coughing fit. It was obvious now why it stinks so much. I probably don't need to tell you what I found. A collection of small animals, I remember a cat, a rabbit and some mice. I immediately closed the door again and started to panic. I knew I couldn't just ignore this. I immediately told my teacher about what I'd seen, knowing I might get into trouble for accessing someone else's locker. They ended up closing the whole corridor and getting the police involved. They found multiple hunting knives and all of his disturbing drawings. We never did find out about what happened to him other than the fact that he was kicked out of school and some more security measures were put in place to prevent weapons being brought into school. I don't know what he was planning or if it was just animals he liked killing, but I feel like if I didn't check his locker, he might have come back and done something seriously bad. I remember the first day when we had this substitute teacher, Mr. Roberts. He had a reputation that spread like wildfire among the students. Everyone said he was weird and would creep everyone out. That day, I was about to find out for myself. Mr. Roberts walked into our classroom and right from the start, something felt off. He had this unnerving way of looking at each one of us as if he was sizing us up. His eyes were piercing like he was trying to see into our souls. As the lesson began, he spoke in a monotone voice that made it hard to stay awake. He covered a subject that should have been interesting but somehow managed to make it utterly boring. I glanced around the room and my classmates had expressions of utter boredom or mild discomfort. What really creeped me out though were his mannerisms. He rarely smiled and when he did, it was more of a grimace than anything resembling happiness. His movements were jerky and erratic like he couldn't control his own body. Towards the end of the lesson, some of my classmates decided to test the waters. They asked him personal questions, trying to get to know him better. But his responses were strange. He'd laugh at random moments and make bizarre comments that left us scratching our heads. Then came the incident that really got my guard up. One of my classmates, Alex, asked about his past teaching experiences. Mr. Roberts hesitated for a moment, his eyes darting around the room. Then, in a low, almost whispered voice, he said, I've taught in many places, but they were all temporary. It was as if he was hinting at something darker, something he didn't want us to know. The room fell silent, and everyone felt the awkwardness. We had him twice in the same day, and the afternoon lesson was even more weird than the one in the morning. Mr. Roberts' behavior only grew more unsettling. He would suddenly stop talking mid-sentence and stare blankly at the back of the classroom, clearly lost in his thoughts. Then, without warning, he'd snap back to reality and continue as if nothing had happened. When the final bell rang, the whole class breathed a collective sigh of relief. We couldn't get out of that classroom fast enough. As I walked out, I couldn't shake the feeling that Mr. Roberts was hiding something, something that made him more than just a creepy substitute. And I hoped I wouldn't have to see him again anytime soon. Our history teacher disappeared halfway through the year and Mr. Roberts took over our class. We'd see him twice a week. Whenever I was in his classes, I would do my best to just focus on my studies. The rest of the school year passed without any serious incidents, just the regular blank staring and growing rumors about how weird he was. Towards the end of the year, after we'd all kind of gotten used to his demeanor, Mr. Roberts crossed a line that couldn't be ignored. During a history lesson, he made a bizarre and inappropriate comment about one of the female students. It was so disturbing that the student immediately reported it to the school authorities. The school administration acted swiftly, launching an investigation into Mr. Roberts' past. 
It didn't take long for them to uncover a disturbing criminal history. He had been involved in a series of troubling incidents at his previous schools, including allegations of inappropriate behavior and comments. The revelation sent shockwaves through our school, and parents demanded answers. How had the school hired someone with such a dark past? The school board faced intense scrutiny, and many called for a complete overhaul of the hiring process. Mr. Roberts was immediately suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. As more details emerged about his past, it became clear that he should never have been allowed near children. The school took responsibility for its failure to properly vet him and promised to implement stricter hiring practices in the future. While Mr. Roberts was never seen at the school again, the unsettling feeling that had hung over our classroom didn't dissipate easily. The incident served as a chilling reminder of how important it was to remain vigilant and speak up when something didn't seem right. It's weird because people who had his lessons actually improved their grades. He wasn't a bad teacher, just a bad person. After he disappeared there were multiple rumors about him working at another school a few miles away. I always wonder what happened with him. I was a junior in high school when it all started. Mr. Simmons, our English teacher, had always been a bit eccentric, but this year, something changed. He became fixated on me, and it became incredibly uncomfortable. At first, it was harmless. He would compliment my essays or ask me to stay after school to discuss my studies. I didn't think much of it, assuming he was just trying to be a helpful teacher. But soon, it escalated. He started showing up at places he shouldn't have known about, my part-time job at the local bookstore or my favorite coffee shop. Every time, he'd strike up a conversation, making it clear he'd been tracking my activities. It was unnerving, but I hesitated to say anything, fearing it might be a misunderstanding. Then came the gifts, flowers left on my doorstep, anonymous notes in my locker, and even a mixtape of romantic songs. It became impossible to deny that something was terribly wrong. The final straw was when he cornered me after school, professing his love and suggesting we go away together. I knew I couldn't handle this on my own. I confided in my closest friends, who immediately took action. They encouraged me to report Mr. Simmons to the principal. We compiled evidence, texts, notes, and witness accounts of his strange behavior. When we confronted the principal, she was shocked but supportive. She assured us she would investigate the matter thoroughly. What we didn't expect was the revelation that Mr. Simmons had a history of similar obsessions with students at his previous schools. The investigation unveiled a disturbing pattern of predatory behavior. Parents were outraged, and the local news caught wind of the scandal. Eventually, the police got involved, and Mr. Simmons was arrested. Most people were furious about the fact that he already been caught doing this in the past. Why was he allowed to teach again? Did the school know about his past or did they not even check? You'd think we'd have better systems to protect children from predators like this. I'm here at Burning Man and I regret every choice that led me here. The heavy rain that swept through the area has turned the place into a muddy nightmare. Thousands of us are now trapped in the middle of nowhere and it feels like literally nobody is trying to help. We've just been told to stay in place, like we have a choice. It's becoming increasingly challenging to stay sane. The entire place is caked in mud, making movement almost impossible. Our campsite is now a soggy patch of dirt. The portable toilets, which were never a delight to begin with, are pretty much impossible to use, and people have started using random mud holes as bathrooms. I can't help cringing at the conditions we're enduring. What's even more unsettling than the weather and the lack of sanitary facilities is the behavior of a lot of the men here. This place has always had a problem with boundaries. Implied consent is what comes to mind. Like the kind of implied consent when you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and you're scared of what might happen if you say no. Unwanted touching, groping, and outright assault seem to be on the rise. 
It's incredibly disheartening to see how some individuals here struggle to respect personal boundaries. I've lost track of the amount of times I've said I don't like to be touched, but it often falls on deaf ears. Just last night, I was cornered by some weirdo. The other two guys were distracting my male friend who'd been protecting me all night. They were laughing and joking with him and grabbing his attention whilst their friend was pushing me up against the wall and touching me up. Literally two meters away from my man. These same people will call themselves allies but the second they get the chance to take advantage of a vulnerable woman they'll do it. I shouted my friend over the loud music and he finally saw what was going on but it didn't stop the guy from repeatedly pulling my wrist trying to drag me away. I hate it here and the most recent news is that there's more rain coming. I don't get how we're supposed to survive this. The conditions are terrible. Some people are partying as if nothing is happening and others are having complete meltdowns and acting like it's the apocalypse. The guy who'd been trying to pull me away last night has followed us back and knows where I'm staying now and I'm terrified he's going to suddenly show up in the middle of the night. It's crazy how fast this place went from civilized peaceful party vibes to seriously hostile. This happened last night around midnight. The first night after the storm. The neon glow and pulsating lights that once lit up the desert have all vanished into the darkness. The wind, charged with moisture from the recent downpour, painfully whistles through the place and feels like a cold slap when it hits you. Most folks have retreated to their camps, seeking refuge from the relentless rain and the now pitch black desert. You can hear the soft patter of raindrops hitting tents and the faint rustle of tarps flapping in the wind. The power's out, and you can't even charge your flashlight. It's like a scene straight out of a post-apocalyptic movie. The only source of light is the occasional flicker of LED-lit costumes passing by, or someone trying to find their way through the mud with their phone flashlight. Someone with a speakerphone kept repeating that we should stay put and secure our stuff, especially anything electrical. The storm had messed up everything, the lights, the music, you name it. Most people just waited in their tents or RVs hoping that the mud would dry or that supplies would make their way to us. Out in the dark, Someone stumbled past my tent, muttering something about getting the lights back on. They disappeared toward where the generators were. It's safe to assume that almost everyone you come across here is under the influence of something, so I assumed he was just talking to himself. I heard his wet footsteps feeding into the distance, but then I could definitely hear him trying to start the generator. Suddenly there was a scream that echoed through the area. People nearby were shouting and trying to figure out what had happened. The screams were periodic, like he was in a lot of pain and begging for help. We could just hear him screaming repeatedly. Some people came out with flashlights, but even if they could find him, it took minutes to travel just a couple of meters through the thick sludge. It was deep and impossible to walk through without serious effort. Your foot would sink immediately, making it exhausting to get through. Eventually people got to him and I heard a lot of commotion. Apparently he managed to turn the generator on, but was stood in a puddle of water. It doesn't take a genius to know that electricity plus water is a bad combination. We don't even know if he's alive. Multiple people got caught in the electrified water trying to save him. Last I heard is that he was in one of the medical tents, but we've been hearing rumors all day that he died and someone else had a heart attack. I came to Burning Man with a group of friends. They're not the smartest bunch, but they're adventurous and always up for a laugh. After the rain stopped, people were panicking, trying to make a break for it before things got worse. Dozens of people started trying to drive out or walk back to the road. But I don't need to tell you that they didn't get very far. The mud and water ensured nobody got more than a few hundred meters. My friends thought they had a better idea. Instead of joining the frantic crowd heading towards the road, they thought it was smarter to go in the opposite direction, believing it was drier that way. 
I tried to convince them to follow the official advice. We had an emergency message come through. Do not drive your vehicle. Do not ride your bike. Do not push your bike around. Remain where you are. Secure structures and belongings in your camp. Don't operate generators or other electrically powered instruments that are standing in water. Cover or secure anything electrical. Check on your campmates and neighbors to make sure they're okay and help them as needed. Take advantage of a moment of calm to connect with campmates and hunker down. Stay safe out there, Black Rock City. They didn't want to listen to me about it being a bad idea and thought I was just being soft. But I've been around this kind of mud before. I know how exhausting it is to try to get through it and how dangerous it can be to become dehydrated without shelter in the middle of the desert. They left without me, their map told them it was a three-hour walk to the road in the opposite direction. They didn't believe me when I told them that it'd be dark by the time they could even see the road because the mud would easily cut their walking speed in half. I watched them the whole time, slowly trekking through the mud. After about four hours it started to go dark and I could no longer see them. They barely made it halfway to the road and now I could guarantee they couldn't see it. I tried calling them but none of them had any signal. It was cold and they were soaked in mud and likely freezing out there. There's another storm on the way, they're nowhere near the road and I can't get in contact with anyone who can even help. I called the cops and told them about the situation but they said there's nothing they can do until morning anyway, they've already got their hands full. This whole situation is insane. I'm terrified that my friends are out there freezing to death. There's no way they suddenly managed to travel the remainder of the distance in the pitch black. I thought at one point that I saw an orange light in their direction, like a campfire or something, but the visibility here is really bad. I guess it'll be on the news in the next few days if they didn't make it. I can't sleep though. I have a guilty feeling of relief that I didn't go with them, but I also feel terrible for not trying harder to convince them. When I left home to attend university in the UK, I knew I was in for a big change. I moved quite far away from family and friends, leaving behind the familiar comforts of home. Always a social person, this new environment was a challenge for me. My student studio apartment felt empty, and my course had fewer sociable students than I'd expected. Desperate to make friends, I turned to Tinder and Instagram, hoping to connect with like-minded people. However, luck wasn't on my side. Conversations often fizzled out, and it felt like a struggle to find genuine connections. Then, out of nowhere, a ray of hope emerged. A cute girl, Emily, added me on Instagram. I'd linked my Instagram handle in my Tinder bio, and she must have seen it there. She was stunning, and I couldn't believe my luck. We started chatting, and it seemed like we hit it off. She mentioned wanting to meet up, and without much thought, I gave her my address. The excitement of potentially making a new friend overshadowed any reservations I might have had. However, as we continued chatting, something didn't quite add up. Emily's Instagram photos didn't seem to be taken anywhere near the city I was in. Moreover, she was far too attractive to be interested in a guy like me. I noticed that her comments and followers were predominantly men, Doubt crept in, and I began to suspect that I'd given my details to a random catfish account. My anxiety peaked, and I decided to block her immediately. It was the only sensible thing to do. I hoped I dodged a potential scam. But then, things took an even more unsettling turn. Another strikingly attractive girl, Sarah, began messaging me. The conversation started precisely where I'd left off with Emily, as if it had never stopped. Alarm bells rang in my head, and I knew I'd messed up. They had my personal details, including my address. With a heavy heart, I asked Sarah to leave me alone and blocked her as well. But it didn't stop there. Soon after, yet another attractive girl sent me a friend request. By this point, I was fed up. I stopped replying thinking it best to protect myself. I double-checked that my studio apartment door was locked and went to bed, 
hoping for a peaceful night's sleep. However, my rest was short-lived. In the dead of night, I heard someone trying to force their way into my room, shouting my name. Panic surged through me, but I couldn't move. Sleep paralysis gripped me, rendering me helpless. I'd experienced sleep paralysis almost every night since being at my new studio. It always happened while I was someplace new, but I never saw or heard anything. The door eventually creaked open, and a strange man entered my room. He rifled through my belongings as I lay there, unable to stop him. My heart raced, and my mind raced even faster, trying to comprehend the whole thing. After what felt like an eternity, the intruder left, shutting the door behind him. My sleep paralysis gradually released its grip, and I awoke in a cold sweat, scanning my room for signs of the intrusion. Everything appeared normal, and I couldn't be sure if anyone had actually broken in. I reported the incident to university security, but they found no evidence of a break-in. I genuinely didn't know if I'd imagined the whole thing. The next chilling discovery was that both the accounts, Emily's and Sarah's, had disappeared entirely. It felt so real, there was absolutely a man in my room going through my stuff. I saw it with my own eyes. I've had sleep paralysis many times and I was always able to accurately recount what was going on around me, so why would I be wrong this time? I removed my Instagram from my Tinder bio and made sure to barricade my door every night. My social life was pretty much dead for the rest of the year and I didn't sleep well at all. I used to be an avid Twitter user. It used to be my go-to app for wasting time, scrolling through tweets, and catching up on the latest memes. Over time, I had grown somewhat immune to the occasional creepy direct message. I had learned to ignore them, to just brush them off as part of the experience. One evening, I received a notification about a new follower. It was a name I didn't recognize, and the profile picture was a little blurry, but nothing immediately sent alarm bells ringing. I followed the account back as I usually would and immediately received a message. I decided to open it, even though I was sure it was spam. Inside the DM was a link to another Twitter profile, Secret Tweets. My curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on the link. The profile was filled with a series of photos, each featuring different people seemingly caught off guard. Some were on public transportation, others on park benches, and a few even seemed to be in the privacy of their own homes. What made it weird was that none of these people appeared to be aware they were being photographed. As I continued scrolling through the account, expecting to find crude or inappropriate comments, I was met with an odd sight. The comments on the posts were not what I expected. The comments were all just numbers getting gradually higher and higher, stuff like 700, 750, 800, 1000. This was the same under every single post. People writing slightly larger numbers in reply to the last person. The oddest part of all was that every single account that commented appeared to be spam accounts. No profile pictures, no followers, they were just anonymous accounts with no profile set up. I decided to report the account and sent the link to my friend Becky. Still, I didn't give it too much thought and I continued with my day, attending classes and getting lost in assignments. It wasn't until later, after school, that Becky finally replied to my message. Her response was a mix of shock and concern, urging me to report it to the police right away. Her reaction bewildered me, and I questioned why she was so alarmed. Her reply was chilling, why are you not worried about someone posting pictures of you on their Twitter? I quickly returned to the profile, my heart racing. Amongst the unsettling images, I found photos of myself, pictures taken without my knowledge while I walked home from college. I remembered seeing a parked car that day, but I didn't think much of it at the time. My heart sank as I realized that the profile had images of me, just like the others, taken without my consent. The same trend was happening under the pictures of me. Faceless accounts writing numbers, 1300, 1400, 1800. I kept refreshing, watching the number replies come through and that's when it all clicked. 2000, with a dollar sign next to it. My heart dropped and I refreshed again. 
The tweet was deleted and replaced with just the number 2000. They were bidding. They were offering payment, but for what? Fear gripped me as I comprehended the gravity of the situation. I reported the account to Twitter and contacted the police, providing every detail I could recall. With trembling hands, I locked myself in my room, talking to Becky over the phone, all while being home alone. Hours crawled by, and when I eventually refreshed the Twitter page, I was met with an unsettling message. This page does not exist. My heart pounded in my chest. Becky confirmed the same result. To this day, I don't know if Twitter removed it or if the person behind the account deactivated it. The cryptic numbers in the comments remain a mystery. But one thing's for sure, it felt like a twisted setup, and I'm grateful not to know any more about what was happening with that Twitter page. A year ago, I used to post my entire life to Snapchat. It was my go-to app for sharing bits of my life with friends and family. But then something happened that made me reconsider my online presence. One day, out of the blue, I received a friend request from an unfamiliar username. I didn't think much of it at the time and accepted the request without a second thought. It was just another random person, or so I assumed. Months passed, and I forgot about that peculiar friend request. My life went on, and I continued sharing snippets of my daily activities on Snapchat. Little did I know that someone was watching, very closely. It started innocently enough, with an unexpected snap. I opened it, thinking it was probably a friend sharing a funny meme or a cute pet photo. But as the image loaded, my heart skipped a beat. It was an eerie, edited version of an old Snapchat story I had posted months ago. Floating love hearts surrounded the image, and the caption read, Can't wait to see you. The chill running down my spine was hard to ignore. How did someone get access to my old stories? Who was behind this? Days turned into weeks, and more edited snaps kept arriving. Each one featured pictures taken from my past stories. The captions became increasingly unsettling, referring to my personal life. How was your McDonald's on Friday? And another said, I love that movie you watched last night. The sense of being watched was inescapable. I felt exposed and vulnerable, as though a stranger had invaded my privacy. It wasn't long before I decided to check Snap Maps, the feature that lets you see the real-time locations of your friends. My heart raced as I zoomed in on the map. There it was, a bit too close for comfort, the location of this creep. He was nearby, and the thought sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was no ordinary prank or trolling. It felt personal, like someone was playing mind games with me. Fear gripped me as I realized the mysterious friend was getting closer to my location. I knew I had to act fast. I began taking screenshots of the disturbing snaps for evidence. Then, I contacted the local authorities and reported the unsettling situation. The investigation that followed uncovered the identity of the creep. To my shock, it turned out to be someone I met at a party months ago, I'd been warned about how creepy and weird he was. He would just invite himself to parties and nobody wanted to be rude and kick him out, so we just tolerated him. To be fair, I had no issue with him and spoke with him a little bit throughout the night, but didn't see much of him. I guess being nice to the social outcast when everyone else kept him at arm's length was enough for him to become obsessed with me. They didn't end up charging him with anything, but they told him to leave me alone and explain to me that I could get a restraining order, but it seemed pointless. I've been with my wife Rebecca for six years and married for 11 months. Our entire history together has been very normal and never once have I noticed any weird behaviors or red flags. I can't stress enough how out of character this whole thing has been. She doesn't even like watching horror movies. When we first started dating she agreed to watch The Shining with me because she knew how much I loved horror. She was so scared that she didn't even make it through half of the movie before we had to turn it off. She isn't into anything creepy and has never been into pranks and that's fine. 
But that's what was so strange about this. It's just so unlike her. I should also add that she never had any mental health issues and as far as I'm aware it doesn't run in her family. I know some people are able to hide their mental health problems, but in the six years we've been together I think I have seen some sort of sign. Two months ago, I was in the kitchen making myself some coffee. I was running a bit late that morning and knew I wouldn't be able to grab some food on the way to work. I took a sip of my coffee as I hurried down the hall towards the front door when I happened to notice Rebecca peeking at me from around the corner ahead of me. I could only see her eyes and a strand of her long dark hair hanging against the wall. The rest of her body was concealed behind the corner. I nearly spilled my coffee when I saw her. What the hell, Rebecca? I said wiping a few drops of coffee from my pants. You scared the hell out of me. She immediately popped out of view like a little kid that had been caught. I heard her scurry off towards the living room, and by the time I got to the front door she was out of sight. It was really weird, and just totally out of character for her like I said. But I also found it kind of funny that she was being more playful and a little less serious. I shouted that I loved her, and called her crazy. As I shut the door behind me I heard her laughing. Her behavior was a bit odd but it certainly wasn't something to call a priest over. I forgot about it by lunch and by the time I got home she was her usual self. I didn't bring it up, and life went on. The next incident happened three days later. It was around 2 a.m. and I had woken up to get a drink. I was standing at the kitchen island, glass of orange juice in my hand, when I felt a strong feeling that I was being watched. For whatever reason I looked down at the floor and saw my wife's smiling face staring back. She was peeking at me from the other side of the island, staring up at me with wide unblinking eyes, and grinning. Grinning like the Cheshire Cat. I screamed, I'll admit it. Not out of irritation, but fear. For some reason at that moment I was scared. At the sound of my scream she scurried backwards out of my view, her hands and feet smacking the tile floor as she hurried out of the kitchen on all fours. I didn't run after her, or even shout. I just stood there frozen in shock, wondering what the hell had possessed her to do that. It took me a little longer than I'd like to admit to go back upstairs, but I eventually did. When I got to our bedroom, Rebecca was lying on her side asleep. Or at least pretending to. I stood there for a while, watching her breathing, to be sure she really was asleep. I had the feeling she might jump out at me the moment I got into bed. I climbed in, and she didn't even move. Her breathing was soft and I was starting to wonder if I dreamt the whole thing. The next morning I waited for her to come down for coffee and after handing her a mug and kissing her cheek I decided to ask her about it. What was that about last night? I was keeping my tone light so I didn't offend or embarrass her. She frowned over her cup of coffee, shaking her head like she had no clue what I was referring to. You were peeking at me again. From over there. I said, pointing to the spot on the floor by the kitchen island. She followed my gaze, and when she looked back at me she burst out laughing. She laughed so hard that I couldn't help joining in. You creep me out sometimes, you know that? She laughed at what I had said and wrapped her arms around my neck. You creep me out all the time, so I guess we're even. We said our goodbyes and left for work. As I drove I kept thinking about how creepy it had been seeing her grinning at me from behind the island like that. The sounds her hands made on the floor as she crawled away. I told myself she was just trying to be silly. Just trying to join me in my love of all things horror. It's not like I was afraid of her. But it still didn't sit right. I started seeing her peeking at me more and more. Sometimes she'd be peeking out from behind the couch or living room curtains. Once she even managed to get inside her grandmother's old trunk that sits at the foot of her bed. I might not have even known she was there if the trunk's old hinges had not given her away. She had the lid propped up just enough so that only half of her face peeked out. She'd been grinning like an excited toddler. It was unnerving. I didn't even know what to say to her. All I could do was stare. When I finally found my voice, I asked her why on earth was she doing this. 
She didn't answer, but she had slowly closed the lid, shutting herself inside the trunk. I just walked away, feeling disturbed. I didn't understand why she was doing it, but it clearly made her happy. I just hoped she would tire of the game quickly. Rebecca didn't peek at me for the next two weeks. I started to think she was done with her weird prank and I was relieved. We were watching a show on Netflix one night and I jokingly said that I hadn't seen her peeking at me lately and that she must have given up on her game. She looked up at me with a small smile and said, maybe I've just gotten better at it. I didn't say anything but I wondered whether or not she was joking. For the next few days I couldn't stop thinking about what she'd said. Was she still peeking at me while I wasn't looking and I just hadn't noticed? And if so, what the hell was she getting out of this? I started to feel paranoid, constantly checking whether she was watching from around the corner or behind a door. I was jumpy whenever I was home and she wasn't in full view of me. I felt stupid and a little crazy. But after a few weeks without another incident, I began to relax. I stopped checking behind furniture and walls and told myself it was just a bad memory. Then a few days ago things got so much worse. Rebecca left to go to a friend's and I lounged on the couch and played a couple games on my laptop. Around 9 p.m. I hopped in the shower and as I was washing the soap from my hair, I felt that awful feeling that I was being watched. I slowly opened my eyes and almost had a heart attack. Rebecca was peeking from behind the shower curtain, her entire head stretched into the shower, leaving just her body outside. Her long dark hair hung against the curtain, the ends dripping with water. Her mouth hung open in a terrible grin, eyes wide open and red, as if she hadn't blinked in a while. I screamed and jumped back against the wall. She didn't move, nor did her smile waver. Her makeup ran down her cheeks in two black streaks. She looked giddy and completely deranged. I was terrified. We stood like that for a few moments, neither of us saying a word. Finally, after what felt like forever, she slowly pulled her head back out of the shower and I watched her blurry figure through the curtain as she moved backwards towards the bathroom door. A second later the bathroom door slammed shut, hard enough to rattle the mirror. I screamed again and jumped out of the shower to lock the door. I stayed inside the bathroom for over an hour. Maybe I overreacted, but joke or not, I wasn't going to put up with the craziness anymore. That's what I kept telling myself as I paced in my bathroom, stopping to listen at the door every few minutes. Suddenly I heard a muffled sound, and I pressed my ear against the bathroom door, straining to listen. I couldn't hear anything, but I envisioned Rebecca standing on the other side of the door, giggling at her joke. I felt a surge of anger. I was beyond annoyed at being made to feel scared in my own house, and having to hide in the bathroom for an hour. All for what? If it was a joke, it was an awful one. What the hell, Rebecca? I snapped. This is getting really annoying. I waited for her to apologize or to call me a jerk. But instead, I heard a faint moan. So quiet, I wondered if I heard it at all. And then complete silence. Rebecca? I called out, not able to even hide the shakiness in my voice. I got no response. Just my own heavy breathing. I swear to God, just stop it. I yelled at her pounding my fist on the door. I waited for her to cuss me out, something I would expect from me talking to her like that. I never screamed at her before. But there was nothing. Just the occasional drip from the shower head. I won't deny that I was scared. Too afraid to open the damn door and face my own wife. I waited another 30 minutes or so, which feels like a lifetime when you're scared. Finally, I decided I wasn't going to spend the night hiding in my bathroom, so I got down on my knees and peered under the door. I almost expected to see her face peeking back at me, but thankfully she was gone. I could see straight down the hallway to the top of the stairs, but no Rebecca. I didn't know if I should be happy about that or not. I looked for a few minutes, waiting to see her head pop up over the top step, but it never came. I stood up my hand hovering over the door and prepared myself to open it. 
I slowly turned the lock with shaky fingers and was about to yank it open when I heard a sound that still makes me feel nauseous when I think about it. A moan. Louder than before. But this time I was able to tell just where it was coming from. I turned my head to the closet door as if in slow motion and locked eyes with my wife who was peeking out at me from the slight gap. Her eyes were still wide as ever and her mouth was hanging open in the most grotesque gaping smile. I didn't even scream. I was too scared for even that. Her hands were clasped to her chest, body trembling with sheer delight as if she could barely contain her excitement. A short raspy moan bubbled up from her throat, deep and raw, sending a shiver through my entire body. Somehow I found the ability to pull the bathroom door open and ran as fast as I could all the way down the steps, snagging my keys and phone from the table in the living room before running outside to my car. I could hear her shrill laughter behind me but I didn't hear her getting closer. I didn't bother shutting the front door. I drove away from the house faster than I legally should have, shivering the entire time either from fear or the cold. Maybe a little of both. I hadn't grabbed a coat or even a pair of shoes. I was still in my boxers and my hair was still damp. I drove straight to my brother Chris's house about 40 minutes away, ignoring any and every call and text I got. I didn't check my phone until I was safely parked in my brother's driveway. Rebecca had called four times and sent a flurry of texts, all wondering where I'd gone and why I left like that. I threw my phone at the dash. I was furious at her nonchalant attitude. My brother and his wife were surprised to see me show up. Especially dressed in just a pair of boxers, but told me to stay as long as I needed. Chris lent me some clothes and asked me what happened. I told him we had a fight, but didn't get into the details. I didn't want him to think I was overreacting, leaving my wife over a prank even if it was a strange one. I mean, hadn't I encouraged her for years to lighten up instead of being so serious all the time? I had wanted her to relax and loosen up, but this was definitely not what I had in mind. I tried to sleep on their sofa, but my brain wouldn't let me sleep. Every time I closed my eyes I saw Rebecca's face staring at me from inside the closet. Knowing she'd been in there with me the entire time made my skin crawl. She'd never left the bathroom at all. Instead she slipped inside the closet and slammed the bathroom door shut to fool me. The mere thought of going back home gave me anxiety. I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. Chris ended up giving me a sleeping pill so I was able to get a little rest. My sleep was filled with terrible dreams. All of which were Rebecca's smiling face. I woke up just as the sun started to rise. My whole body ached and I felt drained. I knew I'd have to call her at some point, but I didn't know what to say to her. I wouldn't be going home unless she gave me her word she'd never do any more creepy stuff. I just wanted my wife back. Her normal serious self never looked so good to me. I was contemplating calling her and telling her when that familiar feeling came back. I was being watched. I was staring at the ceiling, my heart in my throat. I didn't want to look away but the longer I ignored the feeling the worse it got. My eyes drifted away from the ceiling almost on their own. Her face was pressed up against the window beside the couch, staring down at me with that same gaping smile. Drool dribbled down her lips, leaving two long streaks down the glass. I didn't know how long she'd been there, but something told me she'd been there quite a while, possibly all night. I didn't bother screaming though I was afraid anger trumped any fear I felt at that moment. I jumped up from the couch and pounded my palm against the glass. Rebecca, are you crazy? What the hell is wrong with you? Just go home. Now. She didn't move and her ghastly expression never changed. If anything her smile only grew as if she had never been more elated. I could hear Chris and his wife moving around upstairs. As if Rebecca could hear them from her place outside, her head twitched slightly in their direction and she began to close her mouth slowly. Chris called my name from upstairs, obviously concerned. I turned around to see him running down the stairs. When I turned back to the window, Rebecca had disappeared. 
The only sign she'd been there at all was the two streaks of drool still dripping down the glass. I tried explaining to Chris and Jess about waking up to see Rebecca watching me through their window. They were skeptical. We went outside to the spot in front of the window, but there were no footprints in the dirt, just a slight indent. Animal probably, Chris guessed, and I didn't argue. He and Jess assumed I dreamt the entire episode, but they didn't understand, and I was too tired to explain it to them. I called out of work that day and turned my phone off. I didn't want to face Rebecca. Just talking to her was too much for me at that point. I really started to believe something was irreversibly wrong with her. That no matter what promises she made we'd never be the same again. The thought saddened me to my core. I cried most of the morning. By noon I figured I was ready to confront her. Give her one last chance to explain herself. I could at least give her that after six years I told myself. I turned my phone on and saw the dozens of texts she'd sent, all from a seemingly concerned wife. Can we talk? I love you. Please call me. I'm really worried. Can you answer? Just come home. And more of the same. All texts telling me she loved me, and she wanted me home. How worried she was. Not a damn one addressing the crazy crap she pulled. Like she hadn't been acting like a character from a Stephen King book. Even her texts were different. She normally texted novels just to tell me to pick up a loaf of bread. You'd think she'd have more to say to me after her bizarre shenanigans. I know it probably seems childish to some of you who are miles away from this situation. But if you saw the way Rebecca had looked at me, how she scampered away on all fours like some wild animal, grinning at me from inside the closet like a lunatic, then I think you'd find my reaction was warranted. I ended up staying with them for another night. I didn't wake up yesterday until afternoon, and thankfully I didn't see Rebecca's face watching me through the window. I don't want to pry, because it's not my place. But is this fight something that can be mended? Jess was asking me about the situation. She made us both a sandwich for lunch and I knew she wanted to breach the subject without seeming to be nosy. I don't know, she's like a different person. I chose my words carefully. I still wasn't ready for her or my brother to know the full extent of the craziness I had been dealing with. People change, but she's still the same woman you married. Maybe you both just need to talk through your issues. Whatever's going on, I'm sure it can be fixed. I think it's beyond that now. I don't think talking would help. I just don't trust her. The words stung in my heart. I missed and loved my wife. But how could I live with someone like that? Living in constant fear didn't sound too appealing. Rebecca loves you. She has to be absolutely crushed. I don't know about that. Well, she certainly seemed like it. I've never seen her so upset. It took a full minute for me to realize what she'd just said. And when I did, I felt dread rush over my body. Wait, what do you mean? You saw her? You saw Rebecca? I asked with my mouth suddenly feeling very dry. Jess nodded casually as if that fact was a nightmare fuel. Maybe for her it wasn't, but for me it was. She stopped by this morning just after Chris left for work. I didn't see her car though. Maybe she took an Uber or something. What did she say? Did, did she come inside? Sweat started to break out on my forehead. I began looking around, examining corners as though a predator lurked behind them. No, she just asked if you were awake yet and I said that you weren't. I asked if she wanted me to wake you but she said no. Just said to let you sleep. That's all, she didn't say anything else? No, she looked awful though. Like she hadn't slept in days. I think you should call her. I got from the table and thanked Jess for lunch. I felt a little bit better at the knowledge that at least she hadn't come inside. Still, I needed to double check that the doors were locked. I sat for a while trying to figure out what to do next. I didn't want to go home, but I felt that I owed it to Rebecca to help her if I could. Hadn't I swore an oath to love and honor her through sickness and in health?
clearly she was very sick. If she was sick, which I truly believed she was, I had to try and get her the help she needed. But I didn't even know where to start. I didn't want to call the police, and besides, what the hell was I going to tell them? That my wife was peeking at me? That she was being creepy? As bizarre as she'd been, she still hadn't committed any crime. Not yet anyway. The police would have probably said that I was overreacting. But this wasn't some prank. It felt wrong. Dangerous. Like something sinister lurked beneath her smile. I knew as her husband I was well within my rights to have her committed, but what if she simply acted normal in their presence? She'd obviously been able to fool Jess into thinking she was just a concerned wife. As long as the doctors didn't find her a danger to herself or others, they'd have no choice but to release her after 72 hours. I felt lost and overwhelmed. So I did what any husband in my position would do. I called her mother. I didn't want to, believe me. We were never on the best of terms. We never fought or anything like that. She just wasn't a very warm person and wasn't very easy to get along with. She hardly ever smiled and when she did, only her lips would move into a thin-lipped smile, leaving her eyes as blank as before. She gave off this aura that felt like she was permanently on the offensive. I'd only met her twice and both times were very short. I got the impression she didn't approve of me for her daughter. Rebecca always ushered us out quickly as she didn't want me to feel uncomfortable which I was grateful for. Being in her mother's company felt almost unbearable like walking on glass. I was glad when we moved three states away so we didn't have to see her often. I was happy to avoid the woman, but I needed her help. I really didn't want to talk to her, but I had to talk to someone. She was the only person who might know Rebecca better than me. I took a deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes, she answered, already sounding irritated. Marianne, it's me, Ben. Do you have a minute to talk? I could hear her cluck her tongue in irritation. I'm in the middle of writing some checks, but if you insist, I suppose I can spare a moment. What is it that you want to discuss? It's about Rebecca. She's been acting strange. And I was wondering if you had any idea whether there was something she interrupted me abruptly. It's a bit difficult to follow your rambling Benjamin. What is that you want from me? I could almost see her standing there in her thin sweater and slacks, tapping her fingernails impatiently on the table. I wanted to know if you ever noticed any odd behavior? Or possibly any mental health issues? There was a long, uncomfortable pause, maybe because she was just thinking, or something else. Finally, after a few seconds, she spoke. I'm not sure if this is one of your jokes, Benjamin, but if so, I don't find it very funny. Now I do have business to attend to as I said, so if you don't mind, I cut her off before she could get rid of me. Marianne, it's not a joke. I'm sincerely concerned about Rebecca's mental health. Her behavior has been very erratic lately. I'm very worried about her and I figured as her mother you would be as well. The frustration was evident in my voice. If you're truly concerned then I suggest you get the health professionals involved. I don't know what you expect of me. She snapped. I could tell she was seconds away from hanging up and for some reason I was desperate not to let her. I had the feeling that she knew a lot more than she was letting on. Please. If not for me, do it for Rebecca. I heard a faint shaky intake of breath as if she were trying to hold her steely persona together but failing. Marianne? Benjamin, I don't know what to tell you. My only advice would be to seek professional help. Do not call here again. I tried to call out to her, but she hung up. I tried to wrap my head around the call and her refusal to help me. Even if she didn't like me, why wouldn't she want to help her own daughter? I couldn't understand that. I tried to replay the conversation, desperate to find something I missed. I almost gave up until I remembered her last words to me. Seek professional help, she'd said those words with a bit of urgency. 
I could have just been grasping at straws, but no, I was sure her voice had changed ever so slightly when she'd said that. As if those words were very important. What had she meant? I assumed she'd been referring to medical professionals, but maybe she was referring to someone else. Someone that for some reason, she didn't feel comfortable saying directly. Or maybe I was just desperate. I waited for Chris to get home and after a very long and exhausting conversation, I convinced them that Rebecca truly needed psychiatric help. I didn't tell them everything. I wasn't prepared to go into it yet, but I told them about our last encounter. How she hidden in the bathroom, peeking at me from the closet. They were obviously shocked, but thankfully they believed me. They too just wanted to help her. Still they didn't think it was all that serious. Weird, maybe but not dangerous. They just kept saying that Rebecca had to be playing some kind of weird joke. Maybe for YouTube? Jess offered, if only half-heartedly. Chris didn't think we should involve the police just yet. He offered instead to go with me, and I readily accepted. He reasoned that calmly talking to her, trying to coax her into going willingly was the best recourse. I agreed to do it his way. At least I wouldn't be going into that house alone. We drove over this morning, just after breakfast. There was no way I was going at night. When we pulled into the driveway my stomach began doing somersaults. Her car wasn't there, but I still didn't let my guard down. The front door was ajar, and for a split second I thought we'd see her eyes staring through the gap. I was shaking and starting to sweat. Chris, however, was fine. He waited for me to open the door, his hands in his pockets like he was going on a stroll through the park. I envied his ignorance. I pushed the door open and was immediately hit with the stench of rot. Chris smelled it too, and he walked in the house behind me with his nose scrunched up. My eyes were looking around for any signs of Rebecca. The house was deadly quiet and dark, despite being late in the morning. All the curtains were closed up tight, refusing to allow any sunlight inside. If I hadn't left just two days ago, I'd have thought the house to be abandoned. We moved through each room, carefully checking any place that she might hide, occasionally calling her name. Why the hell are you looking under the couch? Aren't we looking for your wife? He was looking at me like I was a moron. Let's just go upstairs. He shook his head but followed me up the stairs to check the bathroom and spare bedroom. On the way up, my shoes crunched over pieces of glass that looked to be littered over a few of the steps. I noticed that one of our wedding portraits that hung on the wall along the staircase had been smashed. The frame hung crookedly, all the glass was removed. I stared at the picture, a lump forming in my throat. We had taken the photo just after leaving the church. She looked so beautiful in her white gown. I looked at her beautiful face. I never dreamed her face would ever be a source of terror for me. We climbed the rest of the steps and checked the spare bedroom, but it looked completely untouched. I was hesitant to go into the bathroom, my fear from that night coming back to me all at once. Chris noticed and offered to go in by himself, but I couldn't let him do that. So we walked in together, checking the closet and the shower. The bathroom looked as if it hadn't been touched since the night I left. I don't think she's here. Why don't you pack some clothes and we'll try coming back tomorrow or something. I nodded and went into our bedroom and shut some clothes into a duffel bag. When I checked inside our closet I found the source of the smell. I immediately started gagging. Chris took one look and lost all color in his face. He had to go stand by the stairs to get away from the sight and smell. I gazed down in shock at what lay inside my bedroom closet. Soaking into the rug were at least a dozen eyeballs, all carefully laid out in pairs. Some were as large as a coin, while others were as tiny as a marble. I stared down at the eyes she collected from small animals and I wondered how she'd gotten them. I shuddered at the thought. Man, I thought I had it bad with my wife's shoe addiction. Yours is in here collecting eyeballs. Chris said while gagging. Ben, I think we should go. He called from the hall. I'm getting nauseous. I grabbed my duffel and shut the closet door. 
I stepped out into the hall and took a deep breath of air. I could taste the rotten smell on my tongue and I couldn't help but gag. Who the hell lines up eyeballs in their closet like that? I tried to tell you she needed help. She doesn't need help, Ben. She needs an exorcist. You coming or what? I can't stand the smell anymore. His words died in his throat and his eyes grew wide with fear. I didn't ask him why. I could feel it. Someone was watching me and I didn't think it was the eyes in the closet. I turned around, my eyes slowly scanning the bedroom. Christ, I whispered as I finally saw what we'd missed. Under the bed, curled on her side, watching us with the excitement of a kid on Christmas morning, was my wife. She held her hands together just under her chin and they were shaking eagerly. Now that she knew she'd been found, I could hear the quiet noises she was making. A sort of hiccuping sound in her throat, as if the excitement was just too much for her. It was unnerving to say the least. Wide eyes, and that same huge smile. Everything in me told me to run, but I forced it away. This was my wife. No matter how twisted, she was still the woman I married. I had to help her. Rebecca, I said softly. She didn't respond, but her head bobbed back and forth in two quick little movements as if she were nodding. Baby, I just want to help, okay? Can you? Can you let me do that? I had taken a single step forward, approaching her like some kind of dangerous animal. I love you, Rebecca, I said softly, taking another step closer. She let a tiny moan escape her wide open mouth and I had to resist the urge to run. Her shoulders were starting to quiver and her eyes grew as large as saucers. I crouched down so I could see her better and immediately saw the blood. Her hands were covered in it. They trembled more the closer I got as if she was barely able to contain herself. Rebecca, are you hurt? You're bleeding. She bobbed her head again her bloody fingers moving up and down as if playing an invisible piano. They occasionally grazed her chin, leaving smears of blood on her skin. I wanted to recoil in disgust. The smell that was coming off of her was revolting. I could feel the vomit trying to climb up my throat. Her lips were dry and stretched thin, blood seeping between the cracks. I knew she wouldn't come on her own, but I didn't want to leave her in the state she was in. I scooted closer and reached out to her. The excited hiccuping sounds got louder and her hands shook, fingers flexing. It was then that I could see the blood oozing from in between her fingers. Oh my god, you're bleeding. Instinctively I reached out to take her hand, but before I could even touch her, her hand sprang out towards me. A sharp pain shot through my arm and I fell back on my ass. My arm burned and I could see the blood dripping down onto the carpet. I looked back at her in shock and saw her grinning madly, her fingers clutching a large shard of glass. You all right in there? Chris asked from behind me. I turned my head slightly and nodded to him, cradling my arm to my chest. When I turned back to face Rebecca, I saw that her focus had shifted. She wasn't looking at me anymore. And she wasn't smiling anymore either. She was staring past me her eyes glaring at Chris the way a hungry lion might stare at an antelope. Her mouth was still hanging open, but it was twisted into a snarl. I got to my feet and began walking backwards down the hall, afraid to take my eyes off her. Are you bleeding? The moment the words left his mouth, Rebecca started fast scooting out from under the bed, the glass shard still in her fist. Chris, run, go! He must have been too afraid to move because a second later I felt my back bump into him. He was still standing at the top of the stairs, staring at the horror that was my wife. Rebecca had crawled completely out from under the bed and stood in the bedroom doorway, her face twisted in rage. Her whole body was visibly tense. Blood ran down her fingers and onto the floor. Jesus, Rebecca. My brother tried talking to her, but I reached back and pushed him towards the steps. Move your ass, I said as quietly but firmly as I could. 
Rebecca bobbed her head in sharp motions and began to grin, stretching her mouth open wider and wider so that her chin seemed to touch her chest. I heard Chris mutter a prayer and then he was running down the stairs. I stood at the top of the steps, stuck between self-preservation and the love for a woman who clearly needed serious help. I only want to help. I said whilst holding back tears. Her eyes focused on me once again as she slowly lifted the glass, holding it out in front of her. And then she started sprinting towards me, grinning with utter excitement. Thankfully my body took over and I flew down the stairs skipping two or three steps until the bottom. I made it to the front door before I felt her leap onto my back, wrapping her arms around my neck, her open mouth next to my ears so that I could hear those terrible hiccuping sounds. I shook her off me, knocking her to the floor. I felt a searing pain in my back as she fell but I tore open the front door and bolted to my car. Chris was standing in the front yard, talking on the phone with the police. I didn't say a word, I just ran to my car and jumped in. Chris took the hint and followed me, still on the line with the cops. I watched the rearview mirror, sure I'd see her there, running after us. But I never did. I went straight to the emergency room and got 11 stitches in my arm and 3 on my back. The police asked a lot of questions and went back to the house to do a search but of course, she wasn't there. They advised me to stay with a friend or relative for a while and to file a restraining order as soon as I could but none of those things would matter. I dropped Chris off at home and went to a motel an hour away. I wanted to put as much distance between me and Rebecca as I could. This is where I've been for the last four hours. I thought maybe the police would find her, maybe they'd get her the help she desperately needs. But now I don't think so. Because 40 minutes ago I got a text from an unknown number. Just three words. I found you. And a picture attached. The picture was dark and grainy, but I instantly knew what it was. There was no mistaking my wife's eye. I started typing this out immediately after. I don't know what to do. I'm alone and scared, and I can't help but feel that I'm being watched. About a year ago, I embarked on a long road trip to New Mexico with a friend. We mostly camped along the way, and our first night of camping happened in the Jefferson National Forest at a campsite in West Virginia. We found some pamphlets for campsites at a gas station and decided to head to a place called White Rocks Campground. It was quite a journey, a 25 plus mile drive up a dirt road into the mountains. We were truly in the middle of nowhere. As we made our way in, we didn't spot any other cars except for one truck that followed us for about 15 minutes before turning down a different road. Along the route, we passed a massive coal factory with a sign that read, 62 days since an on-site incident. The only people we encountered on our drive were a group standing on the side of the dirt road huddled around a plastic bin that was on fire. It was all quite unusual, but our excitement about camping and the road trip had us laughing off the weirdness rather than worrying, despite having no cell phone reception and being deep in the mountains. Upon arriving at the campground, we found it completely deserted. Not a single car or person in sight, and this campground had about 30 sites. We drove around, hoping to spot someone, but when it became clear we were alone, we randomly picked a site and decided to stay. We got out of the car and stood there, listening. The silence was unnerving. I've always loved being in the woods and have never felt scared or intimidated, but this time was different. There were no bird sounds, just thick, eerie silence. It was like something out of a Blair Witch movie. The daylight was fading fast and we decided to start a fire and set up our tent to get comfortable. My friend was in charge of setting up the tent while I worked on the fire. As we went about our tasks, we'd occasionally stop and listen. My friend even commented that if anyone were to approach us, at least the crunchy leaves everywhere would make them easy to hear. You can probably see where this is going. I thought we were just getting spooked by our imaginations, but it genuinely felt like someone was watching us. It was the first time in my life I ever experienced that feeling. I had goosebumps and I wanted to leave, but I kept my composure for my friend, who as it turned out, 
was also internally freaking out but trying to keep it together. Once we got the fire going, the tent was set up and our sleeping bags were ready, the sun had completely set. Sitting around the fire together, the darkness seemed to encroach upon us, making us feel suffocated. My friend tried to alleviate the tension by pulling out a book to read aloud and make us feel more at ease. While she was reading, I used my headlamp to occasionally scan the area around us. Since we arrived at the campsite, I had this nagging feeling that someone was out there in the woods. It was pitch black, and our fire acted like a beacon. My friend and I decided, screw it, let's go to bed. We thought we'd go to sleep quickly and pack up in the morning to get the heck out of there. We extinguished the fire, and I decided to grab the one knife we had, which was still in the car, keeping it beside me in the tent. After settling into our sleeping bags, my friend pulled out her cell phone to see if she had any cell reception. But, as expected, there was no signal. She tried dialing her boyfriend just in case, and I remember saying out loud, we have no reception out here, it won't work. We lay in silence, watching her phone trying to dial out, but it eventually disconnected. Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, suddenly, about 20 feet off to the left of our tent, we heard footsteps. These were quiet, gradual steps, they sounded like someone had been standing behind the tree near our tent and started walking toward us. Those crunchy leaves certainly did their job. We froze, staring at each other with wide eyes. The footsteps continued, coming closer to the tent, then veering behind it for a couple of yards before stopping. The silence that followed was chilling. These were heavy, booted footsteps, with the distinct rhythm of a person walking, not an animal. My friend grabbed the knife that was next to my back, and with her headlamp on, unzipped the tent and stepped out. She stood in front of the tent with her knife drawn, scanning the area with her light. She was nothing short of a warrior. We both listened for more footsteps or voices during what felt like an eternity of silence. I could see the light from my friend's headlamp darting around the trees, but there was nothing there. She leaned back into the tent and whispered, We're getting the hell out of here. We packed up everything within maybe ten minutes, moving quickly, and then we bolted from the campsite. Looking back on it, it's amazing how we didn't lose our heads. We stayed calm while packing, even though we were internally screaming with terror. We only had our headlamps on, and the whole time we were packing up, I couldn't shake the feeling that the hill people were watching us and waiting to grab us and pull us into the darkness. We felt entirely helpless. But it didn't seem real, like we were just psyching ourselves out. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched as we sped away. Then came the confirmation that someone or something had been tracking us. As we pulled out of the campsite, we spotted two dirty black trucks pulled off to the side of the road, concealed in the trees but still visible. They had definitely not been there when we arrived earlier. The nearest residential homes were about 15 miles away. We didn't see anyone around the trucks, but we didn't stop to look. We reached a motel and stayed there for the night. We share our story with the motel owner, who was incredibly kind and comforting. He even gave us some cash for another motel if we needed it. I made a promise to that man that I would give him a stellar review. I'll remember every detail of that night for the rest of my life. The unsettling feeling of being watched, the sudden footsteps so close to our tent, and the ominous black trucks by the road. If you're enjoying the video, please leave a like. In the 90s, before everyone had cell phones, my Girl Scout troop was camping in a state park when a terrible storm came through the area with major flood warnings. The rangers at the park frantically came through every campsite and evacuated everyone to higher ground. Everyone, that is, except my group and the Boy Scouts in the site next to us. We went to bed with light rain, but woke in the middle of the night to our tents collapsing from the water quickly rising. The Boy Scouts, they were 12 to 16 years old, we were between 7 and 9, helped us quickly pack our site into our cars. Unfortunately, the roads were too dangerous to drive because we couldn't see how deep the water was. And we didn't know if any sections of the road had washed out. 
We abandoned all the vehicles and used the map that the scout leaders had to find some place that wouldn't be flooded. A few miles away there were treehouse cabins that were built around a tree and lofted 15 feet in the air. It was decided that we needed to move quickly, and that was our best shot. The older boys and the adults carried the smallest girls when it became clear that the wind was preventing them from staying on their feet. The wind and rain soaked everyone through to the skin. We made it to the cabins, and the adults broke in and raided the emergency supplies there for space blankets. There was no way to build a fire because there was no firewood. It had been especially dry this year, and starting campfires was forbidden due to risk of starting a forest fire. I remember shivering for hours, all of us girls in the middle of a huddle on the floor with the boys on the outside trying their best to keep us warm. One of the boys asked us if we knew any Girl Scout songs. We sang every song we knew, and the leaders taught us a few more that they had learned. At some point we convinced the boys to sing in rounds with us. The storm lasted through the night. Some girls started crying and I remember one had a panic attack. The sound of the storm battering away at the cabin would send creaks all along throughout the space. The fact that we were essentially in a treehouse made the whole thing even more scary. I was convinced that we were going to be blown over and either fly away or all be crushed when we hit the ground. It was impossible to even see what was happening outside, you could just hear the sound of the water, the rustling of the trees, and the creaking of the cabin. If we didn't die from the cold, we'd definitely die in the rushing water. The storm continued battering the cabin long throughout the night. Eventually, once we were a bit more dry, a bunch of us managed to fall asleep. I'd been lying there for what felt like hours, struggling to doze off, due to the loud banging. I'd constantly jump up while I was half asleep, and couldn't quite get there. In the early hours of the morning, I was lying down staring at the ceiling when I started to finally not be able to keep my eyes open anymore. I closed them, and felt myself slipping away. A branch flew through one of the windows in the cabin, throwing glass everywhere and waking up everyone. The room was full of screams and the camp leaders were frantically trying to calm us down whilst figuring out what had happened. The place was still really dark and a few kids had been cut with the glass. The older boys and the camp leaders helped patch everyone up and dealt with the glass situation. If there was any night to earn some medals, it was definitely this one. We all really came together and I felt safe with those people, even though the situation was so dangerous. Morning came, the rain slowed down to a light drizzle, and a ranger showed up assessing damage to the park. He discovered us, and immediately drove to get help. They returned with a bunch of trucks and all-terrain vehicles, and drove us to a location where doctors were on site to evaluate us. It was sheer luck that none of us had anything worse than the chills and a few cuts from the glass. It could have gone worse than it did, and we were unbelievably lucky to have survived at all. We could have easily died in our sleep if the flood had come through all at once instead of slowly rising. If the Boy Scouts hadn't been there, then us small girls could not have made the hike to safety. If we had tried to drive, we would have been washed away. My wife, my dog, and myself were on our second day of an 80 kilometers hike in northern Ontario, Killarney Provincial Park. We set up camp on a point about 750 meters into a lake. One way onto the point and one way off the point. We were hearing wolves since about 9 p.m. We went to bed by about 10 and the howls were getting closer and closer. Then, one owl from right behind us on the trail down to the point. I got out of the tent and started making lots of noise trying to scare it off. This usually works for bears whom we have had lots of encounters with. I didn't see anything there and didn't hear anything either. I went back to bed and laid down, trying to act confident as to not upset my wife. Then when we both heard something outside of the tent, my dog was crazy quiet but shaking. I opened the tent to find a wolf staring at me from about 15 feet away. I grabbed the bear spray and took aim. I didn't use it, but I again started screaming at the wolf and took a few charges towards it. Again, this usually works when faced with a black bear if you have no escape. 
the wolf didn't really care that I was there yelling at it. It kind of hung out for a few seconds then kind of very casually walked into the tree line just far enough that I couldn't see it anymore. I built a fire between the tent and the bush, sat up all night, and kept my headlamp on all night. Had to listen to three or four wolves howl to each other the whole time, about every twenty minutes. They were very close. One, I would estimate to be within fifty yards. I was sure they were going to come and grab my dog. At about six a.m., a bunch of them started howling all together, way more than during the night, but it sounded like eight to ten wolves. We waited until about 8 a.m., then packed up and got the hell out of there. We were 36 kilometers deep. Took us two days to hike in, but we hiked out in 6.5 hours. About 1.5 hours into our hike out, the wolves started howling behind us again. They were following us out. On the way back, we saw a bear with two cubs. This would usually concern us a bit, but we were just like, get the hell out of my way. My wife lost all her toenails from the hike. And my poor dog got some serious anxiety about being in the tent. My name is Danny, and I was 19 when this happened. I lived with my parents and wanted to move out, so I bought a car with the money I'd saved and eventually got a job for Uber Eats. I'd seen their advertisements all over, apparently it was easy money with flexible hours, all you had to do was pay for fuel. I had a few friends tell me how good it was, so I figured I'd go through the sign-up process and give it a shot. However, the reality was quite different. Driving around on a tight schedule made the job pretty stressful, and the payouts were often just a few bucks. If you didn't claim the orders with high tips or payouts, then you'd barely make enough to cover the fuel. Being a teenager, I only had to cover my car payments and insurance, so I didn't need to make a fortune but it did feel like I was getting shortchanged given the time and effort required. I pushed the idea of finding another job to the back of my mind because I was a bit lazy, but everything changed after a particular incident. I accepted an order from KFC and set off to deliver it to the customer's location. It was a pretty large order, enough for maybe four or five people, but the pay for this delivery was much higher than usual and the tip was $20, which was unheard of. It tells you on the app when you accept an order, how much you'll get paid. While en route to the destination, I received a text through the Uber Eats app. The customer was asking about my whereabouts. The app said delivery time was about 30 minutes and I was on track to be there in about 15. They could literally see my live location on there, so I didn't understand why they were asking. I didn't see the point in pulling over to reply, so I just kept driving as I'd be there in about five minutes. Within pretty much a few seconds, they sent another message, impatiently asking me why it's taking so long. I had only picked up the order a couple of minutes ago, and they could literally see this on the app, so it wasn't as if I was running late. I ignored the weird messages, thinking it was probably a mistake on their part, or that they were drunk or just a typical Karen. I knew the area reasonably well, but I'd never really been to this part of town. It was located in I guess what you'd call the hood. It was a pretty rough neighborhood, gang violence and a lack of police presence, most people knew not to come here. But I'd driven through a few times and knew it wasn't too dangerous. The address was to an apartment building, and as I approached the place, I noticed that a lot of people were staring at me. I parked my car and checked my phone. Another message had come through with some harsh language, telling me that I better hurry up. I usually leave my phone on the stand, where I can see the delivery instructions, but I knew it was a bad idea to keep it out in the open, so I took it with me. The instructions said to come inside and deliver it to the customer's apartment, which was a little unusual, but I figured they just didn't want to come down. I pressed the button for the apartment number and was buzzed in. As I climbed the stairwell, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. There were people just scattered around this building, I had to step over some passed out woman on the stairs and I really wanted to just drop the bag and run. I reached the door to the apartment and a voice from inside told me to come in. I hesitated for a moment, confused as to why they couldn't just come and grab it. But I was on the clock and wanted to get this delivery done. I walked into the apartment and as the door closed behind me, I realized my mistake. 
All the lights were off and the only source of visibility in the room was the massive TV they had on the wall. I looked around and saw a couple of shady looking characters. I offered them the bag and they looked at me like I was disgusting. The guy who seemed to be the leader gestured for someone else to take it from me. He started circling me as I stood there, completely frozen. I had no idea what the hell I was doing or how I ended up in such a dangerous situation. He didn't hesitate to start poking at me, asking me what I got. I told him I just had the food and that I gotta go. He laughed and told me to sit. I was completely shitting myself at this point. He starts quizzing me about why I took so long and what can I do to make up for it. I told him I could refund the tip and this made him freak out. Tip. What tip? I ain't pay you no tip. I stupidly pulled out my phone to show him that he put down a $20 tip. He snatched it out of my hand and told me that he's taking the refund. Everyone else started laughing. I was being completely humiliated in front of these people and I was powerless. I passively asked for my phone back but I'm not the biggest guy in the world and I was really trying not to die so when he refused I just accepted my fate. He sat down and started looking through the bag, grabbing the food he wanted. He looked over at me and asked me what the F I was still doing there, jumping up and pulling out a knife as he said it. I apologized and quickly made my way to the door and ran down the stairs. I almost tripped over the unconscious woman on my way out. I got in the car and I've never driven so fast in my life. I drove to somewhere safe and immediately broke down into tears. My whole body was shaking and I was hyperventilating. I was a complete mess. What the hell was I thinking, walking up and going inside someone's apartment, never mind a place like that. I'd literally been told to never go inside anywhere, but all I could think of was that big tip. I drove home and told my parents what had happened. They were really supportive and glad that I was okay, but they were furious that I not followed their advice about going into dangerous places. We got the phone locked remotely, so he probably can't use it for much, but I know I'm never getting it back. I found out weeks later when I got a new phone that Uber also suspended my account because he said the order wasn't delivered. In their defense, as far as they could see, I just disappeared with the delivery and never showed up again. So he got a full refund and free food and my phone. Losing my phone and my job really sucked but I was grateful that I got away unharmed. I had no interest in working as a delivery driver after that and got a job at a restaurant instead. Earlier this year, I borrowed my dad's Tesla to go visit my aunt who lived in the countryside. I'm a 24-year-old guy and I love driving, especially my dad's car, so I was glad he let me take it. The road trip took me through some pretty remote areas, but it was a pretty smooth drive heading over. I passed through one small town that had a charging station for the car. Whilst I was there recharging the Tesla, I got quite a lot of attention. Apparently not many electric cars came through the area and they had lots of questions for me. I traveled the rest of the way with no issues and I stayed with my aunt for a few days and eventually decided to head back home on a sunny afternoon. I began my journey around 3 o'clock. The first part of the drive was through a busy town, and after that, I passed through some quiet suburban neighborhoods. But as I was taking the same route back, I soon found myself once again on the long narrow highway that seemed to stretch and turn endlessly. It was peaceful, but as the hours passed, I started to feel more tired. To keep myself awake, I turned on the radio quite loud, hoping it would wake me up a bit. I squinted at the road, trying to focus, and that's why I noticed a small glimmer of light in the distance. It was the reflection of my car's headlights on another vehicle parked by the side of the road. As I approached, it became evident that the car was abandoned. It was dark, and the windows were tinted. The area was quite remote, and the thought of getting stranded there was unsettling. The nearest town was an hour's drive back. I continued my journey but kept my eyes open, just in case someone was nearby. A few minutes later, I noticed a blindingly bright light in my rearview mirror. The intense glare made it impossible to see the car, only their dazzling lights. 
They seemed to be getting closer, so I reduced my speed, thinking they would soon overtake. But as I continued down the road, I saw something unsettling up ahead. There was another car right in the middle of the road, blocking my path completely. The car had its lights turned off, and I didn't see it until I was almost right upon it. I slammed on the brakes as soon as I realized what was happening. The lights in the rearview mirror kept getting brighter. I could hear the sound of an approaching vehicle behind me. I decided to turn my car around to escape the situation, but when I looked back, there was another car parked diagonally behind me, effectively sealing off any retreat. Suddenly, it all clicked in my mind. I heard the doors of the cars around me opening and closing. Panic coursed through my veins. Without thinking, I veered off the road, plowing into the trees, attempting to bypass the obstructions and get to the other side of the road, past the parked cars. I was so preoccupied with avoiding trees and avoiding getting my car stuck, that I didn't even look to see if the people were chasing me. About ten seconds after driving off the road, a gunshot echoed. I looked back and they were chasing me. The bullet hit somewhere in front of my car. Fear and adrenaline pulsed through me as I continued maneuvering around the twisted dirt road. Another shot rang out, hitting the back of my car. I was driving like a maniac, going full speed through these tight trees, desperately trying to lose them. My Tesla was impressively handling the practically off-road adventure that I pushed it through. Eventually, I could see that I lost them, but I didn't slow down until I hit the highway again. It took about 10 minutes of driving before I regained enough cell phone reception to call the police. The attackers didn't catch up, and as far as I know, they were never apprehended. To this day, I can't help but wonder about how they had such an elaborate setup. Had they spotted me coming in an expensive car and somehow thrown together a plan? Was it the guys I'd been speaking to when charging my car? I told them that I was going to be heading back through in a few days. It really bothers me not knowing, but as you can imagine, I'm not allowed to drive my dad's Tesla anymore. Making these videos takes a lot of time and effort, so your support is appreciated. My name is Christine and I was 23 years old when this unforgettable New Year's Eve story happened. I was out with my beloved dog, Max. It was a few hours before midnight, so I took him for a quick walk before getting ready for the party. Max was usually well behaved and fine without a lead, so I decided to let him off for just a minute to enjoy the crisp air as we strolled through our neighborhood. The evening was filled with anticipation. People around the town were preparing for the upcoming New Year's festivities. The streets were lined with colorful decorations, and you could feel the excitement in the air. As Max and I walked along the sidewalk, he was happily sniffing around, enjoying the scents of the night. The night was still young, and there was no sign of chaos yet. Little did I know that everything would change within the next minute. It was then that the first firework exploded in the sky, lighting up the darkness with brilliant colors and a deafening bang. I instinctively grabbed Max, pulling him close, but it was too late. The sudden noise startled him, and in an instant, he broke free from my grip and bolted down the street. I called out his name frantically, but he didn't respond. The barrage of fireworks drowned out my cries, and I watched in panic as he disappeared into the night. My heart raced as I realized I had to find him amidst the chaos of the celebrations. I spent hours driving around the neighborhood, searching for my dog. The fireworks kept lighting up the sky, and the noise was deafening. It was hard to focus with all the bright lights and explosions, but I had to find him. If I was distracted by the fireworks, then he was probably going through hell. Every corner I turned, every street I drove through, I called out his name. I was desperate to bring him back home, to keep him safe from the fireworks. The celebration was all around me, but all I wanted was to find my furry friend. I told my friends and family that I wouldn't be coming out as I was looking for my dog. A few of them volunteered to look for him too, but even if they found him, I wasn't convinced that he'd go with them. Finally, as I turned down a dimly lit street, I spotted a crowd of people surrounding a public bus, as if there were some sort of disturbance. My heart leaped with hope. 
I parked the car and rushed towards the crowd. I could tell by the chatter and the body language that they were reacting to some kind of animal on the bus. I made my way to the door and climbed on. He was there hiding in the corner, barking frantically at every firework whistling through the sky. I spoke to him gently, and he recognized my voice. The fireworks kept going off, but I didn't care. I reached down and picked him up, cradling him in my arms. He nestled against my chest, seeking comfort from the frightening night. I thanked everyone for trying to help him and rushed him back to my car. I got back in my car, holding Max securely. The drive home was a little quieter, the sound of fireworks slowly fading. Max had been found, and the new year could finally begin with both of us safe and sound. I sat in the car with Max, watching the fireworks through the window. The bright lights that had once scared him now seemed to twinkle in celebration of our reunion. It was a New Year's Eve we'd never forget, one that sent me on a wild late night drive, looking for my best friend. It all started on a sunny day in college. I had just finished my last class and was excited to get back to my dorm room. Once I arrived back in my dorm, I quickly got on my computer. I was anxious to see what new websites awaited me. A while back, my brother had sort of joined me up to a dark web mailing list where people would send me interesting sites they found. He was a complete computer genius. From software and coding to Photoshop and video making, he was a wizard with all of it. One day I received a message from an unknown user. It said, chat to real people from the past. I thought it could be fun, so I clicked on it. The web page loaded and there was nothing on the screen besides a chat box and a button to search for a new person to talk to. I clicked on the button to find a new person to chat with and it took some time, but eventually I connected with somebody. There was no text or anything. Then, all of a sudden, I received a message. It read, Dear friend, I am writing this internet mail to anyone who cares to read it. I am soon to be a father to twins. I hope this mail reaches you in good condition. We're off to see the new Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, at the theater to celebrate. New Star Wars. That movie was over 30 years old at this point. This had to be some kind of lame joke, I thought to myself. There was no way a guy in the 1980s was communicating with me. I decided to play along and thought it was all in good fun. Yeah, I wouldn't call that movie new. I watched them when I was a kid. He replied saying, What are you talking about? The opening night is tonight. You must be thinking of a different movie, unless you live abroad and it came out early there. No. I'm a college kid in America, I replied. I went on to list every Star Wars movie and TV show that exists since then. I think you have a very strong imagination, the guy replied. He wrote a long message telling me that they only have plans for a certain amount of movies and that he knows his stuff. He reminded me of my dad. He was a major Star Wars fan. I was fully indulged with the time travel role play and told him that I knew a massive spoiler for The Empire Strikes Back. I was respectful enough to ask him if he wanted to hear it and he confidently replied, challenging me to spoil it for him. If you've seen the movie, you know which one I'm talking about. He laughed and told me that's impossible, and mentioned that he was heading off to the theater. He stopped replying at this point, so I assumed that the fun little role play was over. It was quite wholesome and the guy really played the part well, speaking like someone who'd only just figured out what email was and with a polite tone throughout. I went about my day, probably studied a bit less than I should have, and had a small chat with my brother. I told him about the guy from the 80s and he laughed and told me he'll have to check that website out. He was much more nerdy and he was really into all that stuff. He was a bit on the antisocial side so the dark web was his happy place. Hours later, I heard a ding. I'd left the website open without noticing. The 80s guy had actually replied. He was going crazy, asking me how I knew about the big spoiler and speculating that I must have had early access or worked on the film. We had a further back and forth about how I lived in 2023 and I really played into the part about being in the future, 
teasing him about the technology we have here. Part of me enjoyed the role play, even though that usually wasn't my thing. He asked for my name, but I was smart enough not to give someone on the dark web any details about myself. So I asked what he was called, and I felt my stomach twist when he told me. Alfie Rogers. This was suddenly not a very fun conversation. That was my dad's name. This person obviously had information on me. They must have pinged my IP address, found out my name, and did some basic background research on Ancestry.com and all those other websites that exist nowadays. Alright, you know my dad's name, this isn't funny. What do you want? I asked him, knowing that this kind of thing usually turns into a blackmail attempt or a twisted game. What do you mean? He replied. Still deep in the roleplay. There's no way that you just pulled out a random name and it happened to be my dad's name, so you know who I am. What do you want? Even as I called him out, he still didn't budge. He confidently asserted that he was called Alfie Rogers and that he was living in the 1980s. He started to list a bunch of personal details to prove he was a real person. He knew where my dad was born, where his parents came from, my mother's name, her parents, the car he had, everything. It was really disturbing, I'm pretty good with computers so I know just how much information you can get from historical online records, but this was impressively creepy. Whoever it was, they were really good at this and they must have planned this for some time. I thought about a question I could ask him, something only my dad could really answer. I found the perfect question. We had an old dog when I was a kid, and unfortunately we had no photos of her. Nobody else would know about this dog, there's absolutely no way it was on any database. So I asked him, who is Poppy? Poppy. That's my dog. How did you know the name of my dog? She's a border collie. She's sat with me right now. That's creepy. How did you do that? I started freaking out. I don't believe in stuff like this, in time travel or having conversations with the past, but whoever this man was had too much information about my family history. It just didn't make sense. He answered every question I threw at him. I think I spent hours quizzing him on his entire life and eventually accepting that whoever or whatever this person was, I felt like I was talking to my dad when he was my age. I'd settle past the discomfort, enjoying every moment of this conversation. Though I did ask one thing from him. If he really did exist in the past, and he really was my dad, then I wanted him to take some pictures of Poppy. He laughed and told me he'd get right on it. He told me he had to get going and that he loves how clever computers are. I don't think he fully grasped the situation, but he happily played along as if he was talking to his real son. I asked him to tell Poppy I miss her, and even though I highly suspected that this was some strange AI or a wholesome role player, I told him I loved him. Funnily enough, he replied saying that he loved me, and finished with, can't wait to meet you. Then we ended the conversation. A few weeks passed, I truly felt the happiest that I'd been in a long time. It had been hard living without a dad. He had a heart attack a year before I left for college. But that conversation really gave me a feeling of closure. I felt like I'd navigated my grief and allowed myself to start healing. I'd occasionally check back on that website but never saw anything from him. I suppose it was a one-off thing. Over the next few months I started to think about the conversation less and really started to live my life again. It was Christmas time and I went back home to visit family. It was the second Christmas without him and the lack of his presence was still heavily evident but we enjoyed the holiday and I enjoyed seeing my mom and my brother. On the last night before I returned to college my mom remembered that she had something for me. She brought me an old VHS, it was Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back. I knew what a VHS was, but they'd been extinct for about 20 years, so I wasn't sure why she was giving it to me. Open it, she said. I pried open the clunky case and looked inside. Well shit. There was a whole collection of photos of Poppy, dozens of them. Posing with the whole family, including me and my brother when we were just babies. There were some photos of my dad posing with the dog too, it was surreal, 
and I was too emotional to think about how these had come to be. There was a note attached. For my brilliant children, may the force be with you. He was always a bit of a dork. My mom said to me, I thought we didn't have any photos of Poppy, I don't even remember your dad taking these. A glimpse of happiness and nostalgia was noticeable in her voice. But your brother found them a few weeks ago. I gave her a big hug and went to find my brother. I told him how great it was that he found them and started to look through them. I told him all about the website and the man from the past who claimed to be my dad and that we even had a conversation about him taking photos of the dog. He was happy to listen and go through the photos with me, but he was his usual quiet self and didn't have much to say other than a few positive comments on the photos. He hadn't been the same since he passed. But it was nice to see him with a smile for the first time in a while. So that's my story about my time-traveling conversation with my dad. Sometimes it completely freaks me out and I stay up all night thinking about it. Other times, I just feel comfortable knowing that something beyond my comprehension happened to me. Whether it was an incredibly talented hacker or a crazy AI, I don't know. But I tend to avoid the dark web now. I think I got lucky with this encounter. It was only a matter of time before I met someone who would use that information for the wrong reasons. I have some of my own theories about that story, but I want to hear yours in the comments. If you're enjoying so far, please remember to like the video. Okay, so before I start, this was many years ago and I don't do this kind of thing anymore. I was young and naive and I wanted to impress a girl I liked. For legal reasons, this whole story is completely made up. I was in my early 20s and I'd started hanging out with a group of people that party pretty hard. They did all sorts of drugs that I shall not mention here. I did my best to keep away from that stuff, but I may or may not have joined it a few times. My life was a bit of a mess at the time. I won't make too many excuses about why I was hanging out with these people, but one of the reasons I stuck around for so long was this girl. At the time, she was exactly my type. She had long hair and she was playful and flirty, she was pretty much my dream girl. We got chatting and I asked her to hang out some time and she actually agreed. I couldn't believe it. A few days before she was supposed to come and chill, she messaged me asking if I had any of that good green stuff. I didn't smoke on my own, only in social situations that made it a necessity. But instead of saying this, I just lied and said of course I have some. Suddenly, I'm panicking, contacting everyone I know about getting some grass. Nobody could help, and I was desperate. So, I did the dumbest thing I could think of. I went to the dark web. I got myself a virtual private network to stay anonymous and went searching for a way in. After a bit of digging and asking around, I found a link that supposedly led to a dark web marketplace. My heart was pounding as I clicked on that link. The website had a sketchy vibe, and it was like nothing I'd ever seen on the regular web. No flashy ads, no social media links, just a simple page with a list of products. I went through the listings until I found what I wanted. I messaged the seller and worked out the details. Paying for it wasn't as easy as clicking one button, like you can on Amazon. They wanted cryptocurrency, so I had to figure out how to get my hands on some. It was a bit of a headache and cost me $50 for something that should have cost about 20 but I managed to get it sorted. A few days later, a small package arrived. My heart was racing as I opened it. But instead of what I ordered, it was just some random junk. I had been scammed. Panic set in as I realized I was in way over my head. Soon after, I started getting threatening emails from an anonymous sender. They knew what I'd been up to and were demanding more money or they'd expose my activities to the authorities. I was trapped in a twisted game of blackmail. Every knock on my door made me jump. I desperately tried to figure a way out of this mess. I was stuck in a dark web nightmare of my own making and I couldn't see a way to escape it. Call me an idiot, because I really am, but I sent the anonymous blackmailers around $600 in total, about $100 every week. 
They just keep coming back and blackmailing me and I kept paying until eventually I just said screw it and stopped sending them anything. I lived in complete fear for months afterwards, thinking that the FBI were going to break down my door and arrest me. Looking back, it was pretty ridiculous. Nobody cares about a guy buying a tiny amount of green stuff on the internet, but my head wasn't quite right. The worst part is that the girl I liked didn't even care. She came over and we had a great night and she didn't even ask about it. So, if there's a moral to the story, other than avoiding the dark web, I'd say don't do drugs just to impress someone. And don't send $600 to people blackmailing you over a misdemeanor. This is a pretty short story, but it's true, so I'll tell it exactly as it happened. At the time I was a 23-year-old man, I had a history of using the dark web, browsing random sites, ordering some stuff, never really had any issues. I will mention though, that I used literally no programs or filters to protect me. I just went in deep and assumed that my antivirus would protect me from any harm. Ladies, cover your ears for this next part. Unlike other young men, I would watch adult content and one night while I was feeling particularly lonely, I found some videos that I wouldn't watch with my parents. I sat in front of my laptop and did my business. Two nights later, I get an email. Weirdly, it said that it was sent by my own email address. I hadn't seen anything like that before. I click on it straight away and I can't describe the feeling that hit me. There was a video attached and it was me, in my birthday suit, furiously playing rock paper scissors in my lap. You could see everything, including my face at some point in the video when I adjust my seat. So there was no denying who it was. The email listed a bunch of demands, go online and buy some Bitcoin or gift cards and send them to him. Or the video of me sending would be sent to my family. The blackmailer had the decency to list the names of my family members just in case I thought he was bluffing. He gave me a time limit of 48 hours and pointed out that he could see that I'd opened the email because he was in my computer and threatened that if I contact the authorities or start searching about how to deal with this situation that he would release it all. Call me crazy, but I thought about it for a few hours and decided my dignity was too expensive. I wasn't going to pay someone to hide the fact that I do something that almost every other adult in the world does. I called his bluff and got my friend over to help me clear any viruses from my laptop. He thinks he found how they access my webcam, but we couldn't be sure, so I always have it turned off on the settings, as well as putting a sticker over it. I messaged everyone on the list that he sent me, telling them that they might receive a video of me and explain the situation. They all just laughed and told me I was gross. The blackmail guy never did send the video as far as I know. But I learned my lesson about taking online privacy a bit more seriously. This all happened just recently, in summer this year. I'd been living with my parents until I had a good enough job to move out. About nine months ago I was finally ready to leave the nest. The place I found wasn't the nicest neighborhood, but it wasn't too bad. Some of my neighbors actually came over to welcome me and gave me some food. There was one neighbor though, the guy who lived to the right of me, who wasn't exactly welcoming, but immediately comfortable with me like we'd known each other for a long time. He'd see me leaving for work in the morning and run out of his house to tell me random stories, like how the last neighbor used to always turn the bathroom light on at 3am and leave it on all night or that they would sunbathe in the garden for five hours sometimes. It was all very random boring facts, and I'd barely get a chance to react to his stories before he was asking me intrusive questions. Like, why did you leave for 83 minutes last night? It's worth knowing that his voice was a bit odd. He spoke with a very particular inflection every time he'd say something. Like an enthusiastic nerd, if that makes sense. Sometimes it made his statements sound like accusations, and sometimes it made them sound like questions, but my response to his comments were never really met with conversation. I would kind of laugh it off and just give him a short answer, like, I had to grab some groceries for tomorrow. 
but he'd be really quick to interrupt and remind me that the last neighbor never took 83 minutes to grab groceries. And he'd say it with an almost accusatory tone. Like what I was saying was ridiculous. I assumed he was just a bit odd and didn't call him out on his intrusive questions too much. This continued for weeks. He either ran out to come and question me about my day-to-day -day activity or he'd come knocking at random hours to tell me facts about my life. He would tell me that he noticed that I left at 8.33 this morning instead of the usual 8.26. I had different ways of reacting to this, sometimes thanking him for letting me know, sometimes being rather dismissive, but always friendly. He was never interested in any other kind of conversation. He'd tell me his observations and then leave. The months went by and his behavior continued. Almost every day he'd stop me in the morning or come knocking to tell me something about his observations. He seemed harmless so I just let him do his thing. One evening while I was going for drinks across the road, I asked my neighbor if she ever had any issues with him. She paused almost immediately and looked at me with a serious expression. What happened? She seemed really worried when she asked me. I explained to her that he would approach me constantly to tell me that he'd seen me turning on specific lights in the house at night or that he'd point out changes in my usual routine. Nothing terrifying but still creepy. At this point she turned the music off and put her glass down. You need to be careful around him. She seemed disturbed like I triggered a repressed memory. The people who lived in that house before you were so sweet. I can't prove it but I know that they're gone because of him. Gone? What did she mean gone? I pushed her to tell me more, but she apologized and turned the music back on and changed the subject, ending the conversation. She did stop at one point to just make sure I locked my doors and not to invite him in at any point. That night as I made my way back home, I watched his house closely as I crossed the road. It was noticeably dark, I never really paid it much attention, but I don't think I ever saw his lights after dark. Whereas every other house on the street had at least a few lights in different rooms. I got to my door and paused. I looked towards his house one more time. I saw exactly what I was hoping not to. A glimpse of light. He was peeking at me. How long had he been watching the neighbor's house to know that I was over there? Was this all he did? Watch me. I went inside and remembered what my neighbors said. How often did I not even think about locking the door? Honestly, I think most nights I wouldn't even check. I clicked the lock and made my way to the back door. I took the key from the side and made sure it was locked. I put the key back in its usual place and made my way upstairs. As I dressed down into my underwear and made my way under my covers, I reached over it and turned off the lamp. It had been a long night so I started to drift off quite fast. Did I hear that? Was that knocking? I sat on the side of my bed and waited, anticipating more knocks. About a minute passed and I didn't hear any more knocking, so I assumed I just dreamt it as I was half asleep. I lay back onto my bed and closed my eyes once again. No. I definitely heard something. I was in a weird state of being half asleep and a little bit tipsy, so I threw the light on and made my way to the window. I couldn't see anything or anyone outside. The sound of me opening my window was loud enough for any visitor to hear. I called out into the darkness, asking if anyone was there. At this point, any normal person would step into view and show themselves, but nobody reacted. Nothing. I know that someone was knocking. I threw on my dressing gown and made my way downstairs. I went straight to the front door. It had shaded glass that let me see partially through it. There was clearly a figure standing in front of the door. I was freaking out, but I was also angry. I didn't even consider the danger. I started fumbling with the lock and threw the door open. You left your house for 157 minutes. What the hell? I snapped. 
this was the latest he ever visited. Everything about his behavior had really annoyed me. The fact that I called out of the window and he didn't respond and instead stood with his nose practically touching my front door. Why did you feel the need to tell me that? At this late in the night, I was falling asleep. You've been out very late. I know that. I'm an adult. I'm allowed to go out late. I realized I was reacting to his accusatory tone. Is that all? You wanted to tell me I'd been out late? He started to just walk away, back to his house. I yelled to him that I didn't want him to knock on my door again. He didn't react, just kept walking towards his house and went inside. I'd tolerated his weirdness for long enough. I convinced myself I wouldn't let him commentate my life schedule anymore and that next time he talks to me I was going to tell him I don't care and just keep walking. I closed the door and went straight back to bed, still frustrated with how intrusive and weird he was. I closed my eyes and imagined what I would say to him the next time I saw him. I felt really tired and had no problems getting back to sleep. As expected, I had the weirdest dream. Whenever I had a few drinks I'd always have such vivid dreams. I could hear that damn gentle knocking. I didn't jolt awake this time, I almost convinced my subconscious dream state to ignore the imaginary knocking. But I was fully aware of every creepy little thing that was happening. I started wondering if I'd locked the door. I knew I'd locked it earlier, but did I lock it after I opened it again to confront him? I couldn't remember. I hated how realistic my dreams were. Of all the scenarios I could think about, did I really have to imagine him breaking into my house and walking up my stairs? I feel like I'd never been so consciously aware during any of my dreams. I was dreaming that I was locked in place, sleeping on my side, with my back to the door. His breathing sounded so real. If it wasn't for the alcohol in my system, I would have definitely woken up. This was by far the creepiest dream I ever had. I dreamt that he was climbing into bed with me, wrapping his arm around my waist and playing with my hair. I felt absolutely disgusted, but the soft touches also felt relaxing and pushed me deeper into the dream. I was urging myself to wake up at this point. My mind kept racing back to the thought that I actually hadn't locked the door. I needed to get up. His breathing was so intense. It felt so real. His touch felt real. This was unlike any dream I'd ever had. I was urging myself to wake up. I felt paralyzed. Wake up. Wake the hell up. My eyes finally opened and I could still feel his touch. Why didn't you lock the door? I jumped up. His voice immediately jolted me awake. He was in my bed. I screamed and ran straight down the stairs and out into the night. I was still screaming as I ran across the road and started banging on my neighbor's door. I was freezing, only wearing my underwear and completely barefoot. I banged aggressively on her door and shouted her name until she came down. She opened the door in a daze and I pushed my way in. I frantically explained what had happened whilst begging her to lock the door and call the police. We watched out of the window, my front door was wide open, just as I'd left it. The cops were on their way and my friend was comforting me as I got into some of her clothes and told her all of the details. Minutes passed as we stared out of that window. My friend asked if I was sure he was there and it wasn't just a bad dream. I started to doubt myself when we didn't see him leaving. I wasn't the sensitive type, I wouldn't make up that whole scenario out of fear. I had a vivid memory of him lying in bed with me, and touching me, and talking to me. It was real. I know it was. The cops showed up after about 15 minutes and started to enter the house, guns drawn. We watched intently, waiting for them to bring him out in cuffs. They were in there for quite a while and I started to think that he'd locked himself in my room or something. After what felt like forever, the cops started to leave my house. They were alone. He wasn't with them. I couldn't believe it. I was not crazy. He was in my house. I know he was. 
I made my way outside to speak to the cops and ask where he was, but they confirmed that they found nothing and searched everywhere. I frantically told them that I was not going back into the house with him still in there. That's when the worst thing that could have happened, happened. He walked out of his house. He stood there, just watching. I was freaking out, demanding that they arrest him and insisting that he was in my house. His expression didn't change, he didn't even flinch. He just turned and walked back inside. Yes, I was drunk and I was pretty emotional at this point, but I couldn't believe that they didn't listen to me. They told me that they'd searched the entire place and there was no intruder. They said that the person who I claimed was an intruder was clearly in their own home, so I should just go inside and get some sleep. There were no signs of forced entry and no damage or evidence of an intruder, so there was nothing they could do. After a while me practically begging them to at least go and interview him, one officer did go over and speak to him, but it seemed like a very short conversation. He confirmed that he did come over initially to check on me, as I looked drunk, but then went straight home. I was furious, but also terrified. I eventually went back inside and searched the house for any evidence that he was there. I was almost starting to doubt myself, until I checked the back door. It was unlocked, and the key was still in the door. I never left the key in the door, ever. He'd left through the back whilst I was hiding across the street. He'd been in my house and there was nothing I could do about it. I made my way upstairs after properly locking every door. The sick freak had made my bed. It was perfectly tidy and the covers and pillows were placed perfectly. He didn't even rush out after I woke up. He just tidied my bed and then left through the back door. I climbed in and tried to fall asleep, but there was an overwhelming musky smell. His unwashed body had tainted my covers and his odor lingered all over my room. It took me hours to replace all of my bedding and finally get to sleep. The next morning I couldn't shake the feeling of being violated, but I also doubted the whole night. The police had been inside my house, a bunch of men in heavy uniform. That could explain the smell. The key being in the back door, maybe they were checking to see if it was the right key for that lock, confirming that nobody had stolen it. Even the tiny pillows had an explanation. I told them he was in my bed. So it makes sense that they'd throw my bedding onto the floor if they were looking for him, and then maybe one of them just put it back and tidied it up for me. I followed my usual morning routine, and then at 8.30 as I approached my front door, I took a deep breath, anticipating his presence. I left my house and headed towards the road, looking in his direction as soon as I stepped outside. There he was walking out of his house to greet me. Like clockwork. I froze and tensed up, ready to scream or punch him if he got too close. You're running three minutes later than usual. Did you remember to lock your door this time? If you're enjoying the video, please subscribe. When I was 12, we had this neighbor, she was an elderly woman, but she was surprisingly active. We'd always see her around, carrying weeks worth of groceries up the hill like it was no big deal. She was outside doing her gardening almost every day. She was a tough old lady. The unfortunate thing was that she was the opposite of friendly. If you said hello to her, she'd tell you to run into the road. She hated people and was a very bad neighbor. She would complain about every little thing and show up late at night to tell you that you're too loud and threaten to call the cops. Our family got into quite a few arguments with her. Whenever she would come over to complain, she would aggressively insult all of us. My parents got sick of this and just started insulting her back, telling her she was old and miserable and she would die alone. I didn't like it, but I figured it was just adults letting off some steam. I'm sure I even caught her smiling on her way back home after shouting with my parents. She had quite a reputation around town for being a witch. There were all sorts of rumors about her being hundreds of years old and having the stamina and strength of a 20-year-old man. They were not wrong about that. People would say that they'd seen her performing rituals through her window and that she kidnapped children and ate them. 
It was all silly stuff, but at the time I found it fun to believe. Anyway, the real scary part happened while I was home alone playing on my Nintendo. I could hear an odd sound outside my window, like an animal scratching at a door. I paused my game and went to check it out. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw it. She was in our backyard, clawing at a window with a screwdriver, trying to get into the house. I opened the window and told her that I called the cops. She didn't hesitate to run back home. It was still so strange seeing this old woman running back at such speed. I actually did call the cops and told them what had happened. They told me they were on the way over and that I should go upstairs and lock myself in the bathroom. Within a few minutes I could smell something that made me panic. It was smoke. I immediately assumed she'd set the house on fire. I ran to open the bathroom window and that's when I realized what had happened. The smoke wasn't coming from my house. It was coming from next door. For whatever reason, her house had set on fire and she was still inside. Before the fire department could arrive, the whole place had gone up in flames. They announced that she died in that fire and we even went to her funeral. There weren't many people there. The last scary thing about all of this was that it only fueled the stories about her being a witch and that after I caught her trying to kidnap me, she had to burn it all down and move elsewhere to conceal her identity. I don't know what to believe, but I do enjoy telling this story every Halloween. Please leave a comment and like the video. It means a lot. My neighbor is very weird. He never waves and has a permanent sneer on his face. When we moved in we were told that he was on a certain bad list and that we should call the cops if we see him with kids. One day, he randomly knocked on our door. I'd never spoken to him before and without even introducing himself properly, he proceeds to launch into his explanation of the reason that he's on the registry. Basically, he claims that he accidentally hurt some kid in a locker room while they both happened to not be wearing any clothes. He says it was plain old vanilla assault where both parties just happened to be in their birthday suits. He repeated multiple times that he is absolutely not into children. Then he left without even letting me talk. That was literally my first introduction to him. Other than the notification about him when we first arrived. And that wasn't even the creepiest thing about him. At some point, he started building a sign in front of his house. Not like a little poster. It's professionally printed on metal and mounted on two huge posts, like the ones you see outside a store or along the highway. The sign is a picture of a puppy and a long rambling story about how someone ran over his dog on this road ten years ago. But it's written in a way where he seems to accuse the neighborhood of murdering his dog. Next to this sign, covering his entire fence, is an enormous banner saying, We miss you. I don't know why it says that, since he lives alone. And finally, an even larger picture of the puppy, which isn't necessary, because directly in front of the banner, sitting on a folding card table, is the actual puppy. He must have had the dog stuffed when it was ran over. I could see from my window that he would hide behind his fence for literally hours, peeking at the puppy on the table as if he were waiting for someone to mess with it. He did this for days until finally bringing the stuffed animal inside. The puppy and the banner disappeared, but the metal sign was permanent. It stayed up for years until a storm ripped it down. I always wondered what he does with the dog. Did it stay in a closet or does he keep it out in his house? Well, one day I got my answer. I have a friend who does construction and funnily enough, he was hired by the creepy neighbor to build a shed. Without even asking, he tells me that the guy keeps an ugly stuffed puppy in the living room like a piece of furniture and then he talks to it constantly. There were plenty of other creepy things, but the big puppy shrine was the most notable. I never did see him with any children, but I'm constantly on the lookout. Okay, before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country South Africa for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, and alarms. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. 
My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs. Two Sharpays, two German short hair pointers, and two Dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely around the garden as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, it's normal to have a live-in maid and a gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them, it's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. For the story, our maid is Ellie and our gardener is Vince. So this happened in 2007 when I was 9 years old. My older brother was 10 and we had just gotten our first cell phones that day, my dad surprised us after work. You may think we were quite young to have phones, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night due to security reasons, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter, who was 18, was like an older sister to us, and she was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember the maid's daughter making a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was. That's why I noticed it as well. Sure, they bark but it was usually the dachshunds that yapped when the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night as even the bigger dogs were barking non-stop. My dad appeared in our room and mentioned to us that he also noticed the dogs incessant barking and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either because my brother asked to investigate with him and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad said he had a terrible feeling because of this and because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called after them they usually come running, but tonight they all seemed to just look at him. They then turned back around and continued going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch, sort of using it as an excuse for my brother not to come with him because of this off feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dogs seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched to the steps and just as he realized what was happening, it was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Four men in balaclavas stepped out of the darkness, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. He said that he saw my dad come out with my brother but my brother went back into the house. My dad said something came over him and before he knew what he was saying, he responded by saying he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu, assuming my dad couldn't understand because it's not common for white people to speak it. But my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said, in Zulu, shit. The cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this guy, grab what we can, and leave. The others seemed apprehensive and a smaller guy seemed really on edge and continued to say how he can't go back to jail again. And they need to get out of there before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then took advantage of this guy's fear. My dad interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they're saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did the trick. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller scared guys started freaking out all the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP or else they'd be caught. 
He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan was slowly turning to shit, as a third guy had put it. The aggressive guy pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn to dart towards the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quick as possible without even thinking. The maid's daughter and I were obviously also oblivious to everything when my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slammed it shut and told us to go upstairs into the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel, not too far behind. We sat there in the darkness and silence, I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed saying she didn't have a phone, and neither did my dad. But as luck would have it, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, when they asked where we lived, they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only shitting ourselves, but we're flabbergasted. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes, damn. He didn't close the veranda door, and what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us that whatever we hear, to not come downstairs. To stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he tells us he has to go get the others before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. The maid's daughter is understandably in hysterics, because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They say to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was my dad, with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, no one dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably but were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was the security company and sure enough, it was. He opened up and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police for our jurisdiction and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys had bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed over. We got an electric fence shortly after. So there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen. Which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad and it's sickeningly common for torture and other terrible things to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time, I didn't know the horrors of the world and was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel gives me the chills to this day. The cops said the fact that there were so many guys, instead of like one to three, indicates that these guys possibly had sinister intentions. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family, and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, 
I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened had it not been for our incredible dogs. From that day onwards my dad always gave them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved for you angels. If you're enjoying the video, please leave a like. Hello. I'm a 20-year-old French girl. I'm sorry in advance if there are any mistakes, hope you can understand me. To set the context, I live in a suburb in a small residence with six houses. My gate is often broken, and most of the time it's wide open, giving easy access to our small courtyard. My house has one floor with four bedrooms, including mine. Downstairs, there's a guest bedroom which we use as a treatment room due to my health issues. It's where we keep all the equipment and medicines. I also have a dog who means the world to me. He feels everything and even senses my epileptic seizures before they happen. He can even tell when the nurses are arriving by the sound of their tires in our yard. He never barks unless there's a problem. A nurse visits me four to five times a day for treatments, including infusions. This is an important part of my story. One morning, as usual, my nurse, Sandra, arrived at 8 a.m. She administered my treatment, and we chatted like we always did. After about 40 minutes, she left, saying she might be a little late next time, but I shouldn't be worried. That day, my parents were at work, and I had a medical appointment in the morning. I was home alone, except for the nurse's visits every four hours. When I returned from my appointment, I sat on the sofa with my dog while waiting for the next nurse. When I heard tire noises, I thought it was Sandra arriving a bit early. My dog started growling, which was unusual. I looked at the time, 11.50 a.m. I assumed Sandra might have switched with the previous patient, as she sometimes did. I heard a knock and I went to the door. I saw a young woman I had never met before. She introduced herself as Camille, a third year at nursing school, and explained that Sandra had sent her to prepare my treatment. I wasn't suspicious, I was used to students coming over. But I was a bit surprised because Sandra usually informed me in the morning or sent a message. Also, she never left a student alone on the first visit. I led Camille to the treatment room and showed her the way. While she washed her hands, my dog's behavior became strange. He growled as she approached me and circled me, so I decided to leave him in the living room and close the door to keep him calm. I didn't pay much attention to what Camille was doing, I was on my phone at that moment. Then, I noticed she was preparing a syringe rather than using the pre-made saline syringe as usual. I glanced up and saw that my treatment ampoules were untouched, but I had heard the distinct sound of ampoules breaking. Something felt off. As she approached me with the syringe, I received a message from Sandra saying she'd be there in five minutes and asked me to start setting up the equipment. I made up an excuse, telling Camille that I needed to use the restroom and left her in the treatment room. My dog kept barking and growling. When I reached the toilet downstairs, I sent Sandra a message telling her about the woman and she had no idea what I was talking about. I was terrified and started crying in the bathroom. Camille came to check on me and asked if everything was okay. I assured her it was, and that's when I heard the front door slam shut. Two minutes later, it reopened, and I heard Sandra's voice. I left the bathroom, still crying, and Sandra asked me what had happened. I explained the situation and showed her the treatment room. We called the police, who arrived, examined the evidence, and took samples from the syringe and other items prepared by Camille. The test results were shocking. The syringe contained a paralyzing substance, enough to paralyze a 120 kilograms man, and the IV contained a highly concentrated medicine that could have stopped anyone's heart. To this day, we don't know who Camille really was. Thankfully, I never heard from her again. She had stolen all my opioids but left my tablet and computer untouched. Looking back, 
I realized my dog had sensed Camille's ill intentions. I should have been more vigilant, especially since she was a stranger and on her own. My treatments are far from simple. I often wonder what could have happened if I hadn't checked my phone that day. I had blocked this story from my memory until my girlfriend reminded me of it a couple days ago. I started dating my girlfriend at the end of my senior year and I used multiple dating apps before we started dating. I had my Snapchat listed in many of my dating app profiles. This is important. Nothing led to anything with the apps, I talked to people for a bit and eventually the conversation would die out. When I began dating my girlfriend, I had deleted the apps but never deleted my account, meaning people could still see my profile and my Snapchat account. I realized this after a few people would add me, but it didn't bother me much because I'd tell them I had a girlfriend. As you would imagine, the conversation would end at that point. But there was this one guy that added me, let's call him Adam. And he asked me if I was available. Being straight, I was used to guys adding me, so I gave him the usual response. Sorry, I'm straight and I have a girlfriend. I expected him to leave me alone, but it didn't stop him. At first the messages were normal. How was your day? What did you do today? Simple stuff like that. Being the nice guy I am, I responded because I thought this guy just wanted to be friends and having a gay friend is okay with me. Then the messages progressively got more creepy, he started asking questions about my girlfriend and not the basic questions. As the days passed, I started to notice that Tyler's vocabulary was very similar to Adam's. I wasn't sure about it, so I didn't make any assumptions that it was him. I shared Tyler's Snapchat with my girlfriend, who added him to investigate. As soon as she added Tyler's snap, Tyler flipped out her, confirming that it was indeed Adam. Realizing this, I blocked him again. After that, everything went quiet from Adam for about a month. I live in the suburbs of Chicago, and both my girlfriend and I live down the street from each other. We often see each other, and our families are good friends. Anyway, a month went by until I received a letter with no address or name on it, just my name on the front. I opened it, and to my shock and horror, it was basically a love letter from Adam. The letter expressed his love for me and his desire for me to run off with him. The letter took a very sexual turn halfway through, with explicit descriptions of what he wanted to do to me. At that moment, I had two horrifying realizations. One was that he knew my address, and two, he had dropped off the letter himself, meaning he was in my town. I immediately called my girlfriend, who was equally shocked. After consulting with my parents, we called the cops. Unfortunately, since I had blocked and removed Adam's social media information and the letter had no return address, there was nothing we could do about it. Day after day, letters kept appearing in my mailbox until they also started showing up at my girlfriend's place. Her letters were far worse than mine. Adam wrote about how much he hated her and how he wanted to hurt her. He described in detail the ways he would inflict pain on her until she broke up with me. Like me, she reported this to the police, but they could do nothing about it. My girlfriend's family had plans to go to Hawaii for vacation and I was house-sitting for them. The first couple of days went fine until one of the last nights of the week. As usual, I was at their house, watching TV on the couch, when the power went out. It was around 1 a.m. and it was pitch black. The next few seconds were silent and then I heard a window smash from the office. To help you understand the layout of the house, when you entered the front door, the living room was on your left, straight ahead were both the kitchen and stairs, and to the right were the office and dining room. Upstairs, as soon as you reached the top of the stairs, there was a bathroom straight ahead. My girlfriend's room was on the right, and the other bedrooms were on the left. I immediately grabbed a kitchen knife and ran upstairs to hide while I called the cops. I quickly got into my girlfriend's room and slipped into the closet. As soon as I was able to contact the operator, I heard the intruder pounding up the steps. Thankfully, I had relayed all the information to the operator in time and she stayed on the phone as we both remained quiet. 
The intruder took a left when he reached the top of the stairs, which gave more time for the cops to arrive and for me to get ready, just in case I needed to defend myself. A few minutes passed until I heard the intruder start walking toward my girlfriend's room. In the precious seconds I had, I slipped out of the closet and positioned myself next to the door. As soon as he opened the door and started to enter the room, I took the kitchen knife and drove it into his shoulder. A young man screamed in pain as I heard a heavy metallic object make a large thud as it hit the ground. From there, I bolted out of the house, where I was met by four squad cars and cops with their guns raised. I raised my hands, shouting that he was upstairs in the right room. A few minutes passed, and the intruder was dragged out, still screaming in pain. With the siren lights flooding the street, I got a glimpse of his face. It was Adam. Later, an officer informed me that the metallic thud was caused by him dropping his handgun. Adam was from Texas and had traveled up to my state to be with me. He had rented a room at a local motel and would put letters in both my girlfriend's and my mailbox daily. He was doing this in the early hours of the morning. This was confirmed by the security footage from the motel he was staying at. On the night of the break-in, Adam had plans to kill my girlfriend and her family so that I would choose to be with him. He managed to pry open the power box, switched off the power to her house along with neighboring houses, and broke in with the intention of her being there. Well, unfortunately for him, she was enjoying a tropical vacation. To be honest, I have no idea how the outcome would have been different if they hadn't gone on vacation, and I am grateful that I still have my girlfriend as well as her family alive. So, to any stalkers out there, please stay away from my girlfriend. This happened to me over a decade ago, but I will never forget the feeling deep in my chest. Both that night and the next morning when the true nature of the situation became apparent. It was late December in a small Texas town. We just received five inches of snow earlier in the morning. I can't remember what time it was, all I remember is it was dark outside and I was playing in my room. It's important to note that my room was made up of two parts, a mudroom with a door leading out front, then my actual bedroom. The door was an older style wood door with all the old hardware and had a window on the top half. It had a window shade, but that wouldn't stop anyone from looking in if they wanted. My room was the frontmost with my parents' room being in the back of the house. I was in my mudroom playing with my Hot Wheels when I felt something weird. Like someone was watching me. I was facing the door at this point and looked right up at the window. I was trying to focus on the little openings left by the window shade, staring for any reason to feel unsafe and run. After a while, I was sure that there was nothing, so I went back to playing. A few minutes later, I got the feeling again. This time I didn't look at the door but instead moved so that my back was now to the door, hoping that it was all in my head. Just then, the most terrifying thing happened. There was a noise at the door, like the doorknob had been touched. I was still turned around. I was completely frozen at the metal sound of the doorknob, it was moving. I didn't know how or why, but it was moving, slowly turning, testing the lock. I wanted to move, but I was frozen. It was like someone glued every joint in my body. My chest felt like a car was parked on it. My parents had been in the shower, all the way at the back of the house, leaving me at the front all alone. The only room lit up was mine. Suddenly, the knob was not being gently moved, someone was turning it with force. This door was one that had to be locked from the inside, so the knob could turn and open freely. Luckily, there were two deadbolts. Whoever was on the other side just figured out the knob was free to open. As soon as I heard it turn all the way, I sprung up to the wall about five feet from the door, my back to the wall. The door fell silent. I found myself glued to the wall, unable to move. Then, the knob turned slowly, I remember watching, waiting for it to turn all the way. When it did, Whoever was on the other side started trying to budge the door and pry. At first, it was easy going, but then they started pounding into the door with their foot. They got only two kicks in, when I unfroze and screamed for my life. I sprinted to the back of the house to get my parents. 
They asked what was wrong, and I said someone tried to break in. They ran over and checked, not bothering to look outside, which I pleaded them to. They just said my imagination was running wild and it was an animal or the old age of the house. They took one final look in my mudroom, not bothering to investigate any further. I was told to go to bed. It took me hours. I don't even remember falling asleep. All I remember is staring at the door from my bed, never taking my eyes off the doorknob. Suddenly, I was woken up by my parents, who were obviously distressed and seemed to be scared. My mom grabbed me by both shoulders and got right in front of me. She asked very sternly why I thought someone tried to break in. When I told them this time, they seemed to listen. I was worried how serious they were as they asked me about everything. When I was done, they said they had to show me something. They took me to the front door and out to the front yard, pointing to my door near the driveway. You could clearly see the boot prints in the snow, walking along the street through our yard and straight to my window, then my mudroom door, where I had been playing the night before. The police showed up and took a report, but nothing ever came of it. I was never able to sleep well in that house. I can never forget what it felt like as a child to go through this and not have my parents believe me. I'm just glad I was not home alone and very thankful for that strong door. If you're a fan of the video, please subscribe. I always love reading your opinions in the comments. About 10 years ago, I lived on my own and didn't have much company. I was quite depressed at the time after losing my girlfriend to a drunk driver. I was enjoying a beer and watching the sunset on the back porch when I saw a massive scruffy man emerging from the tree line. My heart skipped a beat as he stumbled towards my house in a menacing way. Living alone, I often use my backyard for target practice. And at that moment, I was immensely grateful for it. Instinctively, I rushed to bolt all the doors while frantically dialing the police. What I didn't know was that this intruder had broken in the day before through a basement window and had spent the night squatting there. He had left the basement door unlocked and at this point he made his way inside the house and was making his way up the stairs towards me. I gripped my rifle, aiming at the approaching man as he descended the hallway. I shouted at him, ordering him to stop and get on the ground, but he just kept walking towards me. I fired the first round, loaded with rock salt, but he showed no reaction. I quickly followed with a rubber bullet to the chest. Yet the drugged up guy who was clearly out of his mind, continued advancing. This guy was huge, at least twice my size and I realized that whatever drugs he had in his body were going to push him through any pain that a rubber bullet would inflict. He was backing me into a corner. I desperately begged him to stop and warned him what would happen, but he just moaned at me like a zombie and shouted, Shoot! Do it! Then he lunged towards me. I took my third shot. It left a gaping hole in his chest. It barely even slowed him down. He kept coming, and in a frenzied struggle, he wrestled me to the ground. He was moaning and coughing up blood. Suddenly, he grabbed my face with both of his massive hands and started squeezing my head. It was utterly terrifying. I could feel him trying to burst my skull open like a balloon. I don't know how long it actually lasted, but it felt like forever. Eventually, the injury finally caught up with him, and he died on top of me. I was laying with him crushing me for a few minutes. My energy was completely drained and I could barely breathe with his weight on top of me. His body was pushing my rifle into my chest and it was causing me serious pain when I tilted his body to the side. I was completely drenched in his blood and I can still remember the overwhelming smell. I'd completely forgotten that I was still on the phone with the operator who had heard our entire exchange which more or less amounted to me pleading, stop or I'll shoot, and the man menacingly taunting. The police arrived soon after, and the incident made it to the local papers. There was a criminal investigation, but eventually, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. It turned out that the intruder was wanted for murder of an elderly couple in Baltimore, and had somehow made his way 50 miles up the road into a rural area. 
Many years ago, I used to work the night shift at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. During the season, it wasn't too bad, mostly families and tourists. We had on-site security back then. However, in the off-season, the winter months were different. The cheap weekly rates we offer attracted a lot of creepy people. The idea was supposed to be to make money in the off-season by renting to snowbirds, older retired people who came to the beach for about a month through the winter. It did not always work out that way. The cheap rates made it possible for a less than desirable element to become long-term residents. I've discovered more than my fair share of meth labs, broken up physical assaults, and more during the winter months. Working the third shift, I would meet some interesting people. The cold weather would mean some homeless people would come in to get warm and grab some free coffee. I wasn't supposed to let them, but it's not in me to be cruel. I would let them grab a coffee and get warm for a minute, as long as they didn't cause trouble. As you can see, night shift in the winter made for some crazy and sometimes creepy stories. I have a lot, but this one is one that stands out because it didn't end well for me. I had a great night up to this point. I had gone to an indie wrestling show with my best friend before work. In fact, I had agreed to come in an hour early the next night for the young lady that worked the second shift in exchange for her working an hour late for me. Ironically enough, I met Terry Funk that night, a wrestling legend known for his hardcore matches. Little did I know I was about to experience this kind of violence for real. I was supposed to be there at midnight due to her working over an hour for me. I normally came in at 11 p.m. I counted the register and she briefed me on her shift as to what had happened, as per usual. As she was leaving, my friend Andrew arrived. He worked second shift maintenance at this hotel and the other two hotels our company owned. He would regularly stop by after work, go grab us some food, and we would play World of Warcraft on our laptops after eating for a while since business was slow. He was just getting my money for the food, getting ready to leave. I was excited, telling him about how much fun I had at the wrestling show and showing him my Terry Funk t-shirt that I was so proud of. I was just walking into the back office to put the shirt up when I heard the doorbell indicating a customer had entered. It's true what they say, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I had turned around when I heard someone say something loudly, but I still couldn't make out what they had said. I had just reached the doorway when I saw Andrew fall down in front of me. The next thing I know, a guy walks around the corner and punches me in the head with a short steel pipe in his hand. It staggered me, and I fell to the ground. Before I could react, he hits me in the head with the pipe. I suddenly heard another guy that I hadn't even noticed. He was panicking because he thought that one of us had ran to get a cop. They left out the door. I was finally able to get to my feet. I tried to call the police from the phone in the back office, but it was having issues. I slammed it in frustration. I was hurting and scared, really freaking out. I realized that they could come back, so I ran and locked the door. I didn't know where Andrew had gone, and that worried me. I called 911 and started to notice the blood pouring down my head. I told the operator I had been attacked and needed an officer and an ambulance. I then called Travis, the manager of the hotel, to tell him what had happened. He thought I was messing with him at first because when we got bored, we would usually prank each other. I finally convinced him I was not joking. So he told me he was heading over straight away. The cops and the ambulance pulled up and I opened the door. It was at this time I found out that after they sucker punched him and knocked him down, Andrew was able to amazingly jump over the desk and escape. He ran out just as a cop was driving by, which he ran to flag down for help. I ended up in the hospital emergency room where I had to have 10 staples in my scalp and they gave me morphine for pain. I had no way to get home after being treated, but the doctor and nurses took pity on me and paid for a cab. My plan was to go back to work because this was December and Christmas was coming. I had three kids and needed all the hours I could get. When I got back to the hotel, the IT guy Ted was there with his wife Barbara, who also worked at the front desk. She was shocked to see me, she thought I would still be in the hospital. 
I thought I had only been hit in the head once after being punched. But the video which Ted was pulling for the police showed a different story. After I went to the ground, the guy had hit me not just one time, but ten times in total. I kept trying to grab the pipe and get up, for some reason. I do not remember that, I guess I was knocked pretty hard. He kept punching me and hitting me with the pipe until his friend told him that Andrew got away and then got the cops. The two of them then ran out. I was given a room at the other hotel. And Ted and Barbara gave me a lift there as I was in no condition to drive due to the morphine. They also gave me a paid week off to heal. They switched me over to the other hotel on the night shift for a month, just in case they were after me in particular. We never found out why they chose to attack me. The police thought it might be a failed strong arm robbery, due to Andrew getting away and me not just going down. Not knowing why they attacked me really shook me up. Even though I was at our other hotel when I came back to work the night shift, I was still nervous. I tensed up every time the door chimed. I couldn't afford to quit, as I said, I had three kids I was supporting. They never caught the guys as far as I know. A detective stopped by about two months later when I was working the second shift. He showed me several mug shots and asked me if any of them looked familiar. I never got a great look at them as it all happened so fast. I had seen the video, which wasn't the best quality. Even so, two of them looked very familiar. I pointed them out, and he asked me how sure I was. I told him honestly, like 85%. He then yelled and asked me if I wanted someone to go to jail for attempted murder on 85%. I was stunned into silence. I was the victim. I was attacked for no reason, and he is yelling at me like it's my fault. I was too busy being attacked to get a good look at them. I no longer work at a hotel on the night shift, and I'm glad, because it's just too dangerous in this area. Night shifts at hotels can be risky, and after my terrifying experience, I decided it was time for a change. For a while, the memories of that night haunted me. The feeling of being so vulnerable, the pain from the attack, and the lingering questions about the attacker's motives all weighed heavily on my mind. But over time, I began to heal, both physically and emotionally. I found a new job with better working hours and conditions, which provided me with the opportunity to spend more time with my kids. The sense of safety and security that had been shattered during that fateful night gradually returned. Life moved on, and I left the hotel industry behind. I learned that sometimes, it's necessary to prioritize your well-being over financial concerns. My new job allowed me to support my family while maintaining a more stable work-life balance. I never did find out what motivated the attackers that night. They remained at large, leaving behind a trail of questions and unresolved mysteries. However, I chose not to dwell on the past but to look forward to a brighter future. Though the scars on my scalp served as a physical reminder of that harrowing night, they also symbolized my resilience and ability to overcome adversity. It was a chapter of my life that had come to an end, and I was determined to write a new, safer, and happier story for myself and my family. Please remember to like the video if you're enjoying the stories, leave a comment about your thoughts, and subscribe if you haven't already. I need to preface this by saying that I don't believe in ghosts or any other kind of paranormal activity. This is not an attempt to convince people of their existence. What I will say is that I have an open mind regarding things that I can't explain using logic or reasoning. I know something happened to me, I just don't know what. And nothing I've heard so far has come anywhere near a satisfactory explanation. But then, that's what had me creeped out about it. If I could just chalk it up to seeing a ghost or witnessing a glitch in the matrix, as I've heard people call it, or any of that, at least I could draw a line under it and move on. But I can't. Because I have no idea what happened that night, and neither does anyone else. I used to work for a security company that contracted overnight work for large office buildings in downtown Houston. Some of the buildings were real nice places, and their security offices had all kinds of amenities that others just didn't have. The only problem was they made for some of the most boring overnight shifts you could possibly imagine. 
Tough guards can be exhausting and dangerous, but boredom is a different kind of poison altogether. So you understand why I say, out of all the places that I could have expected my scariest night working security, these places didn't get anywhere near the top 10. One of the buildings we worked in had a bunch of different offices on each floor with a layout, each one being shaped like a letter U. Each of the floors was owned by a different company for the most part. Anyway, so most had a different design but the same layout, and part of that layout were those polished metal plates that sat on the corner of each corridor. They were positioned at the 90 degree angles in the U shape. At first, I figured it was just an odd design choice. Then I figured out that they were like mirrors. If someone was walking down the connecting corridor and you couldn't see them, you'd be able to see a little movement in the polished metal so you wouldn't run into anyone or get a fright. Kind of clever, right? Well, listen to this. One night, I'm working the overnight shift with two other coworkers. When it comes my turn to perform a physical sweep of the building, we had most of the building mapped out with cameras, but no security guard worth his salt relies on electronics. So every half hour, one of the guards would take a quick walk around each of the floors just to make sure everything was A-OK. -okay. Most of the guys would just take elevators up and down, but it was around this time that I decided to take the stairs a few times a night to get some exercise. I was a few pounds heavier than I wanted to be, and walking up even five or six flights of stairs sucked. So I took as many flights as I could, then took the elevator the rest of the way. It also helped kill time on those hellish shifts. Anyway, this one time, I managed to hustle all the way up to the ninth floor, which was totally a new record for me. But I was completely out of gas. I literally had to lean against the wall to catch my breath making sure to stay in the stairwell's blind spots so my coworkers wouldn't watch and laugh at me. Once I had myself together again, I walked out into the corridor and towards the first bend in the U-shaped layout that I mentioned earlier. As I got within a few feet of it, I froze. For the first time in the whole time that I'd worked there, I saw a reflection in the polished metal mirror thing. It wasn't crystal clear, but it was absolutely different to how it usually looked. I had the usual reflective image ingrained into my memory because I saw it hundreds of times a night. I could clearly see someone standing in the connecting hallway, wearing what looked to be the same kind of security uniform as me. I called out, thinking it was one of my coworkers. Then the white shirt shape suddenly moved out of sight. Now, right away, I thought this was a prank. I caught them trying to scare me. So, as I'm walking around the corners, I'm kind of calling out, Hey, I know you're there. I saw you in the reflection. I get around each corner, but I don't see anyone. I assume the guy had ducked into one of the conference rooms or offices as a backup. I checked all of them, and they were all empty. I called down on my radio to make sure someone was really up there with me and they're just hiding in a closet or something because they're a bunch of immature idiots. The second I heard both guys talking on the same radio, I felt myself getting just a little bit freaked out. Either I was having some kind of weird episode after power walking up those nine flights, where my eyes were playing tricks on me, or something very bad was happening. So, naturally, I'm starting to get a little worried. Not majorly worried, just a little. I decided to take the elevator the rest of the way. I was still concerned about my health, but then as I'm walking back towards it, something happened that makes me feel cold just to think about to this day. It felt like someone walked up behind me, and it felt like it was fast. I heard the footsteps that definitely weren't my own, and I felt that feeling of imminent danger you get when someone rushes you from behind. I turned, had my hand on my sidearm, ready to defend myself. But there was nothing there. Just an empty corridor with me standing in it. I can't even really think of the words for the kind of fear that I was feeling in that moment. The best that I can come up with is it was like a physical force, and that fear hit me and pushed me towards the elevator at a speed walk. I was convinced that someone was up there with me. But at the same time, they either had to be psychic or a ninja to rush up on me like that, or at least make me feel like I was being creeped on. None of it made any sense, and more and more, I was thinking that there was something wrong with me not that something weird was going on. Once I was safely in the elevator, 
I called down to my coworkers and asked them to watch all of the cameras on the 10th floor for any kind of movement. They replied, asking if I was all good or if I needed help, probably because they could hear the state I was in. But I told them to shut up, watch the cameras, and tell me if they could see anything or anyone. I was expecting a no, in which case I had to accept that I was having some kind of medical emergency and maybe even call 911. I heard about people having strokes or heart attacks and how they can feel confused or panicked, so that's all my hypochondriac mind was thinking about. But then, as my radio crackled to life again, I heard the next thing they said, and I swear to Christ that I felt like I was going to throw up. My coworker came back with, yeah, there's someone up there with you. We're headed for the elevator right now. I sent it down to the ground floor, and if I'm being honest, I was weirdly relieved. I wasn't about to have a stroke, and I wasn't going crazy. There really was some up on the 10th floor, and they were about to get messed up for scaring the living daylights out of me. We swept all the rooms together, calling out to this potential intruder the whole time, saying things like, come on out, and you're only getting trespassing, and even saying things like, this is a heck of a way to get yourself shot. We were just bluffing, and it wasn't a huge issue that we didn't find this intruder. They could have easily used the stairwell to escape to another floor. But instead of going and hunting them down, we just headed back down to the security office, watched the cameras, and waited for the real cops to show up. On the way back to the office, I asked my coworker what exactly he'd seen on those security cameras, and it turns out he hadn't seen anything definitive, just enough blurry movement on the edges of a monitor to know that someone was definitely up there. And they seemed like they knew where the camera's blind spots were. This is what really sent alarm bells ringing for my coworkers. Stuff like that suggests someone has cased the place, done a little recon in the daytime, possibly disguised as a client or employee. They know where to go to get whatever they come for, as well as how to get there without being spotted straight away. A lot of people have asked me how this person could have gotten into the building in the first place, and didn't that bother me at all? The question did bother me, but we're not trained to waste time thinking about how. We're trained to react to intruders as and when they occur, to focus on either locking them down for the cops or getting them out of the building without anyone getting hurt. You focus on the how afterward. In the moment, you focus on the intruder. Anyway, we watched the cameras, called the cops, and tried to work out where this intruder could have gotten to while avoiding all the security cameras. We stared at the cameras for maybe 15 to 20 minutes before the cops showed up and we didn't see any movement. When the cops arrived, we helped them sweep all the floors and offices to make sure no one was around. They were pretty thorough about it. Opening up closets and checking under desks. But still, we found no one. Even the cops said that it must have been spooky for whoever was up there alone, which sounded like the understatement of the century. But right then, when we were dealing with the situation, I was sure that it wasn't just me going nuts. The situation was resolving itself, so I was relatively calm again. When the cops left, we switched on the alarm systems for floors 9 to 13, meaning if anyone entered those floors again, we'd be instantly alerted, and a 911 call would automatically be issued. No alarms were triggered that night, so we figured the episode was pretty much over and done with. We'd have to talk to the head of security about it, and there was no doubt that he'd be very interested in how he let something like that happen. But no one expected to get fired. In the weeks afterward, I realized how much the experience had affected me. The longer I went on wondering about it, the worse the feeling got. I thought I had put it behind me, but it turned out to be a major error in judgment on my part. Or maybe I just ignored my feelings. I thought about what could have made those noises and reflections. What could have given me that feeling like someone was rushing up behind me? After thinking about it for long enough, I decided that I didn't want to work there anymore. When I was told that I couldn't pick and choose which guard shifts I was on, I was left with no choice but to seek employment elsewhere. I'm not afraid to admit that I was scared of whatever happened up there. Rather than going down some crazy rabbit hole trying to explain it, I thought it was better just to walk away and start fresh someplace else. It's never happened again, nor anything like it, but you can bet your bottom dollar that if it does, I'm out of there. 
A couple of years ago, I was living in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, at a small hostel on the outskirts of the city. The hostel catered to long-term guests, so I got to know everyone who lived there pretty well. Among the residents, there was a guy named Raj, and Raj served as a middleman of sorts in the local casinos. The casinos in the area were incredibly shady places filled with Russian mobsters and other low-life criminals from China and India. While the casinos were technically illegal, they managed to continue their operations through bribery and government coercion. I visited one of them once, and it was a surreal experience. Now, my friend Raj's job was to take online bets from Indian clients and then place those bets physically in the casino. Essentially, he played with their money and acted as the intermediary, allowing individuals to play from another location. He participated in some high-stakes games, handling large sums of money for some powerful people. It was a recipe for disaster waiting to happen. One night, Raj messed up big time. One of his clients managed to gain access to his online system and stole all the money his other clients had deposited to play with. The amount stolen was significant, with some losing well over $50,000, a fortune in this area. We only found out about the theft after Raj's sudden disappearance, and we discovered a cryptic note left in his bed, saying, It's sad, don't look for me, I'm leaving. Among other things, the guy had vanished overnight. We filed a police report and waited to hear anything. After a few days, the police returned to the hostel, asking if someone who knew Raj could join them. The locals in the hostel were afraid to go with the police, so I volunteered. They took me to their headquarters, leading me to the back where I was shown photos of a body cut into pieces. It was Raj, brutally dismembered and dumped into the nearby sewer canal by an unknown assailant. They brought me there to identify the body, but they never found out who was responsible for this gruesome act. The images from those photos have haunted me, and I'll never forget them. I left the hostel shortly afterward. Raj might have been involved in some shady activities, but he didn't deserve such a gruesome fate. Don't forget to like the video. Thank you for your support. I work as a baker for a small bakery in a tourist town. I'm regularly at work around midnight most nights. I'm pretty close to the local strip of bars and clubs, so I hear late night party goers, sirens a few times a night, and people yelling. That kind of stuff. The weirdest story, which started out creepy but didn't end that way, was when I opened the door around 4am to someone knocking. The only reason I opened the door is because my boss had literally just texted me, saying we might be getting an early delivery, so I thought it was that. I opened the door, and no one's there. I glanced around, thinking they knocked and ran back to their truck to start unloading. Then suddenly, someone steps out of the shadows, looking like Slender Man. I panic but hold it together pretty well. Once they got out of the shadows, it obviously wasn't a monster. It was just a tall, skinny girl with no pants on, no shoes, and a shirt that obviously wasn't hers. This poor girl then asks me if she can borrow a phone. It clicks in my mind what could have happened, and I tell her to come in. I let her use my phone. She tries to call her boyfriend and tells me that essentially she just woke up after passing out. She didn't know where she was, and I was the only light on the street. I didn't ask what happened to her, but she was saying something about pulling a firearm earlier and was hyperventilating over the cops being called on her, so I didn't call them. Her boyfriend never answered the phone, but I helped her figure out where her hotel was. Luckily, it was on the same block we were already on. I couldn't leave to walk with her or drive because I had a million things in the oven. I actually gave her my phone with the place pulled up on Google Maps and the flashlight on. She walked there, made it back okay, showered, took a nap, and brought me back my phone later in the morning. She hugged me twice and thanked me profusely, and I'm just sitting there like, damn, I didn't think I was getting my phone back. But I'm glad it worked out okay. I don't know if she was assaulted or just the type to strip when drunk or what, but she seemed okay after having been back to her hotel room. It could have gone a lot worse for her, so I'm glad I was the door she knocked on. God, did she give me a heart attack at first? 
A few years back while I was doing any work I could get, I took up this gig at the 24-7 Walmart. It was a bit more rundown than your typical Walmart. Dimly lit aisles, flickering fluorescent lights, and an eeriness that only an empty Walmart at 3 in the morning can provide. So picture this, I'm stocking shelves in the cereal aisle, just trying to keep myself awake with the monotonous routine. And then, out of nowhere, this guy saunters in. He's tall, I mean basketball player tall, with long strides that make him seem like he's on some sort of mission. There's hardly anyone around, and this dude's pacing down the aisles like he owns the place. Kind of weird, but not out of the ordinary Walmart weird. Just a late night shopper with a peculiar vibe. I'm busy stacking cereal boxes when I catch sight of him again. He's standing at the end of the aisle, staring at me with this grin that could send shivers down your spine. The lighting's wonky, casting these creepy shadows that don't help my nerves. Before I can even process what's happening, he's right there, right in front of me. Close enough that I can smell the alcohol on his breath. He shoots me this look, like he's got the juiciest secret in the world, and then he says, I've done something very naughty. What the hell? I try to laugh it off, brush it away with a nervous chuckle. But he's not having it. He keeps staring, that grin still plastered on his face. It's late, it's quiet, and the place is kind of creepy already. But this guy, he's turned it up to ten. He starts following me, aisle after aisle. Every time I turn around, there he is, watching and grinning. It's like he's playing a twisted game of hide and seek, and I'm not even a player. More like the unwilling target. I try to go about my work, but I can feel his eyes on me, like they're drilling holes into my back. Then, out of nowhere, he starts humming this tune. It's faint, just under his breath, but it's off-putting as hell. I can't put my finger on where I've heard it before, but it's that famously creepy whistling song. I decide to take a breather and head to the break room. Maybe I can shake him off and catch a few moments of normalcy. My co-worker's in there, and we're shooting the breeze about assignments and exams, trying to keep things light. But the whole time, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. And guess what? I was right. I spot him at the entrance to the break room, just standing there, staring right at me. I freeze, and I swear the room got colder in that moment. I point him out to my coworker, and when he turns around, the guy's vanished. I glance at my coworker, I couldn't read his expression. I ask him, did you see that? He looks at me, the confusion is obvious in his eyes. See what? Clearly he saw nothing. I realize that he missed the entire encounter. It was only me who saw him. I run my fingers through my hair, feeling a mixture of paranoia and frustration. Never mind, I mutter, dismissing the topic. Maybe I'm just letting my imagination get the best of me. It was late and I'd not slept properly in days. My coworker's not as intrigued as I am. He's focused on the task at hand, more interested in getting his work done than in delving into whatever nonsense I was talking about. We head back to our posts, and I'm still rattled. I can't shake the image of that guy's grin. Hours pass, and I try my best to concentrate on my tasks, but the unease is a constant presence in the back of my mind. I keep glancing around, half expecting him to reappear. That creepy grin plastered on his face. And then, out of nowhere, he's back. My heart skips a beat, and my hands tremble. It's like a nightmare come true. He's standing there, that same grin on his face. My breath catches in my throat. Before I can even react, he's sprinting towards me, his steps quick and purposeful. Panic surges through me, and I freeze. What does he want? My mind races, but my body is paralyzed. He grabs me and easily picks me up. He starts shaking me and shouting in my face. And then, as if from a distance, I hear a shout. My coworker's voice cuts through the fear. Hey, what's going on? He's running towards us, his footsteps echoing in the aisle. 
The guy releases his grip on me, his attention shifting to my coworker. And in that split second, I find my voice. I scream as loud as I can and start beating on the guy. My coworker arrives, his presence enough to make the guy hesitate. He turns and bolts, disappearing down the aisle. I'm left shaking, my heart pounding. My coworker rushes to my side, he looks seriously concerned. Are you okay? He asks me. I nod, I'm completely out of breath from the screaming. We're both shaken, both trying to make sense of the madness that just unfolded. We call the police, and as we wait for them to arrive, I can't help but replay the encounter in my mind. What was that guy's deal? Why did he attack me? The police arrive and we recount the bizarre events. They search the area, but the guy is long gone. I tell him what happened and try to describe just how creepy and weird he was, and I mention that he said he'd done something naughty that night. Suddenly there's like four more cop cars pulling up, and they're taking this real seriously. My manager sent me home for the night and told me I didn't have to come in tomorrow. I checked the news the next day and saw that there had been a hit and run nearby with a suspected drunk driver killing a family of three. The description of the suspect was almost exactly the same as the guy who attacked me. What the hell was this guy's problem? As far as I know, they never found him. I check the news occasionally just to see if he comes up, but I've not seen anything since. I've worked a few random jobs in my life. My first one was a summer job at 16, during summer break at a dairy farm. I absolutely hated it there and it made it harder for me to find the motivation to even try finding work again when the time came. I don't really remember how I was first referred to the job, but the following summer, I ended up working as an office assistant for a self-employed photographer. My parents knew her because she used to be a member of their church, and my sister attended her 4-H program when she had it. By that time, her health had begun to take a hit, as she claimed it was a mixture of things from chronic Lyme to fibromyalgia. I had also been warned by my parents that she was a little off. She was very religious and claimed to have had real encounters with demons, even participated in some exorcisms. I'm an atheist and a skeptic, so I never took her stories seriously. Aside from the weird things she would tell me, she was mostly harmless and working for her was not very hard. The job basically required me to do a lot of data entry, as well as help prep her photos with some minor editing. She would also make me at her company watermark before uploading them. They'd end up on a site where her customers could browse them, and then pick which ones they wanted to order. She primarily photographed horse events, dressage, stadium and cross-country jumping, etc., and for the first several months my job was in her living room, which was basically my office space at the time. Eventually, I was talked into tagging along at shows where she trained me as a photographer, and soon I was shooting at the events along with her. It was boring work, I won't lie. I'm not a horse person. But things didn't get weird until a year later when I learned the hard way it was not her that I needed to worry about. She had two sons. One who was out of state the other who was in the Navy. The latter of the two, a guy called Nathan, I had only heard small things about. He was somewhere on the autism spectrum, but she was never clear on what exactly his diagnosis was. When he finally returned home and I met him for the first time while working in her living room, he seemed like a nice guy. A little odd, but not concerning. He was obsessed with movies, and being a bit of a movie buff myself, Whenever he would venture to the living room to strike up a conversation, it would almost always be about whatever movies we were into or were excited to watch. I should point out here that I was 18 and he was in his mid-30s. At some point, he got it in his head that I was interested in him, though he never said anything directly to me. I had to find out about it from my parents. My mom worked as the secretary at the church and Nathan somehow found out. I can only guess my boss had told him. One afternoon, Nathan showed up at my mom's desk and started gushing about his feelings. He talked about how much fun I was, how he loved talking to me, how he was planning to take me to the movies and take me to his church, and all these other plans he had for me. My mom was beyond uncomfortable, 
as was the pastor who happened to overhear it. And when I got home that night, she told me what had happened and suggested I make sure not to leave him on. I was completely baffled because I hadn't done anything. We'd never even discussed the possibility of doing anything together. I got even more uncomfortable around him over the next few weeks. I made an effort to acknowledge him less when he was around and keep the conversation short while stressing I had to do work. Eventually he got his own place and moved out of his parents' house, so I figured the problem had solved itself. A couple years later, I had moved out, my boss's company had closed, and I was working somewhere else. I was friends with both my boss and Nathan on Facebook, and around that time I was finally coming out as an atheist, something I couldn't do while I was still living at home. One night, my old boss messaged me, asking about a ring I had on my finger. It was a black ring with a white solid star in the middle of a black circle. Already knowing where she was going with this, I told her it was just a ring. She started accusing me of wearing a pentagram because she didn't know what a pentacle was and that I was promoting Satan. I tried several times to explain to her that not only was it not that symbol but that also paganism has nothing to do with the devil anyways, but she refused to listen so I just ignored her. It was typical behavior of her and not worth the argument. The next morning, I had a message from Nathan telling me I needed to come to his church with him. I told him no, and the messages I received back gradually grew angrier and angrier. He went from asking to demanding I go with him. He told me I was lost and that I would not find the answers I needed by living the life I was. Eventually he outright said he thought the fact that I was wearing a pentagram was disgusting and that I was opening myself up for possession. Knowing there would be even less of a point in arguing with him than there was with his mother, I went ahead and blocked both of them, deciding I was done with it all. Then he started showing up at my workplace. He would always search through the store until he found me, and then once he did, he would corner me and not stop talking to me no matter how many times I tried to dodge him or tell him I needed to get back to work. Eventually the managers caught on and started intercepting him whenever he showed up. I wasn't making enough to pay the rent with that job so I had to take up a second one. Within a week of working my second job, which was in a different town, he started showing up there. This time I told the managers who he was, and after that, every time he showed up, I was allowed to hide in the back room behind a locked door while they sped his order along and got him out. One of those many encounters, while I was hiding in the back, one of the managers was back there with me, inputting employee time punches into the computer when the both of us heard Nathan shout in our direction. I know you remember me. That was the last straw for them, and they told him his business was no longer welcome there. He stopped showing up at my other job as well for a while. Fast forward to a few years later, I was getting used to not having to look over my shoulder every shift or check the parking lot for his truck. Then one day, he reappeared. He was browsing a section I was walking past when he spotted me and got this deer in the headlights look. I made a beeline to the break room because just seeing him made me scared. After that, he started showing up regularly. I would always find ways to dodge and avoid him, but he would still eventually spot me and know I was still there. I was debating whether or not to tell the managers because at this point it had been a while since he had done anything and saying something just because I was nervous didn't feel right. Call me a coward or an idiot, but that was my thought process. What happened next made me regret not speaking up. It was bound to happen eventually, but one night he managed to catch me while I was at the customer service desk. He approached me and said hi, and I immediately started to look for someone to signal over so I could make a break for it. But before I could say a word, he said something that made me feel sick. How's your little girl doing? She's three, right? I looked at him, horrified. I had him completely blocked from all of my social media, I had his number blocked, I was living at a new address, and I had not seen or spoken to his mother since she confronted me about my ring. I had not told either of them I was a parent now, or that I was married, and I was not friends with anyone who knew them. How's your husband doing? He's good. He's a good man, I said, trying to reinforce the idea that I was not available to him and that I had no desire to have anything to do with him. Really? 
Where does he work? At this point, I felt like I was going to pass out. Thankfully, another employee approached, and I got the hell out of there. As I was leaving, he called out behind me. I'll see you again. We'll talk. We'll go out and do something together. We will. I reported him to the managers, telling them everything about the encounter, including all the information that he should not have had. They were able to pull up his face on CCTV, and while I have not heard anything, I'm guessing one of them finally managed to approach him because I haven't seen him since. This has been going on for 10 years and I want it to finally be over. If he shows up again, I'm going to the police, but I'm seriously hoping it never comes to that. I just want him to stop. I haven't seen him since the incident with my managers. I think he may have gotten scared off. Turned out one of my coworkers used to work with him too at a different job and she also made a complaint about him to the managers. I don't know what they did with that information afterwards, but I know he hasn't shown up since. It sounds like they plan to call the cops if he sets foot in the store again. With two employee complaints of stalker-like behavior, they refuse to ignore that. In 2002, I was 14 years old, starting freshman year. I was an awkward nerdy girl that didn't know how to handle attention from boys, so you could say I made things worse for my situation. I had a knack for making friends with the weird people no one liked, but I tried to be friendly with everyone I met so it wasn't a big deal to me. Unfortunately, that was also my downfall. Clubs were a big deal, and they actually had an anime club, so of course I was all about that. First club meeting, I sat next to a couple of friends and soaked it all up. I thought I was finally with my people. Then here comes Stalker Kid. I'd use his real name, but to this day I have no clue what it is. He sat in front of me, and being that person I said hi. I could tell he was uncomfortable and didn't know anyone so I was just being nice. And boy did this guy cling to me for that one word. At first, he would just find me during lunch and just stand there mumbling things to me. He had such a soft voice, high-pitched, mousy little guy that you just felt unnerved when he spoke to you. The way he would look at you as he spoke, I could never look him in the eyes. After a while, it became more asking about my personal life and what I was into. Me being dumb and naive, I tried to be friendly and chat while feeling incredibly uncomfortable. After a while, me and my friends would move to different tables, benches, even always to avoid him, but he always found me. After about a year of this, my best friend finally told me that if I didn't tell him to F off, he would. I really didn't want him around anymore, so, sure, go ahead. So one day during lunch, here comes Stalker Kid with his signature greeting. Barely above a whisper. Hey Nancy. My buddy just goes, dude, she's not interested, F off. Looking hurt, he shuffled away. I was like, man you didn't have to be so hard on him, but thanks. I didn't see him much around school after that except for club days where he would just sit across the room and stare at me while my best friend glared at him. Cut to me being 16 and now driving to school. Minus the awkward club days, I didn't really notice anything from him. That is until an old gray beat-up car started parking next to me, extremely close. One day after school, he was waiting for me in that car. He started asking me how I've been, talking about prom, and all that stuff. I was trying to rack my brain on how he knew that was my car, unless he had been watching me before and after school. I started getting there later and leaving later to avoid him, because he was like clockwork. Finally, a boy I used to be friends with in elementary school was walking out with me and made a comment about how that guy is always next to my car and asked if he was my boyfriend. I immediately said no, and he's always following me around, and I hated it. It was really starting to freak me out. Bless this guy, because he walked right up to him and scared him off, threatening if he ever parked near me again he would kick his ass. I figured maybe that was enough to keep him away. So again, there was a small space where I would hear nothing of him except for my friends who had classes with him telling me how creepy he was. One friend had our class with him and said he would draw naked women constantly in his books. Junior year is wrapping up, 
and I started giving my best friend Jack lifts to school. He was on my way, so I figured why not. At some point, Jack started noticing that little gray car was always heading the same way after school and made a joke about stalker kid living next to him. Small world, right? I could only be so lucky. One day, as per usual, little gray car was following us, so we took a detour. Sure enough, he was with us every step of the way, and it was no longer a joke. We both started freaking out. I pushed the gas pedal as hard as my foot could push it and got the hell out of sight. A few other things happened. In order to get into prom, he had to ask someone from my ear. So he asked some random girl from my softball team and then dumped her as soon as he got in. He then followed me all night. This includes to the after prom, where I had to avoid him the whole time. Our high school had a TV channel for kids to run, and during prom they would record the whole night. It took one of my friends to point it out, but throughout the whole video, it showed him behind me and following and staring at me all night. I didn't even realize. And the one that still creeps me out to this day is graduation for his class. I was scanning the crowd to see my friends who were graduating when I saw a hand wave as I passed by. I looked back, and of course it was stalker kid waving at me. How he picked me out of a crows of thousands I will never know. 2006 senior year was great, no signs of creepy stalker kid, to the point where I kind of forget about him. I graduate, I choose a college in town, get a job at a local retail store and move on. Life was beginning to be normal. I work the gaming department, so you get the weird guys once in a while. One that I saw a lot was this little Mexican guy with glasses, who never purchased anything but would just walk around from time to time. Then, stalker kid comes strolling in the doors and walks into gaming and just talks. I ask how he knew I worked here. He says his friend saw me and knew we were friends. I tried to radio for help for someone to come and get him out. Finally, a big guy from computers walks by and asks for my help in the back. Once he pulls me to safety, I tell him everything. From that point, security is aware and is told to watch for this guy. Of course he wasn't doing anything physical so all they could do for me is watch out for him. So every time he came in, they would tell me and I would dip back to the warehouse. I started seeing his friend, who he called Ninja, constantly, and all he ever did was walk around on his phone. I began to suspect he was texting stalker kid to tell him I was at work, because sure enough, ten minutes later, he would come in. So I tested this theory and started walking randomly around the store. At one point, a friend who worked register asked why I would do this, so I had her take a walk with me on her break. I told her this ninja guy would follow us everywhere, even just going down a random aisle. Sure enough, he did, and she began freaking out. A few minutes later, I told her, my stalker would walk through those doors. So I'm making my way to the warehouse, and out steps ninja guy from an aisle and he shouts, she's right here. I just stared at him, like, what the hell do you think you're doing? Stalker kid walks up behind me and asks why I'm always running away from him and says that he lost my number and asks if I can give it to him again. I say sure, knowing damn well that I never gave it to him. I go to the warehouse to get a pen and paper. I wrote down, this is where I work, don't ever come here again, and handed it to him. I told him and his friend to leave and called for security, who walked him out. Security tells me later that he also cried while they took him out. Later that day, as I'm leaving work, security offers to walk me to my car. I say sure. Stalker kid is out by my car waiting for me, so this is where security says he's not having it, and calls the police, which we are conveniently next to their headquarters. He books it when he sees the car. Few years go by, nothing comes up. I buy a fancy new car, and don't see him much. I'm thinking that did the trick, and I'm finally free. 2012, my buddies and I are leaving work, ready to hit the night at the bar, per usual. We are all walking out the door, where we all have to stand and wait to hear the alarm sound to verify it's armed. As we are walking out, I hear it. That awful sound. Hey Nancy. I cringe, 
grab my friend's arm and turn. There he is leaning on his car, waiting. My friend recognizes him and asks what he wants. Guy says he just wants to talk to me. He said he did never see my car so he didn't think I worked here anymore. His other friend is sitting in the back seat of his car just staring at me blankly. I start to think the worst. If my friends leave me here, something tells me I'm not coming into work the next day. Or ever. I'm terrified that he's had years of time to think about our last encounter where I wrote my number down and made him cry. I grab my friend's arm tighter. My friend kicks off, pretends to be my boyfriend and rips into him. My friend is about two feet taller and much bigger. They get into it, and I'm just standing in the parking lot and I'm just begging for my friend to kick his ass. He spooks stalker kids so bad that I'm pretty sure he pissed himself before getting in his car and booking it. Ever since, if he comes into the store, my friend stares him down from his office. Years later, I've moved on, gotten married, and moved out of town. Recently we've moved back to start a business, and to this day, I still feel myself looking behind me at stores on the off chance that I randomly bump into him. He caused me to have anxiety, mental and emotional pain, fear and trust issues for a decade. Even after moving on, I still feel the effects today. And I never even knew his name. I'll begin by giving a little background. At the time this happened, I was a 16-year-old girl working at a chain coffee place while in high school. I am 19 now, and in college, 7 hours away from this place. This happened at a time in my life in which I was super shy, and had a tough time standing up for myself. In retrospect I could have handled it a lot better. I used to work closing shifts with my best friend after school, it'd be from like 3 to 10 PM. We worked at a relatively dead store, so we spent most of our time playing music and talking. We did our duties like taking the trash out and restocking etc, although both of us always dreaded taking the trash out, as we had to go out back. The dumpsters were behind the store, in a dimly lit area, next to a sketchy liquor store. One night a man came in pretty late, it wasn't unusual to have customers come near closing, it was just uncommon to see anyone we didn't already know. Our store was mostly just regulars. He was lanky, and probably around 30. I mostly just remember his eyes. They were piercing, the type that never break a stare. I remember initially thinking he was attractive, yikes. The way he spoke was short and concise, just ordering a small hot latte. I made his order and that was it. I told my friend about how I thought he was attractive, and we then started referring to him as the small hot latte guy. We always call people by their drink orders. He came a bunch of times after that. Each time staying a little longer and longer, talking a little more and more. One day he came with a woman, presumably his girlfriend. I remember I felt a little weird, like she was staring at me, or like they had spoken about me beforehand. She glanced over at him and said, Wow, she is pretty. I didn't think much of it, said thank you, serve them, and I thought that would be the end of it. He then began showing up and talking to me a lot without her. He started off as being friendly, I honestly don't even know what we talk about. Then he got kind of flirty. Initially I was just flattered but being underage and immature, I didn't even think about the fact that it was kind of alarming. He began to stay for a while. Sometimes he would bring a laptop or a notebook. I could feel him staring at me and listening to our conversations. But at that point I wasn't getting creepy vibes from him as my coworker and I had dealt with our fair share of creeps. He began by just giving little snacks or drinks. I would accept, but would never eat or drink them. It wasn't that I necessarily thought he had ill intentions, I just had a hard time accepting gifts. I remember one night he brought me a book about one of his favorite artists. I reluctantly took it but had tried to decline before. I remember telling him about one of my favorite musicians and sent him a link to a performance I really liked. He started being kind of sexual while still talking about the song. He then began talking super suggestively and I would laugh it off and decline when he asked to send pictures. 
I began talking less and less and told my friend about the situation. She agreed that it was getting creepy and said I should maybe change my schedule. I told her I'd be fine, I'm stubborn. He'd still come every week at closing time and he'd even stay in his car till we closed. Meaning he'd watch me go to the back to take the trash out. It was time to take out the trash and lock up, so we got ourselves together. I was opening the door while juggling like three bags of trash and saw something on the ground. I was confused at first but then realized what I saw. It was flowers and a note. I felt sick to my stomach and looked around the parking lot. I didn't see his car. I threw them away immediately and told my friend I didn't want to read the note. She read it and told me I had to. It was something to the effect of. I've never felt so connected to someone. You're breaking my heart. Please don't do this. I'm sorry. Looking back, I honestly didn't lead him on, but initially I felt as if I was in the wrong. Nonetheless, we turned the corner to take the trash out and both prayed the parking lot was empty. It was not. Let's just say the trash was not going to get taken out that night. I continued working there and still worked there on my breaks from college. I had different hours after that. Nothing happened for some time until one day he appeared again. Just before I was supposed to leave for college. It was around 3 p.m. It was busy, he came in, stared at me, and then he left. That was the last time I saw him. Looking back I was so naive and could have handled the situation so much better. I am forever thankful to my friend, she really supported me that whole time. A year ago, I used to post my entire life to Snapchat. It was my go-to app for sharing bits of my life with friends and family. But then something happened that made me reconsider my online presence. One day, out of the blue, I received a friend request from an unfamiliar username. I didn't think much of it at the time and accepted the request without a second thought. It was just another random person, or so I assumed. Months passed, and I forgot about that peculiar friend request. My life went on, and I continued sharing snippets of my daily activities on Snapchat. Little did I know that someone was watching, very closely. It started innocently enough, with an unexpected snap. I opened it, thinking it was probably a friend sharing a funny meme or a cute pet photo. But as the image loaded, my heart almost stopped. It was an eerie, edited version of an old Snapchat story I had posted months ago. Floating love hearts surrounded the image, and the caption read, Can't wait to see you. The chill running down my spine was hard to ignore. How did someone get access to my old stories? Who was behind this? Days turned into weeks, and more edited snaps kept arriving. Each one featured pictures taken from my past stories. The captions became increasingly unsettling, referring to my personal life. How was your McDonald's on Friday? And another said, I love that movie you watched last night. The sense of being watched was inescapable. I felt exposed and vulnerable, as though a stranger had invaded my privacy. It wasn't long before I decided to check Snap Maps, the feature that lets you see the real-time locations of your friends. My heart raced as I zoomed in on the map. There it was, a bit too close for comfort, the location of this creep. He was nearby, and the thought sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was no ordinary prank or trolling. It felt personal, like someone was playing mind games with me. Fear gripped me as I realized the mysterious friend was getting closer to my location. I knew I had to act fast. I began taking screenshots of the disturbing snaps for evidence. Then, I contacted the local authorities and reported the unsettling situation. The investigation that followed uncovered the identity of the creep. To my shock, it turned out to be someone I met at a party months ago. I'd been warned about how creepy and weird he was. He would just invite himself to parties and nobody wanted to be rude and kick him out, so we just tolerated him. To be fair, I had no issue with him and spoke with him a little bit throughout the night, but didn't see much of him. I guess being nice to the social outcast when everyone else kept him at arm's length was enough for him to become obsessed with me. 
They didn't end up charging him with anything, but they told him to leave me alone and explain to me that I could get a restraining order, but I didn't see the point. This happened a couple of months ago, December of last year. I started working a new job in the mall and had to work for most of Boxing Day. I was done at 10 and transit seemed to have ended at 7. I'm a student who didn't go home for the holidays due to this job and never had to deal with holiday transit hours. I decided to call an Uber and the driver picked me up right in front of the mall. We had a casual conversation during the drive back and he learned about where I worked and how I'm living on my own for the time being since my roommates went to their hometowns. Fast forward to the next day at work, around 6 p.m. This driver walks into the store and tries to strike a conversation with me, but I told him I had to get back to work. He also asked if we could hang out later, to which I said no, and he left. At the end of that shift, I walked out of the store, planning to take transit. As soon as I stepped out of the store, the driver immediately pulled up next to me and offered to give me a free ride back home. After going back and forth with me declining and him saying it's free, I decided to walk away and caught a bus home. I was pretty overwhelmed by the fact that he showed up to my workplace and waited three hours until I was done with work to offer me a ride home. I've reported this to Uber and they notified me that they suspended this driver, provided me with a full refund and gave me a link to provide to the police if I plan on filing a report. Silly of me to give away information like that to a stranger, but I hope to never meet that driver again. He was about twice my age, he knows where my home is, and my name. Lesson learned. To preface this, I love to drive. I've loved to go on drives for hours to nowhere, with no destination in mind, just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventually cities. And I'd usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license five years ago, and I've never once had any sort of issue, nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was, until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort personal issues out. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a means of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and I'm in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a cluster of personal issues I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend. I couldn't focus on anything else and decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and to not be gone for too long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life, so I decided to drive further north down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend. I kept driving and was just admiring the vast empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight in seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses miles back from the road were lightless and the dead cornfields withered away, snow started to cover them entirely. It was like something out of a horror movie and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. 
That roundabout was still maybe 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about, right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder while the rest was jutted onto the road, like they had to pull over in a hurry but didn't quite manage to do that. The driver's side door was flung wide open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it towards the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. In this part of the country, cell phone reception is pretty bad most of the time. But more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside, with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds, and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was still a small part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in that vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic at night, and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly, and as I approached the vehicle I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music, and called out. Hey! Anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything I would leave, and the moment there was reception I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I'd figure out my next course of action then. So, again I shout, Hey! What happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a while, and then I heard rustling in the shadows of the trees, followed by a rough voice responding to me. I was relieved at first, and was about to say something in response or possibly even stop my car and get out, when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rear view mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan and they were making their way towards my car, fast. The person didn't have any blood on them, nor did they appear injured in any way, and they were wearing a mask, not like a face mask for COVID, or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies. And they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was, I couldn't get a good look, but from its length and shape my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas as soon as I noticed those things, and drove like a bat straight out of hell. My heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow Chase or if they had stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, Troy, who was a police officer to tell him what happened. 
he was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, etc., he told me since it was out of city limits he couldn't do much on his end. But he could get in contact with the local police or sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through my hysterical sobs I managed to tell him what happened, not even ten minutes ago. He was, as you could imagine, really concerned for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with him until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement and they assured me they would go back to the spot to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who did it. But with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate number, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking me if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident I haven't heard back from police about whether or not they have any leads and I'm not sure they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Was that blood on the inside of the car, or just a ruse to get more attention? If it was really blood, did they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I had stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives, and I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. If you're enjoying the video so far, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. It all started with a normal day at work. I worked at a small grocery store at the time and my duties consisted of gathering shopping carts in the parking lot and bagging groceries, the usual minimum wage stuff. It was rainy that morning and of course, I was assigned to carts. About two hours into my shift I saw a man rushing to get his groceries into the car. I ran over to him and started helping him with his bags. Mind if I help you get out of the rain? Yes. Thank you so much. As he was closing his trunk he looked at me with a very surprised look on his face. He lowered his eyebrows, skinned me from head to toe, and smirked. Are you a new hire? No. I've been here for a couple of months. Oh, you are very pretty, he said in a weirdly sensual tone. Thank you. Have a good day. I shut it down. I was not interested. As I was walking back to the store to hide until he left, I could feel him watching me while I walked away. Nevertheless, I continued to work, not really thinking about it. After my lunch, I was at the register bagging groceries and I noticed that same man from earlier walk in. I pretended I didn't see him and just kept bagging. He came up to the register and got a single chocolate bar. I didn't give him a bag. He stands towering over me and says, Are you going to bag my item? Oh sorry, I didn't know you wanted a bag for one thing. I put his chocolate bar in a bag and told him to have a good day. When are you off work, sweetheart? Ah, man, I'm not comfortable giving that information out. He returned with, That's okay, you've been here, what, five hours? You probably get off around seven, right? He smiled, winked at me, and walked away. Disgusted, I went to my manager and told her what happened. She told me not to work the lot anymore and to ask someone to walk me to my car. So by the end of my shift, I had a male coworker walk me to my truck and we scanned the parking lot, looking for this man's car. We didn't see him so my coworker went back inside and I started my truck. I called my mom to tell her about what happened and once she answered I left the parking lot. Literally, 
The second I turned onto the road, I saw his car pull onto the road behind me. I told my mom I thought he was going to follow me and she just told me to drive around to try and lose him. I drove around for about 20 minutes just going in circles around my town. I hit a red light and he pulled up next to me and started yelling something to me on his open window. I, of course, pretended he wasn't there but I could still hear what he was saying. You would bear some good kids for me. You'd make a great slave for me, little lady. He then started being very explicit about what he was going to do to me if he caught me. I told my mom I was going to dial 911 and if I wasn't home in an hour then call the police. While I was trying to call the cops, the man speeds ahead of my truck and starts brake checking me. Frantic, I wait for the closest intersection and turn up the block. My phone fell under my seat while I was turning so I decided to go to the nearest open establishment and run in and hide and have someone else call for help. The closest open business I could find was a convenience store at a gas station. I pulled in, parked, and ran for my life into the store. I told the clerk what's happening and she took me to the break room and locked me in there. While processing that I might have survived this ordeal, I hear the doors of the storefront start violently rattling, and before I knew it the clerk was locking herself in the break room with me. She was on the phone with the police and they were on their way. We were silent. Cowering in a dark room, I found myself feeling guilty for wrapping another woman into our worst fear. My thoughts were racing through I said to him, did I lead him on? I just told him to have a good day. Has he been following me for longer than tonight? How did he know what car I drive? Are the police going to get here in time? Are we going to die? Finally, the small room was illuminated with red and blue lights from the crack under the door. We hear a voice over the intercom telling us it's safe to come out. Whilst shaking, the clerk took out our keys and opened the door, so we walked out and gave our statements. After the police leave, I turned to my unexpected savior and profusely thanked her. We cry, hug, and she walks me to my car. The next night I went back and brought her some food and an Amazon gift card. I have been in a near-fatal car accident, 10 feet away from a mountain lion in the wild, but I can tell you, with total honesty, I thought that was the end of my line. Thank you for reading, stay aware, be cautious, stay safe. This encounter would have happened a little over 10 years ago. I would have been about 26 at the time. I can't remember exactly what year this was, but it was around 2012. At the time, I was frequently going out with my friends to bars and parties and hanging out until pretty late most weekends. The friend's house that I usually hung out at was on a side street just off a main road where a lot of popular and crowded bars and restaurants were. You had to park on the street at his house, and during the weekend when it was busy, it was pretty common to have to park a number of blocks away. The street closer to the bars was pretty nice, but if you went a few blocks in the opposite direction, it got a little sketchier at night. After a night of hanging out, I had to walk back to my car pretty late, which was parked a number of blocks away towards the slightly sketchier area. This was during the winter so I was wearing some kind of heavy sweater or pullover and beanie hat. This detail is only important as you couldn't really gather much idea about what I looked like from a distance in the dark aside from my general height and build. There wasn't much through traffic as you got further away from the bars and the roads were pretty dark without any street lights. As I was walking down the sidewalk, a car started slowly creeping down the street, matching my pace as it pulled up beside me and then stopped. The window of the car rolled down, and driving the car was an attractive young woman who said that I looked cold and that I should let her give me a ride to where I was going. She seemed very friendly. I indicated that I wasn't parked far away and appreciated the offer, but was going to just keep walking. She then tried really hard to convince me to get in the car with her, since it was so cold. No small talk to establish any information about me to make sure I wasn't a weirdo, just asking me to get in the car pretty aggressively. Based on what I was wearing and how dark it was, there was no way she really could have had much idea about what I actually looked like to possibly find me attractive, 
and even if she did, I don't know many women who would pick up a male stranger after midnight when they're alone in their car. There were about 10 bars nearby she could have gone to if she just wanted to pick up a guy. There was no reason I could think of that she would have to resort to driving around offering to pick up strangers. She continued to drive alongside me and offered me a ride again, which I declined and kept going. I picked up my pace and she eventually drove off. As soon as she was a few blocks away, I quickly got to my car and made sure there was nobody lurking around or close by. The whole scenario felt off and didn't make sense to me. I asked my friends about it later and all of the women agreed they wouldn't offer a random guy a ride, especially at night time in that kind of scenario, even if the guy looked like Ryan Gosling or Channing Tatum. My suspicion is that there was someone laid down in the back seat of the car out of view with a weapon waiting to rob anyone who accepted the ride. I couldn't really figure out any reason she would be offering rides like that to complete strangers in the middle of the night, as it would be very unsafe for her to just pick up random strangers. I just assumed there had to be something nefarious going on in that car, and I do wonder what would have happened if anyone just hopped in the car with her. I hope you're enjoying the stories so far. Thank you for supporting the channel. Back when I was 18 years old, I was house-sitting with a girl I was studying with. The family we were house-sitting for went to the same church as her, but I didn't really know them well myself. It was more a keeper company in a huge house. This was 1997 when the average teen like me didn't have a cell phone. During that week, there was a short break in the school calendar, which is why this family was away, and why the streets in the area were quieter than usual. My apartment as well as the house we sat for was not far from the university. My apartment was actually a three-minute walk from it, and the house a further five minutes by car. So being a student neighborhood it was particularly quiet this week. The first weird thing that happened during the week I was at this house was that I dreamed I was driving through a dark forest on a hilly dirt road with no lights anywhere except for those from my car's headlights. As I started to go down a hill, the headlights suddenly cut out and everything went dark. The car slowed down to a stop and died. I woke up. In the morning I went out to my car and it wouldn't start. It had been working perfectly the day before. I had to call a guy to come fix it. It was the starter motor. Well, that was the first creepy thing that happened that week. About a day later, it was Friday. I planned on driving back home to my parents who lived in a smaller town about 45 minutes away. I packed up my stuff at the big house and was going to head over to my apartment to collect whatever else I needed for the weekend. That trip between the house and apartment was, as I mentioned, only five minutes or so away. Since it was winter it was dark by the time I left at around 7 p.m. As I was driving from the house I noticed in my rear view mirror the headlights of the car behind me tailing me really close. Whenever I would turn, it would also turn. Back then I was cautious, but not overly so. Cautious enough to notice in such a short distance that something weird was going on behind me. But then when I pulled up to a traffic light it wasn't there anymore. Relief. Short-lived. The car was now beside me. I looked to my right and there was a man inside. Alone. Smiling at me. Looking like a maniac. For a moment I thought... Geez, I should really drive with a beanie on at night so people can't see that I'm a petite 5 foot 2 female with long blonde hair down to my waist. I also thought, well he's in the lane to turn right so I'm good. I pulled off and the headlights were behind me again. What an ass, I thought. Who drives like that? Thank goodness my turn is coming up on the left soon. After another minute or two of this tailgating I slowed down, strategically didn't indicate, and made a sudden sharp left into my driveway, opened the automatic gates and shot inside. The gates closed behind me. I gave out a sigh of relief, thinking that the drama was over. 
I gathered a few things from the car to take up with me and noticed on my way over to the stairwell that there was a man at the gate that had just closed behind me. He was still on the other side and I was at the far end of the parking lot, but I could make out it was the dude from the tailgating car. He was jumping up, shaking the gate with absolute rage. Well, I was safely on this side so I wasn't completely gripped with fear. And besides, there was a group of students making a noise nearby arriving for a party or something. I headed to the stairs and started going from ground level to the first floor. Rounding the stairs on the first floor I noticed someone running across the parking lot towards the staircase. In hindsight, I still can't fathom why I didn't realize what had happened. I guess it's because I subconsciously knew that there was the group being led in through the pedestrian gate. As I was rounding the staircase between the second and third floors, someone suddenly touched me. I spun around. The guy. He had slipped in as part of the small crowd. He said something. I said something sassy back and told him to F off. Then I turned my back on him to continue up the stairs. I lived on the third floor. He grabbed me from behind and held my back against his chest with his left arm around my neck. I felt something being held against my right side. A oh, crap. A knife. He led me down. I remember thinking that the light was broken on the bottom level. This can't end well. But I was calm. I resisted slightly, and he tightened his grip. I felt like I wasn't getting enough oxygen. I started to become a dead weight. He started to drop me. I was groin level. I elbowed. It connected. He dropped me but spun around to face me. He ripped the front of my button down top. Then he stopped. He looked at someone behind me. Someone taller than him. His eyes went wide. He turned and ran. I screamed. Then I too turned around to see who had come to help. There was no one there, but people came out of their apartments after that. The police were called. This was the second time they were there that night. Turns out the other weird thing that happened was that my dad had already called the police and they had come past an hour before. My mom had had a weird feeling all evening and had hassled my dad endlessly that something bad was going to happen to me. She had been right. As it turned out, they caught him. I identified him in a lineup. He was a serial offender in the area. He was accused of assaulting something like 14 women. One had thrown herself out the first floor of her apartment to get away from him and broken her leg. Weeks later the police called me. Before his trial his cell door had been left open. He was gone. Apparently an inside job. I've had a few creepy things happen to me in my life, but this one still makes me think about how things could have gone wrong very quickly. I'm a 20 year old female, and this story takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana, in a seriously remote area. It was a weekend night, and my best friend and I were heading home after a graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to pick up her dog from her house so we could spend the night at my place. That's important later. We started heading into the rural countryside where I lived, and to get to my house, you had to travel down a long, narrow dirt road. About a mile in, we spotted a truck's headlights. As we got closer, we realized it was a nice truck, probably from around 2018. I can't say I know much about cars, so cut me some slack. The truck was parked sideways, blocking the entire path. Confused, I got out of the car and asked if the driver was okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first and said, I'm just waiting for a friend to come get me, my truck's stuck. He smiled at me, but I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He glanced back at my car, saw that I had someone with me, and noticed the dog sticking its head out the window. His smile quickly faded, and he remarked, Pit bulls are mean and nasty. With that, he turned around and got back in his truck. I returned to my friend and said, 
Put this in reverse and use whatever hood race skills you have to get us out of here. We reversed my poor 95 caddy, which really shouldn't have been driving on a dirt road, and made our way back to the main road, feeling relieved. We took a different route home. But then, to our surprise, the same guy was parked on that road, standing off to the side, smiling and staring into our headlights. We were on the verge of panicking and floored the gas pedal the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful I wasn't alone, being a pretty naive college girl at the time. Even though the presence of the pit bull probably saved us from that man, the dog actually ended up randomly snapping at my friend a few months later, causing her serious injuries. It had been a good dog its entire life, and I know she was a good owner, so I guess it's just an instinct thing with pit bulls. They can snap at any moment. Please leave a like and a comment if you haven't already. What was your favorite story? A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even seven yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up some time later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright, I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footsteps as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. 
From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be placed in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assumed an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pen, which the police said people often use to smoke meth, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get the door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and get motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even practiced doing that at my new place, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. If you're enjoying the video, please gently click the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. My roommate was out of the house for the week, so I had the place to myself. It was spring break, so my college classes were out. I had no plans and really nothing I needed to do. On Monday, I was basically trapped inside due to a huge storm blowing through our city. This was common around this time of year, but it still always seemed worse every time. The trees always looked like they were going to blow away, and the house would shake and creak non-stop. Knowing I wouldn't be able to sleep, I decided to just stay up. I turned on the Xbox and started up one of my video games and played for well over an hour, probably until 11 o'clock when the doorbell rang. I paused the game and got up, but then I remembered the whole storm situation. Who would be outside right now? I went over to the front door and looked through the peephole, but nothing. I opened the door. The wind and water hit me right away, but when I looked around, I didn't see anyone. I closed the door and thought maybe the wind had somehow rung the doorbell. I don't know, it sounds dumb now, but what was I supposed to think? I went back to my game, but only a couple minutes later, I heard a huge crash in the backyard, stuff tumbling over and breaking. I immediately knew it was our patio furniture and ran over to the back door. Everything was scattered around the yard, 
blowing around in the wind. I quickly put on my shoes and went outside, pushing each piece of furniture up against the back of the house. The wind was so heavy it would even hurt sometimes when the water would hit my face. I was rushing, going as fast as I could until I saw someone. They were standing at the edge of the backyard, watching me. I looked back at them for a moment but then grabbed the last piece of furniture and ran inside to escape the rain. I looked at the back door as I dried off, but the person was gone. Between that and the doorbell ringing, I was a little bit nervous. I sat in the living room this time, just scrolling on my phone because I was tired of being interrupted. After a while, I struggled to keep my eyes open. I got a blanket and laid down on the couch. I didn't feel like going upstairs, and the storm was much louder up there. It took a while, but eventually, I drifted off and fell asleep. A few hours later, still well into the night, I woke up from a sudden burst of heavy wind outside, shaking the house. I pulled the blanket to the side and sat up, moving my feet to the floor as I prepared to go check if the furniture outside was still there. But just when my feet touched the floor, they were soaked. It woke me up immediately. I looked down and saw a puddle on the ground right next to the couch. Then I saw another, leading in a line across the floor. Inside the puddles were faint muddy shoe prints. I stood up and ran to the corner of the room, heart beating rapidly in my chest. After a minute of hearing nothing but the wind outside, I slowly followed the shoe prints. They led all throughout the house, upstairs and down, but I could clearly tell that they entered through the back door, which I had stupidly forgotten to lock in the rush of getting out of the rain. I locked it and pulled my phone out to call 911, but then the thought crept into my mind, what if they're still inside? I stayed quiet and moved into the corner of the house where I felt the most hidden. I waited in silence for them to arrive. When they did, they took a look around, seeing everything I saw, but nothing more. They told me it seems like a personal attack because nothing was missing and they were clearly focused on my house in particular. However, they walked right up to me while I was sleeping and seemingly did nothing but watch me, which is super creepy but doesn't make much sense. If they wanted to do something to me, they would have done it at that moment. After some thought, this had led me to believe that whoever it was had actually come from my roommates. They saw me, then looked around the whole house, and then left doing absolutely nothing. So if this was a personal attack and my roommate was there, I think things may have gone a lot worse than they had. I lived with my older brother for about four years after I finished school. We shared rent on an apartment together since neither of us could afford anything on our own. But during the fourth year, my brother started making better money and he planned to move out once the lease came to an end. I wasn't making a lot so I knew I couldn't afford to pay for the apartment alone. I looked around online for a roommate for a few months but decided to move out as well and find a cheaper place. I searched until the last month of our lease at the apartment. My brother had basically moved everything out already and there was a lot of pressure on me to find somewhere quick. But with my extremely low budget, it was hard. Eventually, I stumbled across a listing posted by a homeowner renting out a room in their house. The man's name was Evan. I sent him a text to let him know I was interested, then kept searching. He responded within a few minutes. We scheduled a time to call later in the day, and when we did, he explained all the details. He said he lived alone in the house and was renting out his spare bedroom, but I'd be able to use all the other rooms in the house. It sounded great to me, so I agreed to it. A couple of weeks later, I packed everything in a U-Haul and drove down to the house. Between this time, we'd been texting and calling, and he sent me a bunch of pictures, but I hadn't had the chance to view it in person yet. I got there around noon, parking in the driveway. The house was definitely small, but it looked nice from the outside. Evan was standing in the garage, waving me over. He gave me a quick tour, then helped me unload all of my stuff into my room. Evan seemed like a regular man in his mid-thirties, which was almost ten years older than myself, but I didn't really mind. He didn't hold conversations very well, and was somewhat shy. Anyway, we finished moving everything inside, and I dropped the U-Haul off. 
I Ubered back to the house, and by then, it was almost 8 p.m., and I was really tired. Evan was on the couch, watching TV, so I told him I was going to bed early, and I went to my room. All in all, it seemed like a decent place, and I was happy with it. I unpacked some more, then set up my bed, and by 9 o'clock, I was finally ready to sleep. I walked over to my door to lock it and turn off the lights. But as I reached my hand out, I saw the knob on the door was empty. As in, there was no lock on it. Confused, I opened the door. The lock was on the outside of the door. I stepped into the living room and asked Evan why the bedroom door locked from the outside. He looked confused and said he never noticed that but he would switch it around tomorrow. I shrugged and said okay, then went back to my room. I was tired and not too worried about it, but it was definitely an odd find. I got in bed and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up. I heard someone moving around in the kitchen, which I assumed was just Evan getting water or something. I closed my eyes again. A minute later, I heard him walking back down the hallway, but as he was passing my room, he stopped. I opened my eyes and looked at the door. He was standing out there quietly for maybe 15 seconds before I heard a click. He locked my door. My stomach dropped and I felt my face go cold as Evan walked down to his room. As soon as I heard his bedroom door shut, I got up quietly and went over to the door. I tried the handle and it wouldn't budge. I stood in shock for a few seconds, coming to the reality that this man I just met has now locked me in a room. My fear started to turn into anger, and I called out for Evan, telling him to open the door. It only took a second before I heard Evan let out of his room and over to my door. I heard him place his hand on the door, but he paused for a few seconds before he unlocked it. I swung the door open right away. What the hell was that? I confronted him. Evan was stumbling over his words, saying he just wanted to make sure he was safe because he didn't know me well enough. I understood that concern, but locking someone in a room was not a smart way to go about it. I told him that I was going to pack up and leave in the morning. I stayed up all night on the couch in the living room, waiting for the U-Haul store to open at 9 o'clock. I looked into the hallway, seeing Evan's bedroom door was still closed, hopefully meaning he was still asleep. Then I drove straight there, and drove the U-Haul back to the house. When I went inside, Evan's bedroom door was open. Evan? I called out. I walked over to his room and peeked my head inside. His room was empty. I moved my eyes around the room in disbelief, seeing as things were only getting weirder. I backed out and got straight to moving my stuff. I powered through two hours of moving boxes and taking apart my bed. I only had two boxes left, and I ran inside and picked up another, then rushed to the front door until Evan appeared in the doorway. Move, I said. He stared at me emotionless. After a few seconds, he stepped aside. I hurried past him and shut the box in the U-Haul. The last box was half full of random food I kept from my old pantry at the apartment. I decided to just leave it. Evan was freaking me out, and I wanted to get away from him as soon as possible. I started closing the back of the U-Haul before Evan interrupted. You forgot this, he held out the last box. Oh yeah, thanks. I grabbed it from him and climbed back into the truck. I felt him watching me as I stacked the box, and when I turned, he had his hand on the door. He started pulling it down, trying to close me in. I was able to stop him before the door was even halfway down. I shoved him to the ground, but he got up and ran. Not into the house, but off into the trees, away from the property. I didn't know what to think, but I didn't care. I quickly shut the back door and drove away. My brother was nice enough to let me stay with him until I found a new place. I don't know what happened at that house, or what would have happened, but there was definitely something very wrong going on. This all happened roughly around four years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it happened. I'll start off by saying that at the time I was pretty young. I was single and very keen to have my first experience with someone. 
I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people, until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting. We had a lot of things in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with him, since we had been talking for almost a month. Now even though I was only young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was, and still am, a very cautious and paranoid person. But for some reason, I made what possibly could have been one of the worst decisions of my life. I invited him to come spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend and I had the place to myself, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived around three hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to visit. So he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11 a.m. The whole time he was driving to my place, I had the sickening sense of impending doom. Almost as if something was going to go very, very wrong. I almost texted him multiple times to tell him that I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. I jumped up as I heard his car pull up, and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door. But he pushed his way through, and continued to stare at me blankly, all whilst my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never do to anyone. Things instantly seemed extremely odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me. I hesitantly went along with it, as this was my first experience with someone. He was almost six years older than me, so I was pretty tense. Fast forward to a couple of hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which confused me as it was only 5 p.m. But I told him it was fine, and I would continue to watch movies by myself downstairs. After about an hour, I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around, and the sound of him talking. So I made my way upstairs and opened my door, only to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed. He sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes, putting his hands around my neck lightly. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, and it worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat. He asked, Does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am and what I look like? I instantly answered, saying that my sister and friends knew he was here. This was a complete lie because I don't have a sister, and my friends were unaware, but something inside of me forced me to say it. After minutes of awkward silence, he stood up to gather his things. I noticed that in his backpack, he had tape, rope, and handcuffs. At first, it didn't concern me as I knew he was into that stuff, but looking back, I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden he said, I think I'm going to head home. I have a long drive, and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate to let him out of my door because I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to even look at me or say goodbye. He raced off down the street as soon as he got into his car. I ran back to my room to see if he had left anything because he'd left in a hurry. I found a note on my desk with the words, Being nice is what saved you. At the time, I had no idea what the note meant. Now that I think about it, I seriously think that he had very ill intentions toward me. I'm still angry at myself for letting a stranger into my home, which was obviously a big mistake. I immediately blocked him on all of my social media. I am just so lucky that I made it out alive. All I know is that he is now somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say now is that I am glad that he is many miles away from me. About 10 years ago, I lived on my own and didn't have much company. I was quite depressed at the time after losing my girlfriend to a drunk driver. I was enjoying a beer and watching the sunset on the back porch when I saw a large, scruffy man emerging from the tree line. My heart skipped a beat as he stumbled towards my house in a menacing way. Living alone, I often used my backyard for target practice. And at that moment, I was immensely grateful for it. Instinctively, I rushed to bolt all the doors while frantically dialing the police. What I didn't know was that this intruder had broken in the day before through a basement window and had spent the night squatting there. He had left the basement door unlocked 
and at this point, he'd made his way inside the house and was making his way up the stairs towards me. I gripped my rifle, aiming at the approaching man as he descended the hallway. I shouted at him, ordering him to stop and get on the ground, but he just kept walking towards me. I fired the first round, loaded with rock salt, but he showed no reaction. I quickly followed with a rubber bullet to the chest. Yet the drugged up guy who was clearly out of his mind, continued advancing. This guy was huge, at least twice my size, and I realized that whatever drugs he had in his body were going to push him through any pain that a rubber bullet would inflict. He was backing me into a corner. I desperately begged him to stop and warned him what would happen, but he just moaned at me like a zombie and shouted, Shoot! Do it! Then he lunged towards me. I took my third shot. I can't recall whether it was buckshot or a slug, but it left a gaping hole in his chest. It barely even slowed him down. He kept coming, and in a frenzied struggle, he wrestled me to the ground. He was moaning and coughing up blood. Suddenly, he grabbed my face with both of his massive hands and started squeezing my head. It was utterly terrifying. I could feel him trying to burst my skull open like a balloon. I don't know how long it actually lasted, but it felt like forever. Eventually, the injury finally caught up with him, and he died on top of me. I was laying with him crushing me for a few minutes. My energy was completely drained and I could barely breathe with his weight on top of me. His body was pushing my rifle into my chest and it was causing me serious pain when I tilted his body to the side. I was completely drenched in his blood and I can still remember the overwhelming smell. I'd completely forgotten that I was still on the phone with the operator, who had heard our entire exchange, which more or less amounted to me pleading, stop, or I'll shoot, and the man menacingly taunting. The police arrived soon after, and the incident made it to the local papers. There was a criminal investigation, but eventually, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. It turned out that the intruder was wanted for murder of an elderly couple in Baltimore and had somehow made his way 50 miles up the road into our rural area.